A very good morning. Uh, this is the last day of our conference, and uh, hope you had a um, good day yesterday, and also in the evening the banquet. And uh, again, we are starting our session with the quick bites. This is, uh, as I uh, said, it is mainly to encourage all the young uh, um, snack members, to, uh, all the young members to present their topics in a comprehensive way. And uh, for this, we introduce our chairpersons and we invite them on the dais. Dr. Ann Campus, who is a senior consultant in Kim's Hospitals, Sikindrabad. And uh, the next uh, chairperson is uh, Dr. Swati Chhabra, who is an additional professor in Ames Jodhpur. And uh, she has got a lot of publications, both national and international. And the other uh, chairperson is, uh, sorry, I think uh, the other chairperson has not come yet. He is Dr. Vamsi. We'll start the session, man. You can introduce the speakers.
Our first speaker of the morning is Dr. Abhinash Patro. He is an associate professor of NIMS Hospital Hyderabad and has many international and national publications. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my topic is uh, a role of uh, USG beyond pain management. In uh, recent practice, uh, in recent decades, the role of USG in anesthesia practice has uh, increased uh, many folds. So, apart from the uh, role in uh, pain management, uh, transcranial Doppler, uh, role of USG in neuroanesthesia practice as a bedside neuromonitoring apparatus is growing. <coughs> Before going to the topic, I want to highlight few points on the acoustic windows for brain insulation. So, there are basically four views, uh, transorbital, transtemporal, occipital and uh, submandibular. Uh, in transtemporal view, we have uh, three planes, uh, ventricular planes, diencephalic plane or uh, mesencephalic plane. So, coming to the topic, uh, uh, what is the role in, uh, uh, role of uh, brain use in neurocritical care? patients. So, in uh, intracranial hematomas, this transcranial Doppler duplex uh, uh, USG can differentiate intracranial hematomas and ischemias. The TCC, uh, TCCD can also reliably estimate the volume and expansion in uh, hyperacute ICH. Uh, next, uh, the hydrocephalus. There is excellent correlation observed between TCCD and CT measurement of the width of the third ventricle. In this article, uh, the external ventricular drain was clamped, clamped in uh, hemorrhagic uh, hydrocephalus patients and the correlation between uh, change in size of lateral ventricle more than 5.5 millimeter in, by USG to drain open, reopen was seen and it has uh, demonstrated a very high uh, specificity and sensitivity. Next role in a brain midline shift, it's a life-threatening condition, but ultrasound MLS correlates well with the findings on CT and it is an early outcome predictor in acute stroke patients. Next coming to ONSD, as we know the role of ONSD is, uh, in neuromonitoring is very reliable, very high. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> systemic review on this uh, shows uh, the ONSD of uh, between uh, 4.8 to 3.6, uh, there is a threshold for increase in intracranial hypertension. So, coming next, uh, in uh, uh, brain USG in uh, what is the U role of uh, brain USG in uh, uh, EMD patients? Apart from the uh, point of care, uh, uh, the TCCD screening for uh, signs of intracranial hypertension fills the gap for initial assessment. It adds to the, the uh, initial uh, our, our initial assessments. Next, uh, the role of uh, brain USG in general ICUs. So, in acute liver failure, patients come with encephalopathy and coagulopathy. The any uh, invasive method for monitoring uh, ICP is uh, uh, life-threatening. So, non-invasive method of ICP by ultrasonography constitute a useful option. Next, in, uh, in post-cardiac arrest syndrome, it is observed that there is a poor outcome is seen in significantly larger uh, ONSD than to compare to the outcome uh, uh, lower ONSDs. In severe respiratory failure, the use of ultrasound technique aimed at uh, monitoring CVF at the bedside and response to therapeutic intervention in patients with severe respiratory failure is appealing. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash. 
we will uh, go on to the next speaker and take questions at the end good morning everyone our uh, next speaker is dr pavan wala he is a consultant icu uh, and ecmo at kims hospitals uh, hyderabad uh, he has done his training in neurocritical care in the uk and uh, i invite him to deliver the next quick bites thank you uh, thank you everyone and uh, good morning okay so uh, we know that intubation is a fairly common intervention in the neuro icu either for airway protection for patients with the low gcs or for co2 control in patients with uh, severe traumatic brain injury or uh, for other coexisting pulmonary pathologies like copd or as a part of their uh, polytrauma profile where they have chest trauma and need uh, respiratory support um, now we know that once intubation happens for a patient weaning starts from that point so uh, in a normal uh, icu in a general icu what uh, we would do is we would assess if the patient was alert obeying and if he was fairly hemodynamically stable if all of this was present then we would do what is called as a, a rapid shallow breathing index uh, that is frequency by tidal volume and if that was uh, more than 105 we would then go on to extubate the patient now although this works very well for a general icu patient and rsbi is a very accurate predictor of uh, success of extubation this doesn't work in neuro icu patients because most of the causes of failure in uh, neuro icu are uh, either airway obstruction due to uh, no tone in the pharyngeal muscles where the patient would then immediately fail uh, extubation or uh, more commonly they do not have uh, adequate gag or cough reflex where the patient would extubate at that point but over the next 12 24 hours would uh, not be able to clear his secretions and then get reintubated uh, so if we had to look at the predictors of extubation success in uh, patients in the neuro icu these are some of the things that we should be looking at uh, so if we go on to uh, glasgow coma score which is most commonly used uh, or that is our primary thing which we assess before extubating a patient our uh, kind of hypothesis is that if the patient has a higher gcs he has a higher chance of extubation because he has uh, he would have normal airway reflexes if his gcs was uh, high now the problem with this is glasgow coma score was never uh, made to assess a patient's extubation or uh, airway reflexes it was for prognosticating uh, based on their brain injury and the one uh, kind of the part of the scale which would actually give us an idea of what his pharyngeal or laryngeal muscles are doing which is the verbal score is cannot be uh, done when the patient is intubated and the motor score contributes a large uh, portion of uh, how we assess when we assess for extubation so we know that gcs is probably not a good uh, predictor now for the same gcs if you had a patient who was young and elderly a young patient would have a higher likelihood of success because we know that as you get older the airway reflexes uh, go off and there's a higher chance of aspiration so if the patient has uh, the same uh, glasgow coma score uh, study done in brazil in 2014 found that if you were able to assess the peak cough flow and if it was less than 58 liters per minute it would it led to extubation failure but uh, if you had a peak cough flow of more than 80 liters per minute it was more likely that you would succeed in extubating now this would require specific uh, equipment which might not always be available um, so uh, this is more of a clinical score uh, that we can do which is called as a visage score which is visual pursuit that is the patient is able to uh, have a visual pursuit when you ask him to uh, swallowing either spontaneously or on command um, age of sorry less than 40 and a gcs of greater than 10 so each of these uh, values if given a score of 1 a score of greater than 3 predicts a 90% chance of successful extubation in these patients now why do we have to extubate a patient why not do a tracheostomy for everybody so tracheostomy would definitely give you a definitive airway which is safe but it has a huge psychological impact on these patients they would have difficulty swallowing and post decannulation they can have a lot of stenosis so tracheostomy is not the way forward for everybody uh, so in conclusion uh, i just would like to say that gcs is a crude predictor for uh, airway extubation no single value predicts success of extubation uh, use of visage score would 
definitely increase the chances of uh, extubation success and tracheostomy is not without its own risks. Thank you. For, for uh, a wonderful lecture. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Ruchi Verma. She's uh, at SGPGI Lucknow and she's going to talk on uh, outs. Yeah, she's an outstanding women researcher award uh, achiever in uh, 2021 Chennai, India, and part of the organizing team of the, uh, the conference in 2018 of the Neuroanesthesia and Critical Care. She has a lot of publications. So she's going to talk on uh, new surgical techniques to improve outcomes in brain malignancy, implications for anesthesiologists. Yeah. Good morning, yeah. everyone. My topic of presentation is uh, newer surgical techniques to improve outcomes in brain malignancies, implications for anesthesiologists. Brain malignancies are known for uh, very poor prognosis and its outcome strongly correlated with extent of initial surgical resection. Many times, the resection is incomplete because either the tumor is located in or near the allocant cortex or it may be due to brain shift. Uh, intraoperative MRI, fluorescence guided surgery, ultrasonography, these techniques help in uh, to compensate for this brain shift. Uh, on the other hand, a vague craniotomy with brain mapping helps to uh, preserve motor, speech and cognitive functions. Many, uh, many other surgical techniques have been evolving for last uh, many years. The list is here. With the development of these techniques, uh, uh, practice of anesthesia has been uh, changed immensely. So, coming to the anesthetic implications of intraoperative MRI, magnetic field strength of intraoperative MRI ranges from 0.2 to 4.5 Tesla and it exerts three physical forces, the static magnetic field, which is always on and it exerts a strong force on ferromagnetic objects and turn them into projectile missiles. The other two forces are uh, radio frequency and pulse magnetic field, both of which generate heat in conducting materials including the patient tissues. And thus, uh, they can cause burn injuries, electrical interferences and malfunction of medical devices. Thus, it poses multiple challenges uh, specific to patient safety, monitoring and equipment requirement. The pre-anesthetic checkup should include the history of uh, implanted medical devices, tattoo and lead containing cosmetics, kidney related elements and contrast dye allergies. Uh, all the equipment should be MRI compatible and we should always uh, complete MRI safety checklist before entering the MRI suite, before intraoperative MRI and uh, all the metallic equipment should be counted before and after the MRI scan and no item should be missing. Points to be considered during intraoperative uh, period includes, we uh, always have to intubate the patient with uh, PVC tubes as uh, plexometallic tubes are not MRI compatible. The pilot balloon of ET tube cuff should be fixed away, uh, uh, secure away from the uh, tube as it may cause artifacts during scanning. We also require long extension of uh, IV lines, breathing circuit and gas sampling lines. So, increase the dead space. Uh, so, a combination of inhalational and IV anesthetic is preferred. We should also have an eye on uh, ventilatory circuit disconnection or kinking during fixation of MRI coils. Thermal injuries can be prevented by using MRI safety ECG leads. ECG cables should not uh, loop or cross each other and cable to skin and skin to skin contact should be avoided by placing cotton, uh, cotton gauze pads. Once the patient is inside the MRI, the ST segment analysis is not possible and arrhythmia type of R ECG artifacts may appear. Uh, intraoperative MRI increases the core body temperature and shorten the duration action of uh, vacuronium. Allergic reactions to contrast media uh, can uh, occur but uh, usually rare. So, to improve the patient safety, the anesthesiologists have to be vigilant uh, at all time. Coming to anesthetic considerations of awake craniotomy with brain mapping. Appropriate patient selection and counseling are the keys to the success. The commonly used approaches are a sleep awake asleep and conscious sedation. Both the approaches uh, were found to be associated with uh, were having similar outcomes in terms of neurological dysfunction. The recently 
xenon uh, anesthesia was found to be associated with short awakening times after discontinuation during the first stage of awake craniotomy. The third approach is awake technique. This, in this technique, uh, non-pharmacological interventions are used along with the local anesthesia to avoid sedation at any stage during surgery. One of the interesting approaches is hypnosis uh, in uh, recent studies, which produces a dissociative state. Here, the patients were able to comply with intraoperative testing and uh, tumor resection and reported positive psychological impact. Combining intraoperative MRI with abic craniotomy provide advantages of both the approaches, although increase the challenges for anesthesiologist. At the end, few points about fluorescence guided surgery. ICG, fluorescein and 5-amino labulinic acid are commonly used for fluorescence guided surgery. ICG, uh, uh, endocyanin green should be avoided in patients with allergy to iodine and renal insufficiency and it should be used with caution if the patient is having a history of uh, allergy to penicillin and sulfur drugs. It can also affect the readings of SpO2 and uh, cerebral tissue oxygen saturation. Fluorescein sodium is safe for the patient. Uh, the severe side effects like anaphylaxis is uh, rarely reported and at very higher doses. Administration of 5-amino uh, uh, labulinitic 5-amino uh, labulinic acid may cause hypotension and alteration of liver function. But it, was been, it has been found that the hypotension was uh, always present in those patients who were on antihypertensive me medications. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rachi, for uh, wonderful insights on the newer techniques. And the next speaker is uh, Dr. Rudrashish Haldar, additional professor, SCPJ Lucknow. He has uh, many, uh, a lot of academic work, like around 80 publications. And he's going to talk. Yeah, welcome, Dr. Rudrash. Good morning. Albumin in neurosurgery. Yeah. Uh, the topic on which I'll be talking is albumin in neurosurgery. I'll begin with the disclosure that I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Now coming to albumin, uh, it is a globular protein which is most abundantly found in both the plasma as well as the extracellular fluid and is synthesized by the liver. has uh, various functions in the body like it's a component of protease enzyme, it's the one, uh, um, uh, amino acid responsible for maintenance of poloid osmotic pressure and also binds and transports many essential uh, substances like drugs, hormones, bilirubin, etc. Now, when we talk about albumin in neurosurgery, <clears throat> we'll divide it into different settings. As we know, the most common indication of albumin is uh, uh, being used as an intraoperative fluid. Now, coming to uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and infarct size, way back in the first part of the first decade of 2000, there were quite a few uh, publications which generated uh, interest because high concentration albumin therapy improved local cerebral blood flow, reduced the infarct size, brain swelling, and improved neurological function. So those potential beneficial effects actually uh, caused some initial encouragement, but they were all animal studies. Of course, in uh, patients, uh, human patients, there was some, uh, some amount of work which was done, and it showed that a high proportion of good outcomes at three months was seen in patients who were receiving albumin. And there was no difference in the incidence of symptomatic vasospasm. Based on that initial enthusiasm, the ELISA trial, that is the subarachnoid hemorrhage multicenter pilot trial was conducted. And uh, researchers found out that the doses ranging uh, from 1.25 gram per kg per day for 7 days was tolerated without any complications and they might be neuroprotective. However, the caveat was there was a high degree of pulmonary edema. Then, uh, follow-up of this trial, the ELISA uh, follow-up trial was also conducted but then again the same concern of pulmonary edema came and the trial had to be suspended. We are all aware of the SAFE trial where a certain subset 
of uh, critical care uh, patients who were uh, suffering from traumatic brain injury they were resuscitated with albumin as compared to saline then uh, albumin in stroke the elias pilot trial was conducted they also found uh, initial uh, neuroprotective effect but the trial got suspended because of pulmonary edema followed up by the elias part 1 and part 2 trials which were conducted in a safer manner but then again they got suspended because of the pulmonary edema complications however the pooled analysis data from these two trials so showed that there was no difference in the 90 day neurological outcomes and mortality between the albumin and the saline groups however as i said pulmonary edema intracerebral hemorrhage was higher in uh, patients receiving albumin so much so that the european society of intensive care Medi uh, medicine recommended against the use of high dose albumin in patients with acute ischemic stroke in intracranial hemorrhage uh, achieved trial which was a, a multi-center trial was started however it was terminated due to low recruitment and the results remained unclear in traumatic brain injury we already talked about the safe tbi study it was seen that the two-year mortality was significantly higher in patients with the traumatic brain injury receiving 4% albumin as compared to those receiving saline and also patients with TBI had higher ICPs when administered with albumin in uh, tumor surgeries there were uh, few animal studies exact effect still unknown and the results were inconclusive in spinal surgery we are aware of the uh, post-operative visual loss group there uh, uh, analysis multivariate regression analysis found out that the use of colloid administration may actually reduce edema formation in patients undergoing spinal surgery because the volume required is less as compared to crystalloids another thing which is noteworthy is that uh, five percent albumin as compared to ringer lactate uh, reduced the intraocular pressure as compared to those receiving ringer lactate so this is one point which goes in favor of uh, albumin in spinal surgeries now when we do a analysis we find that uh, the higher incidences of pulmonary edema coagulopathy especially when albumin and mannitol are co-administered and not to mention the 1000 time higher costs actually outweigh the beneficial effects so when we come to the verdict uh, one of the very recent publications in uh, journal of neurosurgical anesthesiology in 2021 their uh, final conclusion was high quality human evidence to support or reject the administration is still lacking and in the absence of any definitive data to either support or dissuade the use of albumin the usage should be considered based on potential risk and benefits just a few words about the other uh, importance of albumin in neurosurgical settings albumin is also used has been used as a prognostic markers in uh, patients suffering from traumatic brain injury and albumin not alone but as a fibrinogen to albumin ratio has also been used as a, a predictor for uh, patients who have undergone spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage thank you thank you dr rudrajish uh, can all the participants the speakers please come on the dais and we'll throw uh, the it open for questions now Sudrashi, sir. Yeah, uh, sir. Uh, yes, they have been used as albumin per se. The patient's albumin level at admission has been used as a prognostic in, uh, indicator in certain uh, situations. For example, traumatic brain injury. A couple of publications have come up which said that 
low albumin at admission usually usually correlates with uh, worse outcomes both in traumatic brain injury as compared to uh, also in subarachnoid hemorrhages no uh that i'll say uh, sir i haven't come across maybe another vista for future research uh, studying one the Uh, I'm not very sure about it, ma'am, but uh, maybe, yes, uh, availability depends on the uh, country to country. Uh, like here, we have 20% Western world of. Yeah, you, yes, you do have a point, ma'am. I think uh, we can uh, work on that also. Uh, not exactly in neurosurgical uh, population, but of course in um, uh, other general ICU as well as, uh, I'll say, gastrointestinal surgeries and all. So I work in a center where we get a lot of patients of CLD, uh, chronic liver disease, and particularly in that, uh, definitely there is a role of albumin, particularly in that patients when they are coming for that's a, with the outcome. When we are talking about the outcome, not in the traumatic brain injury, but particularly in CLD in patients. When, so we preoperative and perioperative many times we give, and that's definitely has a role, particularly in that patient. Yeah, I have a question to Dr. Ruchi uh, regarding the awake craniotomy plus intraoperative MRI thing. And one of the techniques that you mentioned is like hypnosis, I mean, where it can be tried to... Uh, so, is it kind of has been something effective in addition to the anesthesia or any of those ramifentanyls or whatever you use for uh, an awake anesthesia kind of thing? Or it's kind of, it's a completely replaceable, uh, it's, it's, it's as a completely substitute for the drugs. Uh, recently, it is being uh, used. Uh, only few studies I have uh, gone through, and I find in the literature uh, since uh, I think 2015, I, I got the few studies only on this, and they showed a uh, good results. No, in the sense, I mean, is it as a it's, standalone thing, or is it along it's a with standalone thing? Uh, no, uh, no IV or uh, inhalational anesthesia will be used. Only the local anesthesia will be used along with the hypnosis. So, who is doing it? I mean, is anesthetist or someone else? Is uh, the the uh, special person, the psychologist is uh, required for this purpose. And it will take time also. The duration is also increased in this procedure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank My uh, query is directed towards Dr. Patro. So, uh, we all know that TCD has established role as a part of USG for brain uh, monitoring and uh, diagnosing uh, various things so when we are coming to midline shift and uh, other things brain ultrasound so uh, while you were searching for the literature uh, did you find any search uh, the group of neurosurgeons who are adopting this technique and studying this or there's still uh, hesitation on their part to use uh, uh, this ultra brain ultrasound as a definite thing to diagnose say midline shift or hydrocephalus that it is aggravating or stuff yeah, uh Madam, uh, the role is definitely increasing, but uh, still, this uh, with the high sensitivity and specificity. The sensitivity, some studies show around uh, <clears throat> ninety-five percent, and uh, specificity of uh, ninety above ninety percent. The definitely the role is increasing, but more studies to come to prove uh, exact guidelines whether to do 
every time or not <coughs> <laughs> because a uh, universal adaptation means that the whole team which comprises of because not every center uh, some centers anesthetists is looking after some is neurosurgeons so that's a good thing i think that should be widespread yeah. thank yeah, you more than happy to give it to the anesthetist like um, because it's, <laughs> it's very difficult <laughs> no actually vamsi you may not be aware if i can just wait a minute just to put things in perspective i joined a uh, neurosurgery way back in 1981 and we used to do ultrasound to see midline shift before deciding on doing angiography or uh, not in head injury patients even at that time so even with poor equipment the reliability was around 80% or so and almost all of us were trained how to do midline shifts at that stage <laughs> so i'm sure things must have improved considerably is it being regularly used anywhere in india i'm not sure but so far like i mean i see the trend is still placing icp monitors i mean maybe lack of equipment is one thing like uh, not i mean even in our center it just got installed Yeah, non-invasive. Non-invasive is the best thing. Uh, it's about like I mean the sensitivity of as Dr. Dev Pujari has mentioned. Like for the optic now, I mean for uh, the midline shifts and all. Maybe I mean I haven't I haven't had any experience on that. Like I mean probably we, we are born in a better age. <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, the optic nerve sheath is obviously being propagated and is yeah. being increasingly tested. But now that he's mentioned about navigation. Uh, there are many machines now where the ultrasound is used along with the navigation you rather than using the probe which actually mm. keeps on updating the data so one major advantage of using ultrasound in your navigation system is that you get a updated updated uh, data yes that time. so it, it, it's in brain lab has the best navigation and integrated ultrasound but it's for the particularly icp purpose like i mean in a head injury thing that's where like i mean the uh, is the the sensitivity has been on the, in the literature has been good but somehow in the usage i haven't seen in, uh, in, in anyway anywhere i mean lot of lot of its usage being not there in the many centers like that's what it hasn't picked up maybe because of the cost of equipment or whatever you know that's for the tumor part i'm asking about the icp measurements in head injury like that is the particular mention maybe dr dev pujari has uh... yeah right. yeah and and maybe one last question like to dr pavan like so the particular uh, thing about the tracheostomy versus extubation and all those things like i mean it's it's always a very big question and lot of discussion with the families and uh, of the patient so uh, particularly most of the scenarios like i mean when the patient has a motor power of uh, localizing to pain that's an m5 response and uh, patient looks okay but still the surgeon is not comfortable anesthetist also is like i mean a little wavery on the how do, is there any kind of uh, points i mean uh, a very uh, signs or anything that you rely on like to make a particular decision on that part I think in the present scenario, I can tell you that if I have to estimate a patient, 
But but the M4 with coughing is a very rare thing to find. Like I mean, <laughs> that's what. So that's not a practical scenario. Like I mean, quite often. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sir, please use mic. What I uh, wanted to ask uh, Pawan is uh, in Visaj score, he has included age uh, below uh, less, than less than 40. So it should have been somewhere 40 to 70. Why it's not in Sir, please use mic. Hello. Sorry. In the study done, they've taken age as less than 40 or more than 40. So the, mm -hmm. the score is based on the study which has been done. And why is that uh, scoring uh, a system? I was not uh, like clear about like uh, why it has been scored less than three or something. No, so uh, so it's visual pursuit, swallowing, age, and a GCS. Mm -hmm. So each of these get a one point. So if you're pursuing visually, you get one. If you have swallowing, you get one point. If your age is less than forty, you get one point. And if your GCS is more than 10, you get one point. So basically what you're doing is you're not using just a GCS. GCS of 10 in an intubated patient is E4, M6. Right. Okay. So you're basically assuming that that patient is completely awake. Yeah. But it is shown that even if the patient is completely awake and you're not having anything else, you still have a high chance of extubation failure. Yeah, and thank you. Like, I mean, we are already running beyond time. It, uh... Thanks to the speakers for uh, insightful lectures. I mean, the, it's a good start for the day and uh, it has generated a lot of discussion. Like, thank you for uh, all the things. We'll have a talk continuing with Dr. Pawan with you. Like, it's <laughs>
uh, thank Dr. Padmaja and Dr. Silada and the wonderful organization team who has done a very great job in this uh, ISNAC uh, 2023. Uh, good morning once again to all. Uh, the, though the I've been put in uh, trial of trials, I'm not going to talk anything about the trial. What I want to do is where we stand as a neuroanesthesiologist and then where we have to head on, where we have to march and what are the lacunae in or gaps in our understanding about the brain, how we give anesthesia. Uh, that's my purpose and then uh... okay so uh, if you look at that uh, we talk a lot about the brain we are too much interested into monitoring the brain so we have been taught traditionally uh, we have to uh, secondary brain damage is one of the most important cause for uh, uh, the ongoing damage to the brain and somehow we have to avoid it prevent it various factors you have to modify to prevent the secondary brain damage and we practice uh, multi we advise multimodal neuromonitoring but uh, many of us uh, i think facilities are not there to practice and unfortunately uh, the we don't know what is the current status what are the benefits of this multimodal neuromonitoring when you do whether it is benefit or not especially there are uh, extremely very low data available in the perioperative period lot of data we have practiced multimodal monitoring in the neurocritical care but if you come to uh, brain which is anesthetized especially in the neuro ot we don't practice with multimodal monitoring so what is the current status if you look at that there are two articles which has uh, evaluated what the uh, usefulness of multimodal monitoring uh, this is a review uh, which was published in 2022 what they have found is uh, majority of the multimodal monitoring is advised in traumatic brain injury almost 53 percent and then rest uh, in subarachnoid hemorrhage other than these uh, the conditions are very limited use of this multimodal monitoring so this is a schematic diagram which they have monitored what are the common modalities which are used most of them use uh, the combination of icp and uh, pbto2 some of the centers use uh, ecoji as well as uh, pbto2 monitoring so based upon all this, how much the patient has benefited? If you look at the table, you said many of these are used only to change the arterial blood, blood gas analysis, hemoglobin, changing in ventilator setting. After doing all the multimodal monitoring, the intervention which are done only uh, in the minor uh, levels. Another article which has eval uh, evaluated the multi invasive, this is invasive multimodal monitoring in uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, especially with related to the occurrence of the DCI. So overall 47 studies has been uh, analyzed and they found that uh, PPTO2 and uh, cerebral microdialysis was used very commonly and ECOG also was used. They have given, uh, this uh, has been published in Stroke 2022 journal, they have given uh, class 2A evidence for uh, uh, PPTO2 usage for uh, understanding DCA onset as well as the management of these patients as well as the cerebral microdialysis also uh, like uh, level b class 2b recommendations for uh, using your combination of pbto2 and cerebral microdialysis so i all these studies have come from the neurocritical care in the icu management of patients if you look at that what we are actually doing in the intraoperative period we don't do anything other than just giving anesthesia and maintaining the hemodynamics so that is a major uh, problem which uh, we uh, face so i can't present a uh, data for again in front of you because there are no studies available on the outcome when you do a multimodal monitoring in the intraoperative period so actually what we have to monitor under anesthesia for this to assess the well-being of the brain various you have to maintain the cerebral physiology cerebral functions and anesthesia effects and depth so when you come to uh, what is actually important when you talk about the researchers uh, point of view uh, well-being of brain means you should not have a brain injury brain injury a perioperative brain injury uh, is talked in terms of uh, it is very common almost as you should look at the perioperative covert stroke occurred one in 14 uh, patients in this lancet journal in 2020 uh, 20, in 2019 which has come and perioperative neurocognitive decline these are the common things when you uh, talk about perioperative brain injury and well-being you have, have to focus on uh, preventing perioperative post-operative delirium post-operative cognitive dysfunctions and uh, post perioperative stroke so a uh, lot of uh, discussions happened yesterday and day before yesterday on these uh, two topics. So this is one of the uh, current article which has come in uh, 
uh, neurosurgical anesthesiology in 2023 dr shobhana rajan is also one of the author they have analyzed and they have given few guidelines uh, one of the guidelines uh, which they have told is use of uh, depth of anesthesia monitor uh, tend to reduce the incidence of uh, pocd so the, there are few other guidelines about the use of uh, uh, hemodynamics and other things are there which uh, because of uh, i cannot reproduce this because it's uh, copyright issues so when i looked into what are the uh, uh, factors which can or impact the pocd occurrence so uh, the many times we think that intraoperative hypotension is one of the factor which causes brain injury this is a review which has come in uh, journal of clinical anesthesia 2021 they found there is not strong evidence to show that intraoperative hypotension is responsible pocd or uh, post operative delirium again another article cerebral auto regulation also did not influence the C, uh, pocd so our blood pressure management still we are still maintaining the cpb based algorithm most of them maintaining the map so this is still we uh, maintain uh, the same there is no uh, strong evidence to show hypertension can be one of the factors then duration one of the factor in many studies is duration of anesthesia and surgery has been strongly associated with the occurrence of pocd and uh, uh, intravenous or intra inhalation anesthetic agents or conscious sedation with ga has not uh, uh, regional anesthesia has not uh, have any impact on the occurrence of pocd so this is a, a collective uh, review of uh, whether use of cerebral oximetry has reduced the incidence of pocd again this article which has come in 2022 in springer nature also showed that there is very low quality evidence by monitoring cerebral oximetry you can reduce the incidence of pocd or uh, mortality in these patients again ro role of uh, depth of anesthesia even though the article in 2023 uh, has show, uh, given a recommendation strong recommendation that you should use a depth of anesthesia monitoring when you are giving uh, anesthesia to the patient but majority of the studies have used a bispectral index and then overall the incidence many articles have come analyzed whether the use of uh, uh, bis has reduced the incidence of pocd that is only very marginal you look at this uh, data on this there is only a very marginal uh, improvement that in the reduction there is no convincing evidence that uh, monitoring the depth of anesthesia alone can uh, uh, change the way in which we uh, keep the brain under so another important uh, thing is a lot of discussions about the bus suppression so many times elderly patient you give anesthesia they may have this dark lines which you are seeing they are all the periods of bus suppression so there is a concern that when you give deeper anesthesia or there is a period of uh, a bus suppression that would add on to the uh, insult to the injury so this is the article from bja which looked into that whether the bus suppression can cause uh, brain damage the duration of bus suppression was not correlated with the emergence as well as the quality of cognitive recovery or pocd in this so right now we don't have any concrete strong evidence to show whether uh, any one of the factors which could be contributing to the pocd developments this is another article which has come in the late uh, 2022 we show that the suppression ratio of if it is more than 10 has been strongly correlated with the occurrence of uh, pocd especially in the elderly patients who over 65 years of age so another area where we have to look or focus into this emergence emergence from anesthesia emergence should be very smooth so uh, emergent delirium or post operative delirium one of the uh, major factor which affects the perioperative outcome of these patients so can uh, the depth of anesthesia monitor impact whether this occurrence happens is a very interesting study which you can see that so they have analyzed uh, three groups of patients one group had both inhalation or uh, inter both inhalation and intravenous second group b is a propofol base uh, c is the sevaflurane group they have uh, uh, analyze those who developed uh, pocd versus those who did not this is a spectral array if you look at that people who had a pocd you can see that if you look at that we have uh, all the depth of anesthesia monitors uses uh, different kind of uh, algorithms mostly there will be uh, when the patient is anesthetized from awake state you know that alpha rhythm is converted into delta rhythm so at the end of uh, uh, stopping anesthesia if you are the patient is still having the delta rhythm that is a strong correlation with whether the patient will have delayed awakening and post op delirium so this is one of the area which uh, we are have facing lot of uh, patients with the delayed awakening in neurosurgical patients so probably this is one area we can uh, look into doing a research 
whether uh, uh, monitoring this can uh, identify the cause of delayed awakening in neurosurgical. These are all non neuro. Uh, some of them are cardiac surgery. Some of them are no, uh, most of them are non neurosurgical patients. One of the key factors which uh, is lacking is we don't know. Uh, how to evaluate whether the patient had a brain injury or not. So, biomarkers comes in a big way in this uh, uh, area. So, this is one of the study which has come in 2022, which looked into various biomarkers uh, in a patient, healthy volunteers who has undergone uh, oral surgery, it's from dental surgeries. What they found is this first one, which is the neurofilament uh, light chain. Other thing is tau proteins and amyloid proteins. What they found is there is sudden rapid increase in the uh, biomarker neurofilament uh, light chain uh, in these patients after anesthesia. This is for healthy volunteers. So, in another article, uh, this neurofilament light chain has uh, coming now in a big uh, way in the research uh, in anesthesia. So, uh, neurofilament light chain uh, role in cardiac surgery, in this article they found that this is a large study of more than 300 patients. They found that patients who had high baseline neurofilament light chain was associated with worse in cognitive function in the preoperative period. Moreover, all these patients had a high insulin, almost 70 percent of the people had a post-surgical that is elevation in the neurofilament light chain and their cognitive decline happened after uh, one month after surgery. So, this is one of the uh, severe biomarker whether uh, the patient is going to, uh, whether the patient had brain injury or not. This is another important study which has come in the Lancet. This is a study of uh, role of uh, neurofilament uh, light chain and delirium. As you look at that, in this article, they found that it's a large study of more than uh, 2,000 patients. Uh, they found that uh, uh, the elevation in the thing, patients who had a delirium and patients who did not have delirium, they found the concentration of neurofilament light chain is almost three to four times. Not only that, the elevation is associated with the post-op delirium, it is associated with the mortality also, perioperative mortality. So, now we have got a marker, we have an endpoint to see whether the patient can have brain injury or not. Any interventions which we are going to do in the future should be targeting whether there is an increase in the post-operative neurofilament light chain or not. So, that is about the uh, basic thing. What is uh, looking into the future of our uh, practice of neuroanesthesia, I would like to uh, uh, be highlight maybe little uh, complicated uh, issues. What we normally look the brain is as a whole. So, we are monitoring the electrophysiology by uh, the EEG and we get various uh, uh, waveforms alpha, beta, delta and gamma also. So, what uh, now researchers are looking into is uh, use of the high density EEG channels. Normally, we are using around 32 channels or uh, now what they are using is uh, 128 channels and uh, 256 channels. They are called a high density EEG. They are looking at specific small areas of brain. So, what they call is a sink potential. When there is a small area of normally, when there is activity, large area of uh, brain gets activated. Other than that, at resting level, there is always kind of activity which is happening. That is called a sink potential, so called the EEG oscillations. So, uh, researchers are looking at these kind of uh, potentials and their implications in various fields. Especially, it has come out big way in uh, various uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, origin of epilepsy, as well as. Uh, uh, various uh, uh, neurogenetics malformations. Another thing about the depth of anesthesia, we know that uh, uh, depth of anesthesia this we have been rampantly using, but the algorithm was established in 1996 and there is not much modification has happened. The si with the advancement in the EEG techniques as well as the algorithms and AI based uh, uh, algorithms, the monitor and so much mathematical modeling has happened. One is called the lempel zip compressibility, which we will be seeing. Most of the depth of anesthesia monitor nowadays uses this uh, kind of uh, algorithm to identify what they do is they is called a phase lag, lag EEG pattern. So, they use different change in the phase from one area of the brain to the another area of the brain by using the high density uh, EEG. So, they found that this is much better compared to uh, the regular use of the uh, BIS. One more important, a uh, very important advancement which has come thing is called the connect connectotomies. It's a brain network model. The basic understanding of various pathophysiology has been linked to these connectotomies. The brain is connected in multiple ways in a very specific pattern. So, uh, by identifying these changes by using various algorithms, you can identify the occurrence of various uh, 
brain damage which is ongoing and also help in monitoring in the uh, monitoring of the patients so we use uh, commonly we use uh, mri dti image to get various uh, white matter fibers and we can identify specific tracks by using uh, either transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation or use a task induced uh, changes so what i told you about earlier is the face lag entropy face lag entropy is a newer uh, depth of anesthesia monitor this is uh, what uh, uh, one of the experiment what they have done this is for the uh, infants as you look at that infants has got a more of a delta rather than the beta when you put a bis normally bis uh, 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 uses beta as the awake algorithm whereas when you put the eeg in the normal patient you have more of a delta so this is what we call the uh, disordered connections so normally everybody will have a disordered connections when you uh, uh, when the patient is being anesthetized the connections become more and more regular and become more smoother so that is what is called the pace lag entropy which is used in uh, similar to the bis but the algorithm is totally different and next one is called the biocoherence biocoherence is another uh, important uh, area of research which is coming in the anesthesia and its implications has been uh, reported in pod pocd and emergence delirium and delayed awakening if you look at the biocoherence is we give anesthesia we don't know based on one particular number we just give whether it's a light or uh, deeper plane so what is biocoherence does it it's uh, uh, segregates if you look at this this is a study in pa patients who are young adults versus super elderly more than 85 years of age they have given anesthesia and uh, mo modified uh, the eeg pattern they found that there is a difference in how the power spectrum between the elderly people and the young adults so biocoherence uh, modifies this identifies the various levels of depth of anesthesia at different uh, concentrations of inhalation anesthetic agents and will be helpful in identifying the patients who are at risk another important area of uh, research based on connectotomy is uh, brain mapping of the functional uh, brain areas is you can look at this uh, pattern so you can use either transcranial magnetic stimulation and uh, fmri now interoperative of uh, use of functional mapping areas as coming in a very big way especially this is about the speech area this is a picture uh, shows a, a, a person with uh, undergoing hemispherotomy so they put uh, uh, electrodes over all parts of the brain and then there is a stimulation of the area where there is epileptic focus and they look at the spread of epilepsy form okay in different areas this by this way you can select the tracks which you want to where the epilepsy uh, discharges are being spread and you can selectively ablate the tracks without causing disability to the patient otherwise they will be removing all the tracks and then patient will be mute and not able to walk in the post operative care this is something related to the motor sparring hemispherotomy is uh, the new uh, changes which are coming in the way with respect to evoke potential monitoring we use a lot of evoke potential uh, potential monitoring to assess the well being of the patients what we look at is called the language mapping usually we do awake brain anatomy for language mapping but still in spite of awake brain anatomy some of the patients will still develop uh, deficits what is uh, uh, as i told you there is a subcortical tracks so you can actually measure this by using dti you can actually map the tracks and you can actually put the electrodes over that you can see this is a, a sensory area or venic area this is the broca's area you can actually stimulate the broca's area and you can actually see the potential record in the sensory area continuously you can actually map interoperatively to identify the language area it is not not require a, uh, a patient's cooperation again this another uh, figure showing the uh, supplementary motor area location of the primary motor area arcuate and uh, fibers all this can actually uh, being done uh, nowadays uh, to improve the function this is how the mapping is done these are various subcortical fibers you can use image guidance you can use a functional mri and pre map and then you can actually uh, locate each area interoperatively by placing electrodes and then stimulating different parts of the cortex and accurately map other two important uh, areas of interest is the role of uh, nars and processed eeg so newer advancement in nars includes uh, similar to the icp and combining with the map we have the uh, indices of cerebral non invasive cerebral auto regulation continuous you can have b to b analysis and then we have a multi wavelength nars nars normally measures the oxy uh, hemoglobin levels we can have a metabolic parameters like cytochrome a 
A3 also been uh, monitored by using advancement. This can be used in functional mapping as well as uh, the overall uh, uh, brain functions in the intraoperative period. This how there is a cap, you can actually measure uh, the different areas of the brain, which are the areas are functional. You do not require uh, uh, fMRI nowadays, you can use a bedside functional NIRS which is fun, found to be much more better than the uh, fMRI studies. So, uh, if there is a combination of uh, NARS uh, and uh, DCS, DCS is the one which measures the cere renal cerebral blood flow. Uh, intraoperative probes can be kept over the brain, it should actually map by activating various areas of the brain. This is another big area of uh, advancement and research in the field of neuroanesthesia. Another area which is of coming, upcoming is the brain and nociception. You can have a neuroimaging of functional MRI of various pathways, pain pathways. I can use uh, where is the, uh, the center, thalamocortical and where is the exact nucleus. Various ablation therapy for uh, pain for uh, various neuropsychiatric disorders can be done by using this uh, uh, techniques. This is about uh, uh, the area of cortical projections. This is a functional MRI with the pain, pain is being given and then you can see what are the tracks which are being activated, you can do ablation therapy. NIRS is also useful in the management of the acute pain, so you can put a NIRS in the prefrontal cortex as well as the uh, primary and secondary somatosensory area. If the patient is having a pain, nociception, then they will have a heightened activity as you look at this picture. And then the, this patient, this study has done and then they have given uh, morphine and you see that once the morphine is given that the activation has disappeared whereas in control group uh, there was persistent activity in the brain. So these are the different uh, uh, evolving areas to summary, newer advancement and emerging techniques have greater potential in neuroanesthesia and then high qualities are needed especially from basic monitoring level we do not have a high quality uh, randomized studies. And then we have to adapt uh, newer modalities to have uh, evidence based. Uh, Thanks, uh, Professor Manikandan. Thank you. A uh, lot of food for uh, thought and future research. Uh, as he has to go away, I think uh, you can have maybe one comment and one question. Anyone would like to comment? Would you like to say something? Yeah, yeah. Manikanjan, I'm sorry, I was a little uh, late and I apologize to all the audience and my coach here persons. I got late because of little transport problem. I'm written quite away from here. Uh, see, uh, we have had a lot of experience with peace monitoring intraoperatively uh, in intracranial surgeries. Uh, we have published this in Europe European Journal of Anesthesiology 2007, as well as there were many more publications which have very clearly shown that the uh, uh, if uh, the depth of anesthesia is continuously monitored, by this, this was the only best uh, available uh, you know, modality at that time in those years until I retired from BSU. After that, I am stopping uh, doing any research further, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, then uh, we found that the dose requirement uh, was lesser if uh, the patients were continually monitored uh, by base uh, compared to you know conventional monitoring that was clinical monitoring. Uh, that was very clearly established. So that way we can presume that. If we are monitoring this continuously, depth of anesthesia continuously, then probably we are uh, we are going to reduce. I don't know what will be effect of adverse uh, adverse uh, you know brain injury because brain injury is still not established whether well managed anesthesia causes any brain injury or not. I I don't know. I I don't think there should be any brain injury uh, as a clinician. I believe uh, if you manage it well, uh, okay. Even if there are maybe any brain injury. You may not be very clear as to how much uh, favorable effect this monitoring will cause, but this will definitely uh, cause a reduction in POCD and POD. Uh, what is your opinion about it, please? Yeah, right now, as per the various guidelines, we have to go with uh, using this monitor because we don't have any other monitor. Actually, we use a uh, patient, though I don't have any disclosure, we use a lot of patient state index as well as BIS, and we have entropy also. We use uh, different. Uh, depth of anesthesia monitor, uh, many people use BIS also. So, the uh, disadvantage of BIS is it gives only the power number and uh, raw EEG. It does not give any other extra points uh, as a researcher would like to do it. So, if you look at that from the research point of view, then you require further more uh, elaborate detail uh, this one because you will be 
giving anesthesia to 80 year old 90 year old versus again a newborn baby so when you look at that the algorithm lot of people have uh, trying to find out uh, the bis uh, shows only this it does not have a correlation phase correlation which is very important is the ma majority of the anesthesia induced neurotoxicity which we have uh, yesterday we had a lot of discussions on that it happens at the not at the cellular level it had occurs at the thalamocortical level where the connectivity is destroyed so a monitor which maintain the connectivity which can uh, do that that should be the best which uh, i think it will come in the future thank you so much for your wonderful talk i'm curious sir what are your thoughts on um neurofilament light chain biomarkers for example as a preoperative evaluation much like how tau proteins are indicative of alzheimer's disease down the line is there any discussion or data on testing patients preoperatively to see what their impact would be postoperatively so uh, this uh, neurofilament light chain is uh, upcoming thing actually uh, uh, till now this after till probably the lancet article which had come probably lot of interest has come uh, on the neurofilament light chain till now is beta 100 was the one which have been used for the neuronal marker then uh, most of the biomarkers are used by uh, neuro uh, neurologists i don't think anesthesiologists neuroanesthesiologists has been using any biomarkers for doing any of the studies probably we can use this because you know that neurofilament light chain as uh, one of the uh, prognostic uh, factor you are uh, end point suppose whatever intervention suppose you have hypotension you can see how the post op this changes so various interventions can be used if you using multimodal monitoring how this is going to change the neurofilament chain so that will be giving a clue for how we have to go forward in the future uh, doctor i'm yeah. not, going, not going to leave it so soon uh, uh, we're learning colleague of ours listen uh, okay in uh, newborn or 80 years uh, the, that <laughs> index that we usually follow uh, for neurosurgery is to begin with 70 and then we come down to 55 or even 48 uh, was without any adverse effect that why we have we have uh, compared to abnormal surgery or other surgeries where we need higher base numbers you know but then if you take care of nociception also by another monitoring that is ani that was used to be available in those days i am not sure whether it is available now or not ani monitors were very good it get very precise number uh, very easy only thing we, we stop getting the transducers after three four years of uh, the availability of the equipment first in 2015 or something so i don't know whether you have any uh, a comment about a simultaneously monitoring of nociception as well as the depth actually, of yeah, actually yeah. Niman's people have published on the uh, sir I, actually ani i have uh, not have experience on ani because Niman's people have got this ani they have done a lot of publication on that till it uh, does not actually measure the brain activity it measures the autonomic function actually peripheral actions yeah. of the nociception actually what we are actually looking into the actual brain what is happening into the brain so there is a lot of difference uh, as a neuroanesthesiologist how we look into that Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we now uh, introduce Dr. Ram Pasapuleti. He um, it comes from, he's the director of Center for Pain Management in Kentucky, and he is a prolific pain uh, management physician and it's and we're very happy to have him he, um, here today to speak to us about the effectiveness of lumbar facet joint blocks and predictive value before radiofrequency denervation. Um, thank you so much for being here and we look forward to hearing your talk. But, um, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes or no? Yeah, just put, put it full. Uh, while housekeeping, uh, good morning, Hyderabad. I was born and brought up in Hyderabad, so I'm a hardcore Hyderabadi. So I'm glad, yeah, and, and I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be back here. Uh, this is my city. And welcome, everyone. Yes, that's right. So. <laughs> Well, you know, I don't know if I'm more lost or more intimidated today, you know, among all of you uh, neuroanesthesiologists, neurosurgeons and stuff. I'm the odd bird out 
here uh, we're speaking about something completely uh, different and probably alien to you guys uh, uh, very kind of you to say so but I don't know but I, but anyway um, I don't know if I'll be able to educate you but if I don't educate you I can entertain you so um, I have some film clippings and uh, movie shots and stuff so yeah maybe I can entertain you um, and I wanted to thank Dr. Padmaja uh, thank you ma'am for inviting me uh, to be a part of this conference and also to be a part of this uh, distinguished gathering of uh, the best of the best in neuroanesthesia and critical care. So thank you again. Uh, I'm not even going to bother with uh, uh, saying that uh, whatever the title is, it's a mouthful. So I would say I'm here to do a critical appraisal of the uh, fact study and we'll, we'll talk about what the fact study is here in a second. Um, let me see, I have to figure this out. How do I advance this? I'm a little technically challenged, I think. So, okay, it's it's not going. So, it's not doing anything. So, it's not forwarding. Uh, it's not my fault. So, okay. Arrow sale, huh? Arrow shoes sale, huh? Yeah. More technical challenges here, so I can sing while they're doing it if you want me to, but uh, you probably wouldn't like it. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's see if we can get this done. Uh, my name is Ram Paspaleti. I'm the director for Center for Pain Management and the president of the Kentucky Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. Uh, um, and the, I teach for the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, and there's no outside funding, no grants or industrial support for this presentation. Okay. All right. So, All right, so uh, I don't know if this is a conflict of interest. I'm a co-author for this uh, study that we published. Uh, this is in uh, May 2020. This is about uh, American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians guidelines for facet joint interventions 2020. Uh, there is no straight conflict to what I'm presenting today, but it's in a similar area there. So that's why. I always start my presentations with my favorite uh, Kirtana. It's Endero Mahanu Bhavalu Andariki Vandanamlu. The Telugu people here, any Telugu people here, they'll understand that, yeah. So, uh, for the Telugu challenged people, um, it is, it means uh, several great people, I bow to each one of them. So, in the tradition of Tyagaraja, he was praising his predecessors, I praise my predecessors in the academic tradition, my gurus, Prithviraj and Rax, and everybody else after them, and everybody else that's there in front of me, my due respects to all of you. Again, I'm kind of stuck here. Bad stuff. I don't know why I seem to be having the all, all kinds of trouble, but... Uh, okay, let's, let's see if we, this works. Nope. All right, so, and then... Uh, I like this quote by Confucius, to know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. So, and uh, Copernicus came about 2000 years later and he said the same thing in a more complex way, but uh, the, the idea is the same. Let's see what this modern day philosopher, American philosopher has to say about the same topic. I'm sure you have recognized the modern day philosopher, right? Who's this? Clint Eastwood, right? Uh, for, for me, he's as good a philosopher as anybody else. So, 
Uh, let's see what he has to say. It's got to know his limitations. I don't know if you heard him. A man's got to know his limitations, right? So, why and do I know my limitations here? So, so and I, I know my limitations very well. So, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the study. The objective, what I'm planning to do is to summarize and provide a critical appraisal of the fact study and discuss clinical implications, future directions and considerations for the patient population and clinical setting in India. I want to stress that. So, I want to stress the clinical setting in India. Uh, the structure, I'm going to do the summary first and then do the critical appraisal. And when we do critical appraisal, what do we do? We ask these questions. Are these studies results valid? Uh, what are the results and conclusions? And uh, will the results help in caring for my patient? That is the most important thing that I ask myself. Any study that I, I read. Um, clinical implications and future directions. And then considerations for the patient population and clinical setting in India. That's what I want to stress more. Because we are doing a critical appraisal of a study to see if it is relevant to India, right? So that's why. Now, a quick summary. This was published in 2018, September, in the Anesthesiology. And this was done by uh, Stephen Cohen and uh, uh, his uh, group of uh, uh, people. And uh, I've given the, the link there. You can click it, and it'll take you there. That's a citation. Uh, basically, this, to summarize the study, what Cohen et al. did was they presented the results of a two-stage it was a two-stage randomized controlled trial of 229 uh, axial low back pain patients from multiple military hospitals, veterans affairs hospitals, and one academic center, and uh, one private hospital in U USA. What they did was in the first stage, these 229 uh, back pain patients were randomized to receive either medial branch blocks, intraarticular steroid injections, uh, or a saline injection. So they divided these uh, patients into three groups and uh, they assessed the initial response. So after they did these injections, they assessed the response to these injections immediately and then four weeks later, they assessed them again. And during the second stage, what they did was, this was very interesting how they, they did this. Uh, they took uh, patients who had positive initial response to medial branches and intraarticular blocks and all patients who had saline injections proceeded to do radiofrequency. So to make it clear, so if a, if a patient had a medial branch block and had response more than 50% of pain relief, he went to radiofrequency. Uh, uh, if a patient had intraarticular steroid injection and had more than 50% of pain relief, they went to radiofrequency. And the last group, the saline group, whether they had a good response or no, they went to radiofrequency. That's how they designed the study. So what did they find? I don't know. This keeps kind of back and forth. I'm going back now. I don't know. This is, this is, yeah, I'm going way beyond. It's. Sorry about this, guys. Sorry. Yeah, I results here. I think that's, that's where I want. Okay. So, um, can I go with this? I've been doing that, but yeah. All right. So, um, sorry about that. I don't know. This is okay. okay. All right. So, um, in the second second stage, those who had uh, response to the medial branches. Um, we, we, they went on to the radio frequency ablation. It's very distracting. Very distracting. Seems to work for him. It doesn't seem to work for me. All right. So um, the study, what, what, what were the results of the study? The study found that neither intraarticular or medial branch blocks with steroid reduced low back pain to an extent greater than saline injection. So that what they said that, that whether they got the, the medial branch block or the intraarticular steroid or the saline, at the end of four weeks, they had, they, their results were the same. Their outcome was the same. And then after the radiofrequency, 
uh, there was no difference in the outcome whether the patient came from the medial branch group or the intraarticular steroid group or the saline group, all of them had the same results. We can talk about this while I'm, I'm doing the appraisal here. So that was the summary. I don't know how much of that uh, you know, came through. But the a critical appraisal, so when we are doing a critical appraisal of any study, we are asking three questions. Are the study's results valid? What are the results? And will the results help in caring uh, for my patient? So in, in those, we ask sub-questions. Does the study ask a clearly focused clinical question? Uh, is the study's design appropriate? Is the study conducted um, in a methodolo methodologically sound way? And what are the uh, limitations of the study? And what are the results, conclusions, interpretations? And were the study's patients similar to my patient? That question I ask myself all the time, and you have to ask yourself as well. Uh, were all clinically important outcomes considered? Uh, are the likely treatment benefits worth the potential harms uh, and cause? So the first question, are the study's results valid? Does the study ask a clearly focused uh, clinical question? In this study, they did not frame a key question. They hypothesized two things before they started the trial. And they said that intra-articular injections with local anesthetic steroid may have some therapeutic effect. That's what they thought. But the end of the study proved that, that it did not. And then they thought medial branch blocks would have better predictive value before uh, denovation. Even that was not proved right after the study. So is the study's design appropriate? Well, it's a randomized controlled uh, trial with the, uh, uh, with, with the placebo control. So this is the gold standard for studies anyway. So this was, uh, the design was appropriate. Are the study's results valid? Is the study conducted in a methodologically uh, sound way? So let's go with the size. There are 229 participants. It seems to be a good uh, uh, you know, uh, number, but when you, when you divide it into the three groups, then the power becomes less. So randomization was, was good, two is to two is to one. Um, the study groups were compatible at baseline. Uh, investigators were blinded to group assignments, but there was some unblinding that was done uh, towards the later half of the study. Uh, compliance was good. There was no cross-contamination. There was no uh, crossover of patients. Um, and then low dropout rate, about 208 patients finished the study. Uh, appropriate interventional technique was done. It was done under fluoroscopic guidance, standard technique. Uh, the data collection and outcome measures, they, they issued a uh, correction. When the study was published, they said that the NRS, the uh, numerical rating scale, was their go-to, was their uh, main primary outcome. But then they said that it was not the NRS that they measured, it was the change in the NRS. So after the inter intervention, if there was any change in the NRS, that's what they measured. That did not affect the, the, the studies. And then statistical analysis, they used power analysis. Uh, intention to treat, the uh, analysis of variance and uh, the chi-square test, logistic regression analysis, so all pretty standard for these kind of uh, studies, right? So uh, uh, then again asking what are the limitations of the study? That's what we are asking for, right? So it was designed as a comparative effectiveness study uh, and therefore uh, there was liberal uh, uh, selection criteria was used. Uh, if you remember, the selection criteria was in any a patient who was 18 years or older. That's a very liberal uh, selection criteria. And I say that because a good example is my patient population. My patient population is 50 to 80. So, so they used 18 to uh, and, and older. So that means that truly how many people had facetogenic pain was the question. So, and that, that, uh, that kind of is the limitation for the study. Then they used a retrospective uh, study to calculate the sample size. And uh, like I said, you know, 229 seems to be good, but it may be underpowered when you split them up into inject, uh, middle branch blocks and intra-articular injections and stuff like that. So blinding was done till the end. Uh, towards the end, they had to be unblinded, and that may have created some kind of bias uh, and amplify, amplified the differences in placebo effect. The study may have underestimated effectiveness as well. So what are the conclusions? So, so this study establishes that facet blocks are not therapeutic. They, they came out and said after this study, facet blocks are not therapeutic. However, so facet blocks might provide prognostic value before radiofrequency uh, ablation. That's what they said. So how do you interpret this? So 
There is really small difference in pain relief and radio frequency ablation response rates between the intervention and the placebo. Uh, so in clinical practice, we usually use a double block paradigm. We, we do two blocks uh, in, 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 the, in uh, clinical practice. But that Cohen et al. did another study and said that two blocks were not very efficient. Uh, but for these studies like this, they said maybe two blocks uh, would be better. So the placebo effect is strong. Why, why did they say that? Because even people who got saline injections got some relief. Just plain saline injections got some relief. And, and so that's what made them say that the placebo effect is stronger for interventions than for medications. So findings indicate medial branch blocks and intraarticular injections are unlikely to provide long-term benefit to most people and should not be marketed as such. So they said that please don't market facet injections as, as a long-term relief. That's what they said, uh, which was against a lot of other studies which we're going to look at here. And then they said the medial branch blocks are easier to perform. That is true. Uh, and because they had 29% failure rates in the intraarticular injections. Then the, the, the most important question that I ask myself for any study is the results of any study help in ca uh, caring in my, in my patients, right? So were the studies patients similar to my patients? No, they were not. Like I said, my, my patients are Medicare and Medicaid patients. So I, uh, 50 and 50 to 80 is, is my patient range. And they started with 18 years of age. So my patient uh, population is slightly different. And you need to ask yourself about the same thing. Were all cl uh, clinically important outcomes considered? Yes, they were considered. Pain, function, they were considered. And then are the likely treatment benefits worth the potential harms and costs? Uh, they did not talk about harms. Cost was taken into consideration. Um, and the implications in future directions. The study demonstrates the lack of therapeutic benefit from intraarticular and medial branch blocks. However, applying radio frequency ablation findings is more challenging. Right. So they established the fact that the uh, facet blocks are not therapeutic. They're very clear about it, but the same cannot be said about their findings on radio, fre uh, radio frequency ablation, right? So because all the three groups in radio frequency got the same kind of pain relief. There are several studies that have been published in the past 15 years, and it's only fair for us when we are doing a critical appraisal to compare this study with the past studies that have been published. These are all the studies. I'm not going to go through each, each one of them. Uh, the first couple, uh, Dr. Manchikanti did, uh, I work with him closely. And uh, the one study that I will point out is the last uh, but one. This was the um, recent, it, was, it is hot of the press, two weeks ago. The Indian study for uh, Indian uh, Society for Study of Pain published this, guidelines, guidelines for facet blocks and radio frequency. And what is relevant to us is, what they said was very interesting. So. They said that if a patient got a medial branch block and got more than 80% of pain relief, you can go ahead and do the radio frequency. If a, if a patient got 50 to 80% of pain relief, then you probably need a second block. And then if a patient got less than 50% of pain relief, you need to reevaluate re your diagnosis. So that was their recommendation for the Indian setting, which is more important for us here or for all of you practicing here. So what are the uh, future directions? Most studies that, that I've quoted they, they are limited by lack of definitive standard for diagnosing pain from the facet joint and also for differentiating facet pain from the many other potential pain generators associated with the low back pain. So we simply lack a good strategy for e e efficiently selecting those who will receive benefit from radio frequency ablation. So more trials are needed. You know, I, I heard the speakers ahead of me, more trials are needed, more trials are needed. So that's what the same thing that we say here. So how is it now? The, the final part is the considerations of the patient population in clinical setting in, Indi in India, which is very important for all of you. So does this study make any sense in India? That's the question that all of you have to ask yourselves, right? So we talk about evidence-based medicine all the time. Every uh, speaker before me put up so many different studies, right? That is evidence-based medicine. So evidence-based medicine, uh, it, it, it was defined very nicely by Rosenberg and Sackett in 1996. They, they said... Evidence-based medicine is the consensuous, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients, and it falls nicely into this little uh, area, intersection between individual clinical experience, best external evidence, and patient values and expectations. So that's what evidence-based medicine should be. Now, for the Indian setting, evidence is one form of acquiring knowledge, right? So what we talked about, looking at a study, 
is one form of acquiring knowledge. But there are several other pramanas from Indian knowledge systems which are more important. Can anybody tell me what are the pramanas of knowledge in the Indian knowledge systems? How do you how does that how does one acquire knowledge? Any kind of knowledge? What are the ways of acquiring knowledge? One is pratyaksha, right? Pratyaksha is experience. So in your case, in, in my case, when you do something, when you do an intervention, I do a facet block and I see the result of it. It works. That is pratyaksha. That is experience for me. Nobody else has to conven convince me that I have to do this. So because I've seen it myself, that is uh, pratyaksha. The second, um, the second one is anumana, which is inference, right? Science works on inference. We do everything on inference. Then the third one is upamana or comparison. Just now I did comparison of uh, other studies with this study. So that is a comparison. Placebo controlled studies are comparison studies, right? So that's a very good way of learning. That's a very good means of knowledge for us. And Shabda. Shabda is testimony. Testimony of past or present reliable experts. So what did we talk about? We talked about all the evidence that, that we talked about is Shabda. So somebody is telling us that they have done this study and they've got these results and we hear from them. And that's what we talked about right now. But Look at the look at the you know priority in Indian systems. They don't put evidence as the first pramana. They put uh, as experience as the first way of uh, learning knowledge. Any any knowledge can be gained. The first way of uh, gaining it is by experience. That is the first one. So gaining experience by doing more proce procedures. So do more procedures. Then that is protection for you. You use inference. You use comparison. That will lead to more evidence. Right. So you do a study. Right? You do a study by your own experience and that, what does that become? That becomes evidence from that point on. You publish it and that becomes evidence from that point on. So the point is, the emphasis is not only on doing more, but also publishing them. It's not enough to do one procedure and say, aha, you know, I know this. But if you publish them, publish it, it becomes evidence. So from now on, you know, I would encourage every one of you to do more and publish more as well. And finishing up, the bottom line from this study that I can say is, if you want to go ahead and do the radio frequency without doing the medial branch block, go ahead. That's what the study uh, basically says. And finally, I finish with the one of the best ways of uh, doing things in life is the Hyderabadi way, right? So what is the Hyderabadi way of doing things? Sapka sunna apna karna, right? Right? That's the best way of doing things. Sapka sunna apna karna. So, uh, which is, and uh, for the Urdu challenge, for the uh, Urdu challenge, listen to everyone, do what you like. So, uh, I mean, having read all the studies, you know, do, uh, then do what you like. So, uh, which is what most of us do most of the times. Right? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Pasapuletti. We're going to keep questions to the end uh, after our next yeah. speaker. Thank you so much. Um, third uh, presentation that we are going to have. I thought this will be last, but we have one more presentation in this, uh, in this um, session. Uh, uh, the presenter is Professor Dr. A uh, H.S. Dash, who has uh, been the head of Department of Neuroanesthesiology and rather created the Department of Neuroanesthesiology at yeah. the Institute of Medical Sciences. Yeah. He has been Center Director of Neurosciences Center uh, at the Institute of Medical Sciences. He founded this ISNAC group. He is the founder member and founder president. Uh, I, I remember in 1999, I was a visiting, uh, DST visiting fellow in his department. And how very uh, involved way of uh, his uh, thinking about starting some association, some scientific group, and how he was working, uh, sitting with us, all of us, and said, you are newer, you are newer in the group, so I will, I will register you late, but I am now finding out the senior, senior ones and who are fully involved in neurosciences to get registered with our group. And he did it, he did it, and the, uh, 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 this association is front of you, flourishing so well. And then he also, uh, headed uh, not only founder president of this society but also uh, president of Asian 
so, so ACN Society of Neurosociology and Critical Care, he has also had uh, uh, two very, very prestigious awards, uh, WHO Fellowship Award as well as the uh, Teacher of the Year 2010 uh, award given by the SNAC, International Society of Neurosciences and Critical Care. That's a great prestigious award given to an Indian uh, colleague. And I, I welcome you all, Professor Das, sir, to please present your a very, very interesting topic. The guidelines, guidelines we don't have any so far. Uh, the ISNAC is working very hard to prepare guidelines for various situations, clinical scenarios, critical care scenarios, and all that. And I think he has taken lead in this as well, uh, knowing the pitfalls of not having the guidelines. Because it is quite important to have one uniform practice in all situations, excepting some very emergent situations where they not be in line, or the patient-to-patient -patient variations they may be there. Those can be different situations. Otherwise, guidelines are going to improve our overall neurosciences practice, neurosciences practice. Over to Professor Das, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Mishra. Respected chairpersons, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the role uh, of ISNAC to develop the uh, guidelines pertaining to neuroanesthetic management has been assigned by Dr. Padmaja to me. And there is no conflict of interest and I don't have to declare anything. And I have brought greetings from Fortis Memorial Research Institute where I have been working since last uh, uh, 10 to 11 years now. Uh, um, um, the flow of my lecture will follow these headings. That is, do you really need guideline that we'll have to discuss? What are clinical guidelines? What is the definition and how it is manufactured or produced? And what are the advantages and drawbacks? What is the best practice or good practice guideline? And is this really a panacea? And what are the future perspectives? <clears throat> this, I, I think uh, almost all the neuroanesthesiology departments of, the, of uh, in India must be practicing checklists, standards of anesthesia care and monitoring and post-operative care, analgesic management in the post-operative period. And the protocols must have been devised depending on the uh, scientific and physiological uh, principles. And we also follow the different algorithms, practice advisory, and nowadays a lot of reviews you'll find. Those are uh, really mind-boggling because uh, extensive review, uh, then a focused review. So many reviews have been published nowadays uh, on different aspects and over and above the Cochrane review and the meta-analysis for which one can rely uh, on your scientific data. Sorry. Uh, this is one of the most uh, popular guidelines, I mean uh, the review I have come across. It was uh, voted to the internet that is most popular article written by my student from Seattle that is perioperative management of blood pressure after acute ischemia. Once you read this and apply this in your practice, there is no need of protocol. And uh, coming over to the research studies that have influenced our clinical practice, we have published this both in the Anesthesia Journal as well as in Neurology India. And uh, when we have so many things available, do you really need guidelines? And this reminds me of uh, the famous dialogue from Akshay Kumar, Bacche kya jaan loge kya? And see the last batsman, think about the plights of the last batsman of the England team. I mean, uh, despite so many things available, still there is probably poverty. So that's why we need guidelines. And I think uh, Dr. Padmaja, why she has given it to me, it is really intriguing. But I think she has something in mind. While going through the, while surfing through the literature, 
I came across this beautiful article published recently in our journal and which was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, initiated by Dr. Puneya and Prasanna, they are not here, and it was carried out by Asis Bindra and uh, so many other colleagues of ours. But the, mo the icing on the cake was uh, uh, the editorial written by Uma Mahesur Rao. Uma Mahesur Rao is not here. I think this is my request uh, to Uma Mahesur Rao. I think everybody should convey. I have conveyed also. Uh, uh, while writing the editorial, he should have discussed this article. What are the lacunies? What are the pos major positive points? And what are the lacunies in this, art in this article? He should have mentioned about that. But he has asked, where are the guidelines? And uh, this uh, discussion was also a lot of heat and dust was raised in two, way back in 2003 in snack level, that is our parent body, where Gregory Cosby, he was vehemently opposing this uh, idea because he argued that this neuroanesthesia is a dynamic science and a lot of complexities in the technology and the uh, the Consumers are getting sophisticated and the hospitals and providers looking for competitive uh, advantages. So uh, first and foremost is we must have the data, then only we go for the guidelines. But Professor Lamb, he vociferously argued that we must have the guidelines because neuroanesthesia disciplines in America in most of these centers follow the different protocols and they are highly qualified. But his argument was that uh, the surgical procedure, I mean the uh, patients with neurosurgical uh, uh, diseases undergoing different other types of surgery may, uh, is carried out by the different anesthetist. For them, the guidelines will be much more useful. And I think, I feel also this guideline is useful, the way we have developed so many medical colleges and so many new anesthesiology departments have been established with um, paucity of uh, good faculties. So that way I think guideline is needed. What are the clinical practice guidelines? What is the uh, actual guideline is? This has been defined by Institute of uh, Medicine that statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient care that are informed by a systemic review of uh, evidence-based medicine. I think uh, Dr. Pasupati has talked about this evidence-based medicine and assessment of the benefits and harms of the alternative care options, which is best for the patient that we must do, be it investigation, be it continuum of care. And of course, this is another uh, uh, small uh, review from the anesthesiologist where they have written that it is not mandatory to follow the guidelines and one must be flexible depending on the situations. There are uh, five steps through which one can formulate the guidelines. First, you identify the disease or the problems uh, on which you want to develop the guidelines, then convene or running guide group. You prepare a group and you must appoint a chairperson and this group and chairperson must be well versed and they must be academically sound on that topic. And on the then first is retrieve the data and the most evidence one data are randomized control trials, meta-analysis and uh, good reviews and then synthesize and then make summary of the uh, care. And this evidence has to be translated and recommended and then the last thing is external review has to be done so that uh, the uh, different uh, problems can be uh, addressed. The most, the Herculean task is to uh, retrieve the evidence-based medicine, synthesize, and then uh, assimilate those things. The advantages of guidelines uh, are, it enhances appropriate clinical practice, 
improve quality of diagnostic care and continuum of care and it provides definitely better outcome to the patients and it improves the cost effectiveness and it empowers the patient. The patient may decide whether to undergo or not to undergo because I remember my teacher, he refused to undergo chemotherapy. So that way you can empower the patient and identify areas of further research and you, if your guideline is good, it may influence the public policy or the government may adopt it all over India. The disadvantages of uh, guidelines are inaccessibility, long life cycle development, inapplicable to the local setting because the guidelines are formulated depending on the disease and uh, not depending on the local setting. See, suppose hilly area, there is goiter is dominant or fluorosis is uh, prevalent in some area. So in that case, that guideline may not be helpful and it should be patient directed. I mean, patients with comorbidities must be taken into account. Lack of, lack of active user involvement and more like it is a cookbook or like the uh, mother feeding the child while before going to the school. Jaldi jaldi khao. Uh, coming over to the what is best guideline, there are eight uh, attributes. The validity, that means the guideline must uh, provide better outcome and it should cost provide better uh, cost. And it should be reliable and it must be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what, what that? Uh, it's not coming. <laughs> clinical applicability, clinical flexibility, and it should not be ambiguous. It should be non-ambiguous clarity. And it is, uh, if you can maintain the multidisciplinary, it will be very good. Because being the, in neuroanesthesia, we must involve neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, and neurologists. And if uh, possible, neuropathologists also. And uh, this scheduled review, because nowadays a lot of multicentric trials are uh, going on, so you must have periodic review. And documentation must be done meticulously. And this is uh, one of the conscious guidelines because it is very difficult to uh, retrieve any randomized control trial on malignant hyperthermia. So that's why the European group, what they did, they took the experts from the European as well as from the world and this, then they devised this guideline which is I think applicable all over the world. And this is called consensus guideline. And SNAG has also produced so many guidelines starting from 2003 onwards and uh, one can go through and these guidelines are also being practiced all over. USA, Canada, and all over the world. Do clinical practice guidelines improve processes or outcomes in primary care? Is it panacea? That is my question. So this is a study from carried out from the military hospitals in the USA, and uh, they actually studied two diseases, that is asthma, bronchial asthma, and diabetes. And they have concluded that uh, clinical practice guidelines appear to improve diagnostic and educational processes more than provided depending on these uh, clinical guidelines in bronchial asthma, but not in diabetes mellitus. And uh, this is a publication from the American uh, uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists where they have praised the guidelines and they have advocated for the implementation and use of practice guidelines in their clinical practice. And I, in another article I have found out that the medical legal problems can be minimized if you follow the uh, practice guidelines. And the uh, American Heart Association produced or published guidelines religiously every year. 
and as a result this uh, uh, practice guidelines for ischemic stroke you can find out the result that the window period for the management of re or the uh, opening of the vessels that is chemical i mean mechanical thrombectomy has been increased from 6 hours to 16 hours so this is the outcome studies and how the clinical guidelines has helped and the i i mean uh, one should not forget about the brain trauma foundation which has established in 1986 and they have pro published this fifth guidelines i think if i'm not wrong uh, in 2020 or 19 and uh, this is to improve outcomes of traumatic brain injury all over the world i mean particularly in the america and canada now it is all over the world and the evidence guideline has been developed regularly every four to five years and uh, the uh, aim and objective is to improve medical education clinical research and quality improvement in the program and uh, of course mild tbi research and this is uh, a comparative study in 97 patients which uh, we uh, divided into two groups one group 37 patient uh, pre guideline means no guidelines uh, follow up whereas in 63 patients they followed the guidelines strictly and the lo and behold these there is 9.1 percent improvement in patients outcome where the guideline was followed or uh, followed uh, strictly <clears throat> And this is the, in uh, 1995, 2000, 2005, the survey was conducted in USA and Canada, and they have found out that BTF guideline improved the outcome and improved the research, and the cost, it was also cost effective. And uh, how many centers follow the guidelines? I think our neurosurgeons will opine on this topic. Uh, coming over to, uh, I mean, if the music of RRR has taken the whole world into their fit and uh, Raja Mauli's RRR has become very popular all over the world, who knows, Dr. Padmas are heading the guidelines uh, from, uh, I mean, a snack, it may improve the outcome all over the world or the all over the world may follow our ISNA guideline in the future. Uh, let's, uh, God's blessing, I, I invoke the God's blessing on everybody, so that let's, if we want to plan some good guidelines, then we must work very hard, and we must try to do, I mean, uh, manufacture guidelines on topics where there is no guidelines. Otherwise, it is a repetition. I mean, one should not waste time on repeating the same thing. The Chinese and Japanese have advanced because uh, I think people in India used to tell, no, no, we must have our own data. So, usme we bar time barbad hota hai. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Daesh. Uh, I mean, comments uh, uh, for this is extremely important. But I have been told by the organizers that we are running short of time. Six minutes. I have finished before. Time. Sorry. That yeah, and we have one more talk during this session. So maybe a couple of minutes of uh, interaction as Dr. Dash has asked for. Dash has finished six minutes prior to his given time, you know. So I think we must yeah, utilize at least, uh, at least three minutes of this. We have already running. To Half an hour beyond time or session. Ah, Earlier speakers have all gone. Please come to buy. Can doctor. can we have an open conversation, please? Are my boss? Sir, uh, the guidelines are, madam is speaking.
Just finish. No, she, she asked me if uh, the placebo, the placebo, the uh, how do you, what do you tell patients when you give them a placebo? This was a blinded trial, so they were, they did not know that they were getting the placebo. Sir, uh, I don't have any mind that guidelines are definitely going to improve the outcomes. But uh, most of the studies which are producing and the guidelines are at the bigger institute and they don't consider many times uh, the infrastructures all over the country which is having. Uh, these guidelines sometimes like at the district level or the nursing home level when they are coming, if the medical line of treatment is okay. Like for example, ETCO2 I give, I, ASA has given ETCO2 1986 probably, it is a mandatory and ISA now after 20 years or 25 years has given that it is a mandatory. So there is always some gap. So that is the reason our own guidelines considering the infrastructures of the different hospital has to be produced. That is my that's a comment about no that is true but that's uh, that does not mean that uh, we w waste unnecessary time i think we must apply the guidelines uh, then you can say ki the uh, institution which does not have etco2 can follow this that no, many times this become medical legal issues that's important things that's important thing because if i don't follow these guidelines like etco2 if isi given guidelines of nine so, nursing see, home see again suppose if they become a medical legal issue it is the on the government side also it, i don't know about that it, sir as you said so government the, will be held responsible as you said in the guidelines are not to be mandatory followed it is not a mandatory guidelines are just giving a how to go about so legally also we can defend that protocols are different if you have a protocol in your hospital no. you have to follow that no, I, I protocol can be formed on the basis of guidelines but guidelines if we follow in the legal also <laughs> they are not mandatory guidelines are just to give it see, see actually this was my and old old slides actually my <laughs> in my recent slides in that two beautiful articles oh, in anesthesiology recently so and BJ 22 anesthesiology 21 probably so they have analyzed this is a review they have analyzed all the, all the European and uh, American and Canadian guidelines and they have found out that more than 50 percent of the guidelines were created depending on the non-randomized control studies or case studies like this and so that has to be updated. So they have advocated for the updatation. Actually, my sir, <laughs> Professor Dash, sir, Padmaja, Dr. Padmaja. No, actually, if you look at the title, there is it ends with a question mark. The need of the hour is a question mark. So uh, actually, uh, ISA, ICCM, everyone is you know they're flooding the system with a lot of guidelines, and as you said, there's a lot of repetition. So that's why probably we put a question mark there. And again, in neuro anesthesia, probably most the maximum that would be possible would be a consensus statement rather than a guideline, uh, given the current evidence that we have on a lot of things. Maybe it's also yeah, important that, that, that we generate evidence that, that, and that, also come up with at least consensus statements would at least be useful. Yeah, that, that is a much better guide practice. approach. Uh, sir, sir, Professor Dash, I have a contradictory opinion. Uh, uh, formulating practice guidelines helps everyone. To get some insight, everyone is not so well qualified and trained neuro anesthesiologist, but still many of our anesthesiologists are practicing it. Secondly, sir, a body like ours, wherein you are the not only founder president, you are still very active, uh, our uh, senior uh, faculty members, and I think we should formulate a guideline a committee and uh, especially on uh, certain important elective procedures, for example, an aneurysm gripping which uh, is done in different ways, different uh, hospitals, different ways. And then more importantly, emergent situations like say, rupture of aneurysm or for that matter, you know, uh, see, uh, there is uh, uh, any other emergency like in trauma, uh, or especially in involving head injury or not involving head injury. Well, see. There, there should be guidelines from us, sir, multi-trauma with the head injury or without head injury. So likewise, I think some of us should sit together and formulate some practicing guidelines to help most others, especially the Dr. Camilla, you are a part of SNAC. What's your take on that? I mean, I think in the emergency setting, it's very important to have protocols, as you were saying, based on the guidelines and updating those regularly. Yeah, so those, I think for emergencies, you, you have to, for 
in general, it, it just depends on your institution and it depends on the neurosurgeons that you work with. So setting up universal guidelines that should be followed is, I think, more difficult to do. Institutional guidelines. That's what you know. So, final comment by uh, our uh, colleague uh, who's there at the podium. Please go ahead, Dr. Ram. Dr. Ram. Before we have the last talk for the session uh, sir, by Dr. Uh, Srinivas. Sir, can, can I make a comment actually about the medical legal aspect actually? Okay. So, about the guidelines, uh, in, in India actually, we follow the Supreme Court guidelines and the Supreme Court in two judgments. One is the uh, Jacob Matthew case and secondly is the Samira Kohli case. They have uh, clearly guidelines that uh, uh, every anesthetist or doctor per se, you don't have to have the higher level of the standards. There is a one test that is called as the test of prudence. Means what the ordinary uh, in your same similar your in your setups, what is your all protocols you have to follow. If you are not doing that, then there is a breach. Then there is a breach of the services. Then you are held for the medical legal negligence. Otherwise, not. you don't have to follow the highest care of the standards. Thank you. Dr. Ram, you have any comments? So what is your karna? Ram. Yeah, Ram's karna. Yeah, they, yeah, that's what I do basically. You know, I, the the point is you can't just sit in your bubble and say that I'm going to do what I like doing. Uh, I you know I I read all the studies. I I I follow all the evidence, and then I do what I want to do. So that that's a fair thing to say, rather than just sitting there and saying, okay, you know, I just like to do what I want to do. So that's my my way and what most of us do anyway. I, I do, I do. Radio frequency so, works. Radio Dr. Frequency Ram, work, yes. Dr. Ram, yes. being a past president of Pain Physicians of India, I have a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, you said at four week time, there is no difference between facet block, medial nerve block, or for that matter, saline. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. But during these four periods, four week periods, both of them, without saline, they give pain relief. They do. And we have to see whether we are getting pain relief or not. We have to see whether what is the duration. And sometimes, couple of facet blocks relieves pain altogether. If not, then probably we will go for uh, radio frequency ablations. So they have a role. Don't say they have, don't have a role. And I doubt, I doubt the eth ethical, medical ethical aspect of giving saline only. I mean, how can you give a saline where you know there will not be any effect? I mean, it is medical ethically not. I don't know how your ethical committee uh, signed institutional ethical committee. Oh, it's not my study. No, it's no. somebody else's okay, study. Thank you. I'm just quoting it. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, no, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just quoting it. I think I, yeah. you got the point. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hmm. So, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Srinivas, uh, who's going to talk to us about weaning of the ventilator, uh, making the ventilator work for you in neuromuscular dysfunction. Good morning. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude for the INSCC for giving me this opportunity and I'll try to make it as brief as possible. What I'll be talking to you about in the next 15 minutes or so is about the newer weaning modes which would probably help us in making the ventilator work for us in getting our patients off the machines. And this will be you know something that is in the context of what modes we do have available in the current machines in this country. When we talk about weaning, what we need to understand is the fact that it is a process of withdrawing mechanical ventilatory support and transferring the work of breathing from the machine to the patient. That's what weaning actually means. So the patient could still have an artificial airway device in place for airway protection or for structural anomalies of the upper airway, but he is physically liberated from being connected to an external machine for his facilitated breathing. So this discussion happens in the context of what load the patient is facing versus what the machine and the respiratory system is giving to the patient. When you talk about the respiratory system load, you need to talk about what the minute ventilation requirements are, which are 
in a general critically ill mm. patient related to mm. carbon dioxide product, uh, production and dead space but in a neuro critically ill patient it's got to do with the ventilatory drive it's not always true that a neuro critically ill patient has a depressed ventilatory drive some of these patients actually have a drive for hyperventilation that itself actually puts a lot of load on the respiratory system while the work of breathing may not always be affected in a patient with traumatic brain injury or ischemic stroke patients with aidp and neuromuscular disorders do end up facing a lot of work of breathing due to inappropriate sizing of the tubes with which they are intubated or through which they are tracheostomized so this has to take into effect the fact that the respiratory muscles tend to atrophy as early as 48 hours after initiation of mechanical ventilatory support the knee jerk reaction to such increased load and therefore the patient's inability to sustain the effort to get help from the machine is to increase the pressure support on our machines and now we understand after the covid pandemic that the the excessive pressure support we give to patients can also produce lung injury which was called as patient self induced lung injury during the covid pandemic but now workers in the field of mechanical ventilation tend to call it over assistance myotrauma that means you tend to give more pressure support the patient draws in more air uh, tidal volumes the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles get stretched more and therefore sustain more red degeneration and sarcoplasmic damage so at this point of time when you keep all these facts in mind what options do we have in at the uh, in at our disposal conventionally we have used either pressure support or you take out the pressure support give the only the peep and call it continuous positive airway pressure or previously we used to use synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation which is no longer part of the weaning tools for neurocritically ill patients so we come to use some advanced modes of ventilation and we will then see how they affect the process of getting a patient off the machine and these modes include the volume support the volume assured pressure support mandatory minute ventilation and automated tube compensation the other one which you see on the screen the aprv or the airway pressure release ventilation is something that is used for low compliance so we don't talk about it in the weaning context it's about active ventilation with patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure why do we need these newer modes if we had established modes which have been working on our machines for the last 20 25 years why do we need these machines the, the reason why we need these machines is that the conventional modes have not done fantastically well in terms of getting patients off the machine if you can see this graph you can see the weaning success and weaning failure on the left half of the screen you see the conventional modes of ventilation like pressure support simv and the tps mode of weaning from ventilatory support and they have done, not done exceedingly well in preventing reintubation in these patients whereas the newer modes like automated tube compensation adaptive support ventilation and proportional assist and the smart care seem to be doing better in a general critically ill patient in terms of avoiding extubation failures why are we bothered about extubation failures extubation failure and subsequent reintubation is a quality indicator in the icu for the simple reason that it prolongs the length of stay in the intensive care unit and in a general intensive care unit it actually adds to the morbidity and mortality of a critically ill patient and a neuro critically ill patient probably is not any different from this subset of patients so what exactly causes or where exactly do you look at weaning failure there are two types of patients whom we consider as having failed to wean from ventilatory support either you have tried a spontaneous breathing trial with the tps or with pressure support or you have not even tried an sbt and you know that the patient is going to fail a weaning trial so after sbt if you have failed after a comprehensive evaluation and you have tried to improve the physiological status and then you try to optimize the rehabilitation you still have a situation where the patient is not going to wean then you have to consider advanced modes of ventilation or the newer modes of ventilation synchrony that means what the intensivist does to the patient to the machine and therefore the what the machine does to the patient is all what synchrony is about 
we all usually blame the mode and the patient for asynchrony but it is the man behind the machine who is actually responsible for asynchrony synchrony or asynchrony is therefore dependent upon the interaction between the patient and the ventilator and it also depends upon how the ventilator is going to pick up the intent of the patient to start breathing now that intent is not a neuromuscular effort that intent to breathe is a neural trigger we don't pick it up as yet in conventional modes of ventilator in a conventional mode of ventilation what we are actually doing is to pick up a neuromuscular response to the neural trigger for initiation of ventilatory support while that has worked in a general population of critical ill patients it may not work in a new in a neurocritical ill patient because the time lag between the trigger and the neuromuscular response may be prolonged in this cohort of patients and if we can have a system which picks up the neural trigger and extrapolates that neural trigger as the intent of the patient to start breathing and then indicates to the machine this is the time you have to give support to the machine to the patient probably your patients will get off the machine quicker and that's the philosophy of neurally adjusted ventilatory assist so the non -convent conventional or the newer modes of assisted ventilation include two aspects that is proportional assist when proportional ventilation called neurally adjusted ventilatory assist and the proportional assist ventilation and pav plus these two modes are something we'll spend a little bit of time on in understanding i've already spoken to you about what nava is nava is probably what we have at this point of time short of monitoring cerebral activity and then getting signal right from the respiratory center and giving it to the machine to trigger breathing what it picks up is electro electrical signals from the nervous system that is connecting the brain to the diaph diaphragm pick up the signals there and then use that as a trigger to give the pa the machine the indicator to give support to this patient proportional assist ventilation is something that takes into effect that the muscular pressure which a patient has to generate to breathe on his own while on a weaning mode of ventilation is related to the resistance and elastance of the lung which is again a product of the flow and the uh, resistance and the elastance of the system with, to which the patient is being connected so proportional assist ventilation instantly measures the flow and volume being pulled up by the patient and it knows calculates the elastance and resistance and decides what proportion of the support you have set on the machine needs to be given to the patient why is it different from pressure support pressure support is a fixed form of support whereas proportional assist ventilation is a graded form of support which overcomes the concept of the over assistance myotrauma which i spoke at the beginning of my presentation so when you set a patient on the pav or the pav plus set settings the trigger is the inspiratory effort the lowest trigger without auto triggering is what you set and it is the pressure support trigger the pneumatic trigger that happens and it, the expiratory cycling happens based on the absolute flow value based on the patient's effort so if somebody is fatiguing out the proportion increases and when somebody recovers from the fatigue it probably tones down on the amount of pressure support it gives to the patient so if you look at your myasthenia patient who is waxing and waning in his inspiratory effort this mode of ventilation probably is going to come in as a useful tool for weaning these patients from ventilatory support so what is the impact of this does have a physiological impact so the ventilator cycle ends close to the patient effort which makes it very close to the neural inspiratory time and the neural expiratory time so this proportional assist form of ventilation mimics or tries to mimic the neural trigger for initiation of ventilatory support and the level of assistance automatically adjusts to the changes in the effort intens uh, intensity and it allows for the continuous monitoring of the elastance and resistance of the uh, patient and therefore estimation of the muscular pressure which the patient has to generate this is the philosophy of nava which i will speak to you in the next five, two minutes we we are not yet in the state where we pick up the signals from the brain uh, the higher uh, centers or the brain stem but we are in a position to pick up signals from the uh, phrenic nerve and the diaphragm to use that as a trigger to get help from the machine for patients who have neuromuscular weakness and failure so when you look at it 
it is the diaphragmatic electrical activity that is measured by a probe that is inserted as the nasogastric tube which goes into the lower end of the esophagus at the uh, gastroesophageal junction and picks up different levels of tracing of the electromyographic signal or the electroneurographic signal that happens on the phrenic nerve translates it into a trigger and gives the patient pressure support so the patient actually need not make a flow or a pressure driven trigger which he, he currently does on normal modes of ventilation so the principle is the diaphragmatic electrical activity is used as the trigger to, wait, to trigger the ventilator and will give the assist which you have set how much support you want to give to the patient and then it will also use as the signal wanes off it will cycle off the ventilator the settings are made with the lowest auto triggering uh, triggering uh, uh, voltage which it can pick up based on the diaphragmatic electrical activity and as the activity wins off you will the the machine sees it as a cessation of respiratory effort nava was sub, uh, was proposed initially way back in 2007 2008 as something to overcome synchrony among general critically ill patients but now for patients who have neuromuscular weakness either neural primary because of a neurological disease or because of an icu associated critical illness polyneuropathy it seems to have a role in getting these patients off the machine faster so it decreases the delay in the trigger sensitivity and it decreases the inspiratory time excess and therefore avoids asynchrony asynchrony per se causes to the, uh, contributes to the muscular dysfunction that happens in mechanically ventilated critically ill patients so i've spoken to the, about this about so if you compare the conventional pressure support ventilation with the two new modes which we discussed that is proportional assist and nava what we understand is that the conventional pressure support ventilation is constant pressure from breath to breath therefore over assistance is possible and there is a natural reduced natural variability of the breathing pattern so those with erratic breathing patterns can do themselves more harm on a pressure support mode of ventilation and can be associated with asynchrony or over assistance whereas proportional assist is a variable pressure proportional to the instantaneous calculated muscular pressure according to the formula which we discussed and nava is a variable pressure proportional to the integral of the electrical activity so something that is measuring the elastance and the resistance of the lung and then giving some support to the patient is proportional assist something that is measuring the electrical strength of the signal that is coming from the nerves is nava so these seem to be more elegant ways of delivering pressure support to patients than the conventionally used modes of ventilation do they have any advantages yes the improved synchrony risk of over distension and over ventilation and minimizes the risk of diaphragmatic inactivity in electric elective perioperative patients it may not actually make a difference on what mode of ventilator you are weaning the patient off but somebody who's been on the machine for more than 48 hours in experimental studies on uh, lab animals it has been shown that if you have rats and mice and other large lab animals on ventilatory support for more than 48 hours the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles undergo red degeneration as early as 48 hours so it might happen in clinical practice as well there are some disadvantages of proportional assist ventilation in patients with airway obstruction and resistance problems where intrinsic peep is generated they may not be able to get the desired support and nava sometimes the positioning of the catheter is an issue and in an indian context what we face quite often when we try to put the nava is that you need to explain to the family that something which they think is a feeding tube costs about 8000 rupees so that's the problem and if you say that i need to put a rails tube that causes 8000 rupees nobody would agree that is a major problem and you can't reuse this so you, we have tried it but you can't reuse it that's the the truth of the story does it has it stood the uh, scrutiny of evidence based medicine probably yes proportional assist ventilator has got a lot of uh, clinical studies comparing it with pressure support and most of the time that the time to extubation and weaning from ventilatory support has been shortened and the cardiac function now the the norm of mechanical ventilation is not just lung protective ventilatory strategies it is right ventricular protection along with lung protection 
that seems to be better with proportional assist ventilation. What about NAVA? Has it stood the uh, test of uh, evidence-based scrutiny? Yes, but unfortunately, it has not made its uh, you know way into general intensive care as well as neuro intensive care for uh, several logistic and technical reasons because the technology is still patented to a single company. A little bit of mention about dual control like volume assured pressure support. This is just a, a, a spontaneous version of the pressure regulated volume control which we knew from a long time and it allows a feedback loop based on the volume which the patient is taking. So somebody is hyperventilating then the pressure actually tones down on its own but at the same time a minimum assured tidal volume to avoid carbon dioxide buildup is provided by uh, volume assured pressure support. And it generates lower peak airway pressures, reduces the patient's work of breathing, improving the gas exchange. Most importantly, it lessens the need for sedation because the patient is more comfortable on a volume assured uh, pressure support mode of ventilation. The last one is mandatory minute ventilation. We have been using this on the uh, Servo 300A for almost 18 years now. Um, this is something very relevant to neurointensive care because these patients are always having some high, uh, you know, uh, high minute ventilation. It's a modification of pressure support where the ventilator takes a feedback uh, after, uh, to alter both the respiratory rate and the pressure, uh, pressure support and then you can have a variable amount of minute ventilation that is optimized to ensure that whatever you have mandated is given to the patient. In summary, neuro ICU patients, the last thing which I didn't cover here because it's a big topic is about the use of neural networks, machine learning and artificial intelligence. It has come into ventilators currently. Um, so if you can actually tone in what is the patient's clinical diagnosis, what are your targets, it actually has an algorithm based on the ArtsNet ventilator guidelines and the ventilator actually will cycle and will tell you these are your modes which you need to use and these are the changes which are recommended. You can override them but by default the machine would use it. That is called as IntelliVent which is available in a particular model of ventilator but that's the future putting intensivists out of the job um, from from ICUs, I think. <laughs> so Wonderful. neurointensive care patients are a, a definite challenge. Weaning and extubation are not synonyms. So weaning is an art as much as it's a science. So some newer modes are available, but automated modes and AI may play a bigger role in facilitating this in future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Samavidam. That was an excellent talk and um, very enlightening. My question to you is for the neurally assisted ventilation. Um, it's from your talk, I'm getting the sense that asynchrony is really the major factor that prevents weaning from patients. What exactly are the m parts of ventilation that NAVA changes? And can you comment on the importance of driving pressure as well? Because it seems like measuring the strength of the diaphragm doesn't necessarily lead to adjusting PEEP and making that a patient-centered yeah. so adjustment. Conventionally, uh, when you put a patient on pressure support mode of ventilation, the patient has to initiate a kind of activity, a negative pressure, to tell the machine that I am now ready to breathe. Right. So the machine then senses, now it's my time to open up the inspiratory valve and give an inspiratory flow. In a neuromuscular patient, that's not going to happen because the, ab the ability to generate a minus 2 or a minus 3 centimeters water of pressure is a challenge for somebody who's got an AIDP or a myasthenia or even for in an Indian context, an organophosphate poisoning or a snake bite for that matter. So the ventilators have tried to overcome that by putting them on a flow trigger. That means, you know, it is calibrated for 6 liters of flow and then the machine measures how much of flow has come, in, come out and then it will act as a trigger, but that still is related to a combination of the resistance and flow to the circuit. And all the dead space does have a, uh, a role uh, in getting the help from the machine when the patient wants it. So what NAVA does is actually to sense that when is the signal for the diaphragm to contract coming from uh, the higher center, right? So the, the diaphragmatic electrical activity that is coming before the muscle starts contracting is the one that tells the machine, look, the next inspiration is going to happen. So the machine is already ready a few milliseconds before 
either a flow change or a pressure change is going to happen in the respiratory system or in the circuit. So that's probably a good way of doing it. Now, as far as driving pressure is concerned, now driving pressure is the difference between the plateau pressure and the end expiratory pressure, right? Now that's the pressure which in ARDS is now the gold standard. You need to keep the driving pressures less than 15 for lung protective ventilatory strategy. Now, when you exceed that, it's not only the lung that actually gets damaged, but the diaphragm also gets overstretched so that the excursions during inspiration and expiration are limited. So, the, it goes into disuse atrophy. So, if your driving pressures are not actually maintained well, not necessarily monitored, but maintained well, you could end up with a good lung but a slow wiener because the diaphragm has uh, become floppy at the end of your ventilatory strategy. Coupled with the fact that a good number of these patients are put on neuromuscular blockade in the first 48 hours. So, that could add to this aspect as well. Even if the Nava catheter can uh, uh, reduce uh, the length of stay by a day, Probably that's a lot of cost effectiveness, isn't yes. it? So, uh, why isn't it taking off? Why is it taking off? That's the problem. So, uh, the problem is to explain to somebody that to get him off the machine in 24 hours earlier, they need people, I mean, I've been, I've been one of the advocates, I really had to fight uh, with uh, the finance guys in our hospital to get a NAVA into my unit way back in 2009. Now, and you were the one who said don't get NAVA to me. Yeah, because it, it, it is disappointing because you've got a Mercedes in your ICU but you don't have fuel. That's the problem because the, the family would ask what does it do, right? And then you will say this is like a nasogastric tube. Their only approach is this is a Riles tube. And then you say you have to pay 8,000 rupees. That's the f first point. The second point is they will say this is for your own comfort. This is not for the patient's comfort. For you to get more information, you are using this. That's the answers we are forced to give. So, what is your name? I'm unable to what? convince more people in, in the last 14 years that I've been using NAVA. Sure. I've not been able to uh, convince people. Thank you. So, usually... Um, the information and the settings on the ventilator, you would know that the patient is getting to wean in about 48 to 72 hours. So, the longest period of time in which you can keep the NAVA is 96 hours. After that, you need to reassess four days. But for the Riles tube, madam. Thank you, audience and uh, the speakers. Uh, I think this uh, session was named as Trials That Changed the Trail has been very truly named because we have too many new informations coming up and we had good uh, interactions. Thank you all very much. Goodbyes for now till we start our next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to all the chairperson, speakers and the audience in interactive session. We'll be in touch. Um, to catch up with the time, we're not having a tea break. So we'll be going with the, ahead with the pro-con session. There's a two-two maybe session. So for that, uh, we'd like to invite the chairpersons, Dr. Arvind Arya. He is a senior consultant and HOD of neuroanesthesiology and critical care in IHBS Institute, Delhi. He has, uh, to his credit, more than 40 publications in international and national journals. Next, we have Dr. Sridevi Porika. She is a professor of Department of Anesthesia in Gandhi Medical College, Sikindabad. And to her credit, uh, she has four national and international publications. And she is the one who has initiated interventional pain management services at the government hospital in Telangana state. Next, we have uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar Dubey. He is a professor in charge of the Division of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, in Banaras Hindu University and to his credit he has more than 40 publications. So please uh, chair the sessions. Then introduce the speakers please. Yeah. Uh, thank you Dr. Srilita. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, now we are proceeding for the pro and con session as uh, already told. 
दिस इज टू टू मैम एस एस एन सो वी आर हैविंग टू टॉपिक्स फॉर द डिस्कशन द फर्स्ट टॉपिक इज डे केयर सर्जरी सो इट्स अबाउट द डे केयर सर्जरी Do we really are prepared and ready for the starting of the day care surgery? So to speak on uh, for pro, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Charu Mahajan. Dr. Charu Mahajan is additional professor in AIMS New Delhi, and uh, she has been a lot of achievements. She is having uh, the best paper award, SNAC 2014, and uh, uh, NHSI ISA Con 2014. She is the editor of the NHS New Anesthesia Books. Member editor board of the JSNAC and editor chief of the Action Newsletter, and she is having more than 140 publications to her credit. So, over to Dr. Charu for uh, speaking on the favor of it. Thank you, Chairperson. A very good morning to all of you. At the beginning, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to stand on this platform. So today, I have been given the job to justify that daycare neurosurgery is safe. I am speaking. in favor of it so definitely in neuroanesthesia practice we have come a long way earlier on one hand we used to debate whether the post operative neurosurgical patients should be provided icu or non icu care and today we are here talking about discharging the post operative neurosurgical patient on the same day itself so definitely in other specialties this is considered a common practice but in neurosurgical practice it will be considered a very brave act so let's see the benefits of day care surgery these are the same increasing population limited healthcare resources they have overall burdened our system so definitely a day care neurosurgery will improve the patient inflow and outflow and reduce the overall cost involved reduce the risk of nosocomial infections and medical errors early mobilization of the patient is possible which reduces thromboembolism patient gets the comfort of the family and has better satisfaction as well as emotional well being so what are the facilitating factors which make neurosurgical day care surgery possible so the availability of the short care anesthetics is a boon to us the advent of awake neurosurgery awake craniotomy has led to the earlier post operative recovery of these patients which allows early discharge of these patients the practice of opioid free anesthesia decreasing the dose of opioids and using a multimodal analgesic approach definitely decreases the side effects associated with the opioids such as post operative nausea vomiting constipation and urinary retention the implementation of eras protocols enhances the early recovery of the patient the surgeons using the image guided navigation and retractorless surgery their approach causes less decreases the post operative pain and causes less tissue damage their minimally invasive approach such as shorter incisions the keyhole craniotomies the supraorbital approach for the anterior circulation aneurysms definitely have a better patient profile in the post operative period moreover intraoperative neuro monitoring also safeguards the surgery and is associated with decreased complications in the post op period so what are the deciding factors what is the optimum patient which can undergo a day care neurosurgery this is very important because almost 90% of the neurosurgical patients would fail that selection criteria so even if 5% of the patients can undergo successful day care neurosurgery that will also make a lot of difference in decreasing the uh, healthcare cost involved so the deciding factors are location and size of the tumor mostly these are small tumors less than 4 mm in maximal diameter mostly all supratentorial in nature they should be non vascular they should be com not complex in uh, the approach to the tumors should not be very complex they should not be deep seated the duration of neurosurgical procedure should last less than 4 hours and we should have a skilled operating physician team as well as dedicated neuroanesthesiologist a neuro interventionalist a nurse a dedicated physiotherapist also usually these patients the optimum patient should be of belong they should belong to asa 1 to 2 that is low to moderate anesthesia risk they should be non obese with no history of sleep apnea no cardio respiratory morbidity and not having any difficult airway concerns the patient suitability should also be assessed psychologically 
whether he is ready for it or not whether he is comfortable in it or not we have do the does the patient have any reliable intelligent caretaker and the uh, discharge to home or the the residence should be very close to the hospital less than 1 hour travel time in for the if any complications occur they should reach return back to the hospital within an hour the pre operative and post operative imaging facility in the hospital infrastructure is very important because it in allows a pre operative navigation based mri in the morning as well as a post operative ct scan at the end of 6 hours post operatively and very important the policy of the hospital should, should be such like that the smooth re admission is possible and there should not be any delay in it so there are a lot of unfavorable factors high asa status emergency surgery patients having major neuro deficits or altered neurological status decreased cognition the tumor in the infratentorial region or very large tumors vascular tumors the patient having refractory epilepsy intractable vomiting dyselectrolemia and no availability of home caregiver are the few unfavorable factors for the day care neurosurgery moreover there are few insurance rules which demand that the patient should be admitted overnight for the reimbursement this is a major hurdle for day care surgery so the possible taken neurosurgical cases which can be taken up are brain biopsies and simple craniotomies for excision of simple brain tumors and awake craniotomy is a suitable profile for carrying out these brain biopsies and craniotomies the other are shunt vp shunt or the etv the csf diversion procedures the clipping of unruptured anterior circulation aneurysms cranioplasties neuroradiological procedures both diagnostic as well as therapeutic anterior cervical discectomies and fusion and these are limited to single or two level from c4 5 or 6 7 and one to two level lumbar spinal decompressions the pediatric children have are also undergoing day care neurosurgeries in few setups and these involve the excision and the repair of spina bifida so the history of the day care neurosurgery it date back to early 1990s when some of the spine surgeons start discharging their lumbar spine patients on the same day this extended to the involvement of the acdf procedures in late 1990s so around 1996 there are papers which report that the acdf low level acdf procedures the patients are being discharged on the same day so this is a recent study uh, published in 2014 and it involves around more than 1000 patients around 1449 patients out of which 1000 were lumbar and 376 belong to the cervical level and the authors found that 99.8% of the patients were discharged on the same day and only 0.2% patients had to be admitted to the hospital after the surgery so this shows that the cervical and lumbar spine surgeries are being carried out as day care surgeries so now what about the craniotomies so if we see the literature review the day care surgery it starts with the north american centers Bernstein is considered the father of day care neurosurgery and in late 1990s he started the day care surgeries in his center at Toronto so the earliest studies happened in 2001 where around 46 patients and the 16 these are the two studies that show that the success of the same day discharge was around 89 to 81% this was followed by Bolton and Bernstein from the same center which included 145 patients and they showed that the success rate was around 94% that was quite high and out of these 145 patients general anesthesia was given in seven patients so if we see this chart the Ven venkat raghavan again from the toronto center he included 198 patients out of which ga was given in 41 patients so this shows that even for craniotomies the day care neurosurgery is possible even in those patients who receive general anesthesia and not only awake craniotomy so patients who receive general anesthesia is not a contraindication for same day discharge so the success rate in the craniotomy for tumor surgery the highest is the 94% now if we come for the stereotactic biopsy or the craniotomy for the tumors the largest study if we see it's for the same the 2008 study which included 117 patients and this was under awake craniotomy and the success rate is 93%
even under GA, the Kakaji et al. carried in 2001 showed the under GA the success rate is 82 percent. Purzner et al. published in 2011, he, it was a huge study involving the spine as well as the craniotomy patients. So the success rate was quite good, 92 percent and 94 percent. Now this is not only restricted to the uh, excision of the tumor or the biopsies. Gottel has been uh, he had he performed this study in 2014 it was published regarding the uh, daycare surgery in patients who have unruptured interior communicating artery aneurysm and the success rate was 68 percent in that study so if we see this trend most of these centers are from north america and majorly it has been done in toronto this uh, Grandi et al. However, in 2008, Grandi et al. This study belongs to the UK authors. So slowly and gradually, the concept of take care surgery moved out of North American centers, and the UK people also started following it. Now, this study it was published in 2002. This is from the uh, USA. So now uh, it ha it is restricting to the other centers other than the North American centers. And in this patient also, the success rate of same day discharge was around 87%. So what are the complications that we should be prepared for? So the most common complications for which the patient was readmitted on the same day are the neurological deficits and the seizures. The total risk of complications is 8% and these are the most common complications. The other are tabulated here. So what is a daycare protocol? It is usually posted, the patient is usually posted as the first case of the study and first case for the day and he is called in the hospital in the early hours of the day before 7 a.m. So a preoperative imaging for neural navigation is carried out if indicated and patient is prepared and assessed as routine. So the anesthesia, we know about the wake craniotomy. So if the patient can be carried out under the wake craniotomy that should be preferred otherwise those who can't be carried out as a wake craniotomy procedures general anesthesia is given and short acting anesthetic agents should be used urinary catheters and invasive monitoring should be used as low as possible because to decrease the post operative pain surgery should be minimally invasive image guided and legion targeted craniotomy should be done the legion should be small incision and a small flap should be taken to avoid the post operative pain duration should be ideally less than 4 hours we should avoid osmotic diuretics if possible and surgical drains should be pro avoided if possible so the patient after surgery is shifted to the PACU unit for the observation and at least he should be kept there for two hour observation in which we should continuously monitor the neurological status, the cardiac and the respiratory function. Pain managed pain should be taken care of, antiemetic should be given, the blood pressure should be controlled and less than 160 by 90 mm of Hg. Discontinue any invasive arterial lines to reduce the discomfort and a CT scan is regularly done for all the patients at the end of 4 hours after surgery. Most of the complications occur within first 6 hours. So the protocol is to do uh, imaging after 4 hours of surgery. So, in the day surgery, after two hours of uh, stay in the PACU observation, patient is shifted to the day surgery unit where he is continuously further monitored for neurological status. The, uh, the drinking is allowed, the oral sips are allowed and the patient, we ensure that he is voiding appropriately. Pain control is done and antimetics are prescribed as reasonable and we should try to ambulate if possible. So discharge should be done when the patient is awake, alert, oriented with stable neurological examination and CT scan shows no fresh hemorrhage or clot and there should be no new neurological deficits. At the discharge time, the family or the caregiver should be available and prepared. Patient should be given clear instruction for the prescription of the pain, a pamphlet with appropriate information and contact numbers and follow-up clinics appointment. They should be ensured that they have the facility for 24-7 calling up. Patient should receive a 24-hour follow-up phone call by the surgeon or the nurse and the upcoming telemedicine facility, it is indeed a boon for following up these patients who are discharged on the same day. So, the daycare surgery is not only restricted to the adult patients, there, this is a, a small study 
published uh, carried out in nigeria and it was published in 2016 which included the pediatric patients the age of the patients ranged from 2 months to 14 years and they it has been seen that most commonly the spina bifida and the hydrocephalus have been performed as day care procedures so not only in the developing developed countries but now the phenomenon of day care surgery is being popularized in developed country developing countries also so what are the challenges in low middle income countries however it is very prudent not to interpret data from the western world and not we can't directly extrapolate to a indian setting so what are the challenges the majority arrive from the peripheral areas or from poor socioeconomic background their understanding level is uncertain the challenge of traveling time most of the hospitals are referral centers so the challenge of traveling time is all, always there and the risk of overcrowding and sanitation at home is there there is no facility for home nurse visit here and the insurance policies require overnight admission so this makes this might make the patient reluctant to agree for the daycare neurosurgery so to conclude it's the early discharge should not be a primary endpoint but it should be a consequence of good patient care the protocol should be devised according to your availability of the expertise the dedicated neuroanesthesiologist and your healthcare infrastructure so you should modify the daycare protocol as it suits to your healthcare center it, this daycare surgery requires time and patience in initial st stages and some complications are bound to occur but the, the once the complications occur we will troubleshoot them and then we can start some patients will have to form part of the learning curve so what is the best what best can we can do in our setup is that we can devise our own indigenous daycare protocol and incorporate in our practice so uh, with the mo this modified protocol we should uh, target not the day not to discharge on the same day but in the initial stages target the discharge of this patient on first or the second post-operative day so when that falls into place and when whole of the team becomes comfortable with that concept then implement it to the same day discharge so hopefully we will be able to start in our setup also so with this i would like to state and emphasize that yes day care surgery is possible thank you okay thank you dr charu for your take and affirmations on this in the favor of the topic we will call you at the end of the session and now i call upon dr hemangi karnik ma'am she will talk in the disfavor of the topic she is a professor in charge neuroanesthesia at Lokmanya Tilak Medical College and Hospital Mumbai. She has received Hargobin Foundation Medical Fellowship in 2000. She is the visiting professor at Stanford Uni University Hospital USA in 2000. And she has been reviewer of five journals and has been in the editorial committee of many journals. She has 49 publications to her credit and she has written nine chapters in various books. Our interests are neuroanesthesia, neurotrauma, and monitoring. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you, and good morning to all. Uh, my friend has made my job very easier. She has explained patient management excellently, and we must take many pointers from that. However, I differ in one aspect. Let us not be in hurry to discharge the patient home, because daycare neurosurgery is not safe. Typically, daycare surgery involves early morning admission, patient undergoes some tests and surgery and after a few hours of observation, he is discharged on the same calendar day. This has been well accepted technique in many specialities for many advantages that has been uh, said earlier. However, to make it safe, one needs to have dedicated daycare centre with trained staff coordination amongst various departments and adequate communication system and if some center is doing most of the cases as inpatient and only occasional daycare there are more chances of some of these things may not be available making it risky neurosurgery is also expanding with the advanced diagnostic tools newer surgical tools making the neurosurgery more precisive with lesser tissue trauma new anesthesia protocols have made the uh, anesthesia safer with shorter recovery time and improved surgical outcome, fewer complications also mean shorter hospital stay and early 
discharges however we should not forget that we are also dealing with more and more critical cases and more complex surgeries besides brain is not like other body organ systems it is the most complex vital organ when it comes to the neurosurgical patient the brain is already compromised because of the uh, basic pathology it has been made vulnerable and on this vulnerable brain the anesthesia drugs are going to act and the surgeon is also going to work leading to uh, so this particular brain is not expected to behave in the same predictable way as a normal brain maybe because of the decreased compliance or vasoreactivity and so on many things which have been discussed yesterday quite often it is already compromised because of the basic disease requiring admission so if you look at the neurosurgical patients in toto they come in varieties of situations pathology severities and all and if you want to offer uh, or consider the day care surgery if they are coming with acute conditions like tbi stroke and all it is a, it just cannot be thought about so is the in the decompensated patients multiple comorbidities if they are planned for complex procedures Com uh, or have already developed complications again if the center does not have adequate facilities for so required for the day care it cannot be obtained or if the patient is unwilling so basically our uh, 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 patient population where it can be considered is very small and this number also goes significantly down as just to give this one example that out of the 750 patients screened only 37 were considered day for day care surgery only 32 were discharged and of which four got readmission later on so it is not so easy though some select centers are doing day care surgery in some select type of patients mainly the stereotactic biopsies small craniotomies and spinal surgeries provided many many prerequisites uh, in a sequential manner are being followed strictly in a protocol based manner however i would like to say that a chain can be as strong as its weakest link and if any of this point is missed the whole system of successfully discharging the patient safely will collapse so let us see what are our weak links in india most of our neurosurgery centers are in the major cities the patients are coming from uh, far away patients and rarely they have homes less than 1 hour away from the hospital uh, the alternative hotel arrangements and all may not be suitable so what we think that the patient will go home to the comfort and privacy of familiar surroundings actually may not take place and if they do have homes nearby they may not be clean enough or over crowded and the doctor will not have any a uh, way of knowing that this places are good enough and have reduced risk of the infection and so on and so on so that is why it will make the uh, sending the patient home risky patient selection as she has described is the very biggest criteria for choosing this patient but if there is one green flag there are many red flags and if any of this part like the difficult airway or osa or anything is missed then there can be over selection of patient making the discharge risky patient has to be awake adult educated the caregiver has to be convinced about the outpatient surgery willing to escort the patient home observe him at home overnight for adverse signs and if anything happens alert the hospital and brings the patient back how many caregivers would be actually willing to do it if the hospital admission is easily available and if the caregiver says yes there is no guarantee that the doctor will know that he will actually do so so that is what is one danger those centers who are strictly following the protocol and doing it also do not discharge all the patients there are always some amount of unplanned admissions maybe in in 82 to uh, 94% of patient only they are uh, discharging and whenever there is unplanned admission the family and the patient will think the worst they may not be prepared for the admission because they were told that they will go home and the hospital bed is not really made free so that is one of the danger coming to the post operative complications up to 18% complications have been noted even with the pro proper protocol day care Uh, based day care surgeries and those patients need to be admitted because of the seizures hematoma uh, hemiparesis and so on 
The proponent of daycare surgery will say that the continued bleeding can be picked up in the post-op CT scan and later on there are very less chances. However, the against is it may be missed if the CT scan is done very early. The severity may change, the patient may deteriorate later on and if he is already discharged by that time, the, the caregiver may miss the clinical changes or it may be ignored. So, that is a biggest problem in this uh, Cerebral edema occurs few hours after the surgery and the peak edema occurs on the second and third day depending upon how much brain manipulation has taken place. So, initially patient may be asymptomatic. If patient is in the hospital when he deteriorates then we have multiple options like IV steroids, mannitol and so on. But once patient is discharged only the prophylactic oral steroids that we have given are the only options that may not be sufficient. If the problems occur at home, a uh, in the hospital, a trained person will monitor and the subtle neurological signs can be picked up. But after discharge, an untrained person may miss the early signs and if suspected, he will always be in the dilemma about those signs being significant enough to bother the doctor or no, delaying the uh, no, shifting back. And in India, this is even worse because of the lower socioeconomic strata and limited understanding. Postoperative pain is considered higher in the daycare surgery because of the limited option of the pain relief that we have. Even when the by the time patient goes home, the regional block effects and everything is uh, reducing, we cannot use opioids at home and so on. Similarly, nausea, vomiting risk is also high, making the patient uncomfortable at home. Strict discharge protocol had have been advocated, but practically what happens? At the time of discharge, the patient is assessed by the junior person. The assessment may be done little earlier than indicated for the practical reasons. Same for the CT scan, making again the patient at risk of missing some uh, smaller uh, no, pointers before discharge. Readmission is a big issue in the major cities. Dedicated transport facilities may not be readily available or if available are at the high cost. If hospital ambulance is coming, there is to and fro double travel involved. Unpredictable uh, road traffic conditions can play havoc in delaying the uh, readmission. So, that is another uh, issue. Surgical skill is the most important aspect of safe early discharge and the same skill cannot be expected from different uh, types of surgeons and the varying skills may increase the surgical duration, larger blood loss and need for general anesthesia. Skillful dedicated anesthesiologist may not be available at every time and if GA is used there may be some residual effect available. So, just because some centers are doing it or Toronto Western has succeeded it, we cannot apply the same results or copy it in some other centers. In fact, this is the biggest risk of copying somebody and considering that neuroanesthesia is safe to discharge on the same day. It does not really uh, save the cost if only few uh, cases are done on OPD basis and rest all are indoor, neither for the hospital nor for the patient who needs to come again and there are insu insurance issues. There are increased risk of litigation in case of postoperative complication after discharge, even after adequate education is being given and a single case of lit litigation will negate the cost saved by the over the thousand patients of the daycare procedures. So, it is not safe for the hospital, not safe for the doctor as well. So, daycare surgery which can be, can be considered in a very small number of patients needs to be followed with multiple steps and uh, sequences and if any of these things steps are missed then the patient's outcome precariously hangs in uh, uh, in the hands of whichever step is missed and therefore I would say daycare neurosurgery is not safe rather we should give attention and security when the patient needs most most patient will feel reassured to know that they are well looked after by a guardian angel and not left alone at home, we should consider early discharge as said and as she has said, it should be the consequence of good patient care and not the primary end point, definitely not because the insurance companies want us to. Thank you Isnak and thank you Team Hyderabad for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> Both the speakers have done 
great justice to their topics actually this uh, we can have there some discussion we can invite one one or two questions just because the topic will be different for the next first i would like dr charu if she wants to rebut the points for put forth by ma'am most of the topics we have already i already discussed in my slides and at the outset itself i said that 90% of the neurosurgical population will not fit into the same selection criteria that i showed so even if we are able to carry out daycare neurosurgery in 5% of the patients it would definitely help the healthcare resources in india or the other lmics so i agree that only 5% of the population will fit into the uh, successful discharge for daycare surgery moreover regarding the implementation of this the same protocol at our center what we can start with uh, and we can devise an indigenous indigenous model we can uh, modify it to our local needs so we can implement it and start with the simple lumbar discectomies or the lumbar decompression surgeries at our center and then when the some complications of then we'll understand and the team will get more comfortable carrying it out then we can think about doing the craniotomy procedures as daycare surgery so at the outset we need to have a very stringent selection criteria and very carefully the, we should uh, decide for the discharge of the patient yes yes sir yes sir can we have a mic sir uh, so kind of surgery sir i showed it in the table uh, so the most commonly yeah so the this most commonly common spine. cases which can be done day okay, cases no? the day common spinal surgeries that have been undertaken as day care surgeries are the simple one to two level spinal decompressions the lumbar level or the low level acdf surgeries regarding the craniotomy small tumors less than 4 mm in size non vascular and supra tentorial tumors are the ideal uh, tumors which can be taken up for take care surgery a stereotactic biopsies can be taken up sir so the peripheral nerve surgeries yes sir sir also the neuro radiological the diagnostic procedures as well as simple therapeutic procedures those can be taken up so there is a, sir Yes, sir, definitely. For small tumors, sir, I discussed that awake craniotomy. Sir, I pardon, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I uh, showed it in. I spoke in my uh, presentation that general anesthesia is not a contraindication for day care surgery. Although most of these patients are carried out as awake craniotomies, but in those patients who are given general anesthesia, if we meet all the selection criteria and take care intraoperatively, the, those patients can also be discharged on the same day. So general anesthesia is not a contraindication. Just about the tumors, uh, intraaxial tumors are considered safer, but the extraaxial tumors are not considered safer for day care surgery. So just one. Oh, yes, if we want to start with day care you know surgery we can start with the lump, with, with the spine surgery itself and then progress gradually over to the craniotomy procedure in fact 23 hours admission and uh, uh, has been started even in uh, our country also and uh, some of the people advocate that one to three days discharge probably would be a more sensible choice so that's yeah. thank you both the speakers now we proceed for the next topic thank you yeah. thank you i would like to call upon uh, dr devendra gupta professor sanjay gandhi post graduate institute of medical sciences lucknow topic is neurological dysfunctions following intubation in cervical spine injuries do we have enough evidence uh, thank you chair persons and good morning everyone uh, i have to speak neurological dysfunction following intubation in the cervical spine injury patients do we have enough evidence and i have to speak yes so uh, this is a proposed mechanism 
of neurological dysfunction following intubations. First is in 99% of the uh, time it is the cervical movement during the intubation and the second is very 1% it is a vascular compromise uh, to the during the spinal cord injury. The, uh, my point is the 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 uh, main basic fundamental of avoiding the or preventing the neurological injury uh, during the cervical spine injured patient is to stabilize the cervical spine and i will take you to the history this is a papyrus this is a first medical manuscript which has discussed the 48 cases and out of that 48 cases the five cases is of the neck injury and the proposed treatment was the stabilization of the cervical spine. Other, uh, if you see the through, throughout the uh, medical manuscripts which has been uh, uh, in the history, you can see in all, all the manuscript, the stabilization is the key for the treatment. And the laryngoscopy and intubation has come into the picture in uh, early years of the 20th century and unfortunately the 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 till the second world war the principle of nihilism is has been uh, used for the cervical spine injury that mean nothing's to be done till the second world war after that there is a pre hospital care has been provided to the cervical spine injury and during the pre hospital care people has realizes that the patients I, who have reached to the hospital has got some secondary neurological deficit and then it was analyzed by the Grissinger et al and he has shown that the uh, the those he analyzes 958 cases in retrospective studies and found that 29 patients has suffered secondary injury and he found that this is a pre-hospital care this is it, it is a fail to immobilize the patients during the not only the transport but the airway maneuver and he has given the uh, the basic principle that is spinal is immobilized prevent the secondary neurological dys dysfunctions and based upon this uh, uh, the basic principle people work and people work strictly on this principle not only during this uh, the, the the transportation but airway maneuver also so now the neurological deficit has decreased from 10 to 25 percent to 2 to 10 percent. Now the people are focused on the airway management also. So the neck movements, uh, the neck stabilization during the intubations, this is so prevalent that the neurological deficit incidence has so much decreased that uh, Rosen and Wolf doubt on the that there is a some any consequences of intubation on the uh, neurological dysfunctions so uh, the my take is my my explanation to them is that the there was so much precaution during the intubation that it has limited movement of the cervical spine and that my, that causes decrease so much decrease in the incidence of neurological dysfunction secondly the most of the patient has been given the anesthesia for the intubation at that particular time and after that they have uh, it is very difficult to say whether it is the neurological dysfunction whatever it has come it has because of the process uh, this is a procedure which has been done to them or because of intubations and push answer to this uh, the the lesions the the american college of surgeon committee of on the trauma has uh, written in its recommendation that rosen and wolf lesions almost all remain uh, certainly remain a lesions. However, a careful direct laryngoscopy should continue to an acceptable procedure in the patients with the unstable cervical spine. Uh, Hasting has uh, uh, published one case report which is, he said this is a first case report about the uh, neurological deterioration after the intubations and it was a difficult intubation case and he's, he uh, he has given the reason for uh, deter uh, neurological deterioration following the intervention is there is a low suspicion of the cervical spine injury in this case. He mentioned two other case series. It is a Sunderman 
uh, at all and message no at all i couldn't retrieve these two uh, uh, article to read but they have said that there is a 1 to 3% case uh, incidences of neurological dysfunction following intubation and in masino it is 2.4% later after 1990s a lot and lot uh, uh, gadgets and the uh, uh, things has been evolved like uh, various laryngoscope various laryngoscope blades video laryngoscope and and supraglottic devices the main uh, focus of these devices is to maximize visualization with a precision of maximum stabilization and minimum movement in the cervical spine It's still uh, uh, and dr padam durga has uh, published an article in which she showed 13 cases in which there is a neuro neurological deterioration after the intubations in the close claim committee uh, analysis also in anesthesiology 2011 they have shown that out of 40, 48 cases which have uh, post procedure neurological deterioration there is a six cases is because of the cervical spine injury uh, uh, the in, uh, airway management at this moment of time so there is a lot of ethical issues in doing the uh, the prospective trials because in prospective trial how the the ethic, ethical uh, committees has not given the, uh, the 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 clearance because we can't give the clearance in cervical spine injury patients uh, allowing you to the, to do a full movements and allowing you to, to the intubate or airway maneuver and compared to other where there's no movements so lot of the studies was focus on the uh, basically done on the the cadver so but the in cadver it is not possible to do the post procedural neurological uh, uh, examinations so i refer to this uh, this uh, re uh, systemic trial just a systemic review in which they uh, analyze 18 18 trials but most most of the trial has done compare the two techniques uh, but however the most of the utmost care has been taken to maximize the stabilization of the spine and in this uh, 1972 cases only one patients has got a definite neurological uh, dysfunction after the after the uh, because of the airway maneuver at this junction the intubation or airway maneuver is looking like a aviation industries which is very quite safe but this case was this case was like a nepal Uh, the the uh, the plane crash tragedy so this was published in december 2021 this patient was a known case of ankylosing spondylitis difficult intubation video laryngoscopy was tried because uh, either the fiber optic was not available or they are not accustomed to do the fiber optic laryngoscopy and patient has quad had a quadriparesis a lot uh, uh, correspondence or comments Uh, was done on this article in 2022 and basically the 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 uh, gist of this uh, comments and reply was that intubation if not done cautiously can exaggerate the cervical injury and its consequences number 2 the fiber optic intubation continue to be an essential airway management technique in the patient at risk and the anesthesiology residency program should not compromise training and flexible fiber optic intubation so that the consequences of laryngoscopy and uh, intubation uh, will be minimized so my conclusion is there is our substantial evidence of neurological dysfunctions after the intubation if not done cautiously number 2 the careful intubation should be continued to the acceptable procedure whatever the technique we, we use and third we should well versed all the technique uh, in technique of intubation we have uh this is 25th september 2011 i went to the nepal to attend a conference and i took a joy ride by the buddha airways to the himalayan darshan so this is an everest and i came to know later on that the next flight crash so if you not take precaution during intubations it crash and it can lead to the neurological deficit thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Devendra. <laughs> uh, 
now i invite uh, dr kavita sandhu uh, ma'am is uh, the director and head department of neuroanesthesiology and critical care at max super specialty hospital saket new delhi ma'am has been instrumental in starting one of the first snack fellowship program in delhi in 2014 she has delivered the professor uh, gode oration in last year in annual conference and she was executive member of the snack currently she is the member secretary of the hospital ethics committee at the max she is having numerous publications to her credit over to you madam to speak in the favor of the intubation in the cervical spine injury it's almost good afternoon uh, but it i think i've just uh, escaped by 10 minutes so good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you chairperson for the kind introduction it's so lovely to be back among friends again and for this i have to say a big thank you to the organizers especially dr padmaja and dr shri lata for giving me this opportunity so over the last 10 minutes or so you have heard dr gupta tell us that neurological dysfunction following intubation in cervical spine injury uh, does occur and that we do have enough evidence i today will be speaking against the motion now let me share a secret with you uh when i was informed about this topic i was a little taken aback and uh, the first thought that came to my mind was uh, why are we trying to prove that the earth is flat we all know it is round and why did i think so well let me tell you that way back in the 90s when i was doing my neuroanesthesiology training and perhaps dr dash will recollect one of my earlier presentations was based on this very case report that dr gupta had mentioned neurological deterioration associated with airway management in a cervical spine injured patient by hastings and kelly and from then till now i have unwaveringly believed in this as the gospel truth as i think most of us do but today i am to be the devil's advocate and let me tell you that when i started to work on this and i scratched beneath the surface i did find that perhaps a lot of my fears were unfounded and i will tell you why well if i go back to this um, very nice um, publication by dr padma jasti who i think have done the largest amount of work on cervical spines and intubation uh, well from the time of hasting and kelly's case report to this last one by edge et al in around 2001 i could find about 9 or 10 case reports isolated case reports that mentioned that neurological deterioration probably could occur during intubation uh, it was mostly a premise there was no uh, or i can say a temporal association there was really no um, hard um, cause effect uh, that could be established and these isolated case reports kept coming out in literature and we believed them without a question on the other hand during this very same period there were almost an equal number of cases that uh, did uh, stress the fact that well done within the framework that we are so very used to laryngoscopy can be fairly safe in an injured cervical spine so then where does that leave us with neither here nor there and we are trying to base our premise on uh, some isolated case reports which have been coming up in literature now and then no uh, you know robust evidence no definite cause effect analysis uh, and also very importantly that the fact that many of these case reports have not been written by anesthesiologists themselves i think that that doesn't form robust evidence at all so then i think perhaps we have been focusing too much on intubation and the damage it can do are we not forgetting perhaps that there are other factors at play that could also be causing or contributing to secondary neurological injury in such cases now i'll come back to the cervical movements during airway management but besides this there is also prolonged deformation of the cord there can be impaired perfusion of the cord there can be a natural progression of neurological deterioration following the spinal injury per se or else maybe a combination of all these factors 
So I'll just quickly uh, elaborate a little bit about each of them. And uh, the first is, of course, our favorite topic, airway management in cervical spine injuries. Now, volumes of literature has come out on fluoroscopic studies which study the lateral images of cervical spine during movements um, that occur during airway management. And there is a whole host of articles on this. Suffice it to say that we are now reasonably certain that all and I repeat all airway maneuvers cause some movement of the cervical spine. The changes vary and we do know that jaw thrust causes uh, uh, less movement as compared to chin lift which causes a lesser movement as compared to direct laryngoscopy. Fiber optic and medial laryngoscopy probably are safer as they produce the least movement. But what is a little alarming is that face mask ventilation causes more displacement than the tracheal intubation which we are always flogging. And I don't think we can resuscitate any patient without this on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, going forward on the same line, uh, Lenarsen et al. in 2000 uh, showed that uh, they studied cadavers and they produced uh, uh, injury in them. And so they compared the stable spine with the unstable cervical spine. And they found that there was only a difference of less than 2 millimeters translation and 4 degree angulation at C5-6 level between the stable and unstable cervical spine. Now, I really don't think that this is really such a huge number uh, that we should be so alarmed by it and does it really translate into producing the catastrophic neurological damage that we are talking about? I think it is highly questionable. Now, a very elegant uh, article was published just last September from uh, Sheffield um, by Dr. Mile, uh, Wiles and he uh, has done a very comprehensive review of current literature uh, as regards every management in patients with suspected or confirmed traumatic spinal injury. Uh, what he did was he kind of, um, you know, refocused our attention from the movements of the cervical spine, the angulations, how much they moved here, above, below, to uh, a more pertinent uh, subject called space available for the cord. And he says that actually we tend to forget that this space is what we should be looking at. There are reductions in this space during AVA maneuvers and this reduction in space is what can actually cause spinal cord damage. Once again, very few studies to support um, this uh, aspect uh, or this new vista. But uh, they do reiterate that chin lift and jaw thrust reduce the space available for the cord more than laryngoscopy. So then that's something, again, food for thought, and maybe we should now be looking at this. Um, a very pertinent article came out again very recently where these authors have done a new physiological study uh, on what is happening in the cord uh, during our intubation maneuvers. This is a randomized controlled trial. It compared a sleep fiber optic bronchoscopy with air track in cervical spine injuries. About 40 patients were studied and they all had a cervical color in situ. The somatosensory work potentials were monitored at pre-induction level, at mask ventilation, intubation, and positioning. And they reported that only one patient in each group had significant SSEP changes. Luckily, there were no post-op neurological deterioration. What was more uh, significant was that the positioning per se was associated more with SSCP changes than intubation. And why I brought this out is that uh, as anesthesiologists, we have been tutored and taught for times immemorial that we must handle all cervical spine injured cases with kid gloves. And of course, they should be. But what happens? We start the intubation. We are so cautious. Don't move this. Don't move that. Don't extend. Don't flex. And finally, the tube is in and everybody relaxes. Along come our neurosurgical friends. And we often forget what we had started to do and very happily they put the position in whatever state it suits them best and everybody seems to forget that neurological deterioration can occur. The next is vascular compromise of the cord. Now, I think this was already touched by Dr. Devenda. He made my job easy, but important to remember that flexion causes elongation and narrowing of the diameter of longitudinal vessels. Extension causes increase of the cord diameter and pressure on the posterior longitudinal ligament. The spinal injury itself brings in its wake hypotension, which in itself, this vascular compromise per se, could also produce neurological deterioration uh, subsequently. I've gone back. I'm sorry. 
Now, besides this, there are other considerations, other factors that are also at play contributing to secondary neurological deterioration. There is ischemia secondary to vascular injury. There is excitotoxic cascades, free radicals being released, calcium influx. And also important to remember that surgery very often happens during this very period. We all know that about 5% cases of cervical spine injury would deteriorate over the next 72 hours because of this evolution of the primary injury which is when the maximum damage to the cord has already occurred but we often forget that and it is during this period that very often a surgery has to be performed intubation would definitely be part of that and all the blame falls on intubation besides this there are other forces at play which could also contribute to neurological deterioration now, in cadaveric studies, it has been shown that the force required to cause a cervical fracture is as high as about 650 to 7500 newtons. The mean force during direct laryngoscopy is as low as 50 newtons. Mean force during video laryngoscopy, only 10 newtons. What is the time required to cause a serious neurological deficit? In animals, it has been found that 30 minutes of sustained cord compression are required to produce a definite neurological deterioration. And how long does it take us for a regular laryngoscopy? A mere 10 to 20 seconds. So then, do we really think that significant amounts of energy can be transmitted to the cord during a short intubation? Again, I think it is really not very convincing. Well, as we have already discussed, literature is past. Our biggest hurdle would be overwhelming ethical considerations. And I don't think that we will ever have enough literature to either support or refute this. But from relative a little uh, recent literature I could find, there was this study by the Seattle group wherein they found that in patients who they had intubated, of course they have used video laryngoscope, which is I think something that is now easily available to most of us. No cases of neurological deterioration have occurred secondary to heavy management. I won't dwell on this too much because Dr. Gupta has already told us about this. But once again, just 0.34% post-op neurological complications. And are we really so sure it happened because of intubation? Uh, questionable. Uh, if you see the close game analysis uh, of NHS from 2008 to 2018, there was no incidence of neurological injury after intubation. Well, it could be just a happy state of affairs that nothing went wrong ever, or else maybe that there is underreporting due to fear of litigation. Uh, just uh, one minute more, I will quickly share uh, a recent experience we had one of our own patients. This gentleman, 62-year-old man, undiagnosed case of ankylosing spondylitis, had a fall at home. He sustained a head injury. He had a brief uh, loss of uh, consciousness, was taken to his local hospital. Everybody was focusing on only the head injury all the time. They did the CT scan. They found nothing wrong. He had recovered. They sent him home. Two days later, he had another fall and was again rushed to the same hospital. And this time, en route to the hospital, he started having respiratory distress. And uh, he was taken to that hospital, intubated with a regular Macintosh laryngoscope and brought to us in an intubated state. And when we did the CT scan, to our horror, we found this. What is surprising is that the power that had been noted in that hospital was 3 by 5 in the upper limbs and 2 by 5 in the lower limbs. And uh, it was exactly the same even when he came to us. And we still are at a loss and cannot understand how when he so obviously had a serious injury, he didn't come to us quadriplegic. But that reaffirms my faith in God and maybe in nature's own resilience. Now, I don't say that you throw caution to the winds. Uh, but I think the time has come to give this poor flogging uh, boy of ours intubation a little rest. Time that we start looking beyond intubation as the only cause for uh, neurological deterioration in the injured cervical spine. And I would again get you back to this uh, that Dr. Gupta had mentioned. Yes, this editorial came out in 2000 and McLeod at that time said that the legend of uh, spinal cord injury and direct laryngoscopy lives on. I will say it lives on even today. So then, 
I would request you all take a second look think beyond intubation things have become better please don't throw caution to the winds I would not want any of us to be the first to report a neurological deterioration following intubation but I think with the kind of care we are taking a better armamentarium things have become fairly safe and today I don't think we have any reason to believe that we should fear intubation life should be saved first if he lives then we will see what happens next so coming back to the original question do we have enough evidence to prove that uh, in, uh, intubation can cause uh, neurological deterioration in the injured cervical spine and I will say no sir not just yet thank you for a patient here thank you ma'am for your excellent presentation uh, sir uh, I have a question for you sir. what is the time gap sir uh, before the cord injury like uh, for the intubation and the cord injury to uh, in time for the intubation in the last case report yes okay uh, they uh, the the procedure was only the uh, lymph node biopsy okay the procedure was only the lymph node biopsy and the uh, the the fiber optic was not available so they have, they did the video laryngoscope it was very difficult intubations and they it is very not a very big Case reports, uh, case reports, and they showed immediately after the surgery. I mean, Im immediately after the procedure, they found that there is a quad paralysis, and it it. it we may we, we may write one question. Kindly introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Hi, everybody. It's Camilla Spahani. Um, my question is: I know the literature don't seem to support necessarily that direct laryngoscopy causes um, cervical cord damage. But I was wondering, do you have you come across any evidence that says that uh, where in the cervical uh, spine the injury is, whether that would be a greater risk, like if it's a C2, C3, C5, C6? We could, we could get it. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. My question is, is there evidence in the literature um, talking about what level of the cervical spine would result in more damage if it, the neck is extended. So is C1, C2, C2, C3 more prone versus C5 through C7, for example? Thank you. Uh, I think that um, uh, the maximum movement does occur at the C1, C2 level. Uh, though injuries, I think, are more common at C5, 6. So maybe that we are lucky that way. Uh, so do you want to yeah. abet, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my point is that we can't give a blanket uh, comment that no neurological deficit can occur by the intubations. So if we give this blanket comment, then the people will become more genius and, and, and more less precautious in doing the intubations. And then after some time, you will realize that there is a more case reports about the uh, the neurological dysfunctions. Sir, I have a question. Sir, the general perception in the public is that general dogma is that intubation causes cervical injury in the unstable cervical spine. So, how can we how can we safeguard ourselves in the court of law? What precautions and documentation documentations do we need to have in this regard? Documentation is very important documentation before the procedure and documentation after the procedure this is the things which can which can save us and documentation of the 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 method of intubation is the the key to save yourself that is that, that is my point I think uh, I just want to clarify that I don't want anybody to go back thinking that we can be careless with cervical spine I just want to um, reiterate that I think that the kind of care we have been uh, meting out to our patients seems to be working fine and we need not make too much out of it. Precaution is always important, caution is always important. You will never jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute just to see if you land alive. That would be foolish. So please don't go away thinking that all is well. We have to make it well. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for a nice and elaborate discussion. Thank you very much. With this, we conclude this session. Thanks to the organizers.
um, moving on to the oration now. So we have Professor Harivir Singh oration, Neurosciences of Leadership, Lessons Learned. Uh, for this, I would like to invite the chairperson, Dr. Nidhi Vidyut Panda, Professor Neuroanesthesia, Head Division, PGI Chandigarh. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Professor Heman Bhagat, Professor Division of Neuroanesthesia in PGI Chandigarh. I request the chairpersons to introduce the speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I will introduce my mentor, Professor Harivet Singh. He is a legend in anesthesiology. He was born in 1938 in Punjab and did his specialize, specialization in anesthesia from Rohtak Medical College in 1963 and got the degree of MS in anesthesia. He joined PGI in 1966 and assumed the position of head of the department of anesthesia in the year 1970 and continued as head of the for two and a half decade till 1993. He virtually started and developed the department of anesthesia and fondly remembered as father of anesthesia in PGI Chandigarh. He started the intensive care unit under the department of anesthesia in 1979. The most important thing is that he was a visionary who thought of super specialization in anesthesiology and he planned the super specialization in neuroanesthesia and cardiac anesthesia and today the department can boast that the super speciality unit in neuroanesthesia, cardiac anesthesia, pediatric trauma and intensive care anesthesia already started in our institute. Because of his effort, Dr. Y.S. Verma was appointed as the first professor of neuroanesthesia in the country in the year 1970s. He was a great and very sought after teacher by the student. He was a tough administrator and a person with a golden heart. He was very passionate when it comes to the patient care and he taught us how to deal patiently with the patient. He was a fatherly figure for the anesthesia department. I have the proud privilege to work under him and have him as the guide of my thesis. He left for the heavenly abode in, on 12th August 2001. I pay my tribute to a great teacher and a great visionary who started the, who thought about the neuroanesthesia and cardiac anesthesia super speciality in 1970s. Now I will hand over the mic to Dr. Hemant Berger to introduce the orator. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Alana Flexman. She is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at St. Paul's Hospital, Vancouver, Canada. And she is currently the president of Society for Neuroscience in Anesthesiology and Critical Care. And I had the privilege to be there in Seattle when she took over as the snack president. I am also fortunate to be working with her in the editorial board of Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology where she is currently the associate editor. She is also an, in the editorial board of Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. She is the past chair neuroanesthesia section of Canadian Anesthesiology Society and past neuroanesthesia division head in the University of British Columbia. She is an avid researcher and has multiple publications to her credit and her areas of interest range from perioperative stroke, perioperative brain health, frailty, value-based care, equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, I think this is her second visit to India and it's my pleasure to welcome you 
to present your talk on the leadership in neurosciences. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It, it is truly an honor to be here with all of you. Um, it is my second visit to iSnack and both have vastly exceeded my expectations, your hospitality, and um, it's such an enjoyable time. I've had both, both occasions. Um, it's an honor to present in, in honor of Professor Hari Wer Singh, and I thank you for the opportunity and the organizers for inviting me to attend your meeting. Um, I'm also excited to talk to you about this topic. Uh, it's a passion of mine um, about leadership and how we can make an impact as anesthesiologists, not just um, in the operating room, but outside of the operating room administratively, and also through these activities, through our, our societies that promote academics um, and our contributions to the greater community. Before I start, I'd also just like to acknowledge the strong relationship that we have between SNAC and iSNAC. Um, iSNAC is uh, one of our global partners of SNAC, and it's been uh, a wonderful relationship, long standing, and we are very excited to have formalized that recently. And we look forward to many ongoing collaborations uh, with both societies. So I also am very honored to be here to represent um, our relationship between our two neuroanesthesia societies. Um, my disclosures, I receive research support from some organizations, their foundations in British Columbia, um, and financial compensation related to my work with the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, as well as up to date. So we're going to start with three objectives for this talk. Um, it's probably a little bit of a different topic, I find, than that we typically don't talk about it at anesthesia conferences, but I think this is actually more and more critical as I get further in my career to our success and how we function in our positions and our jobs. So we're going to look at what are the factors. We work on teams all the time and leadership is really about how making a team function well, whether that's in the operating room, whether it's in your job in your department or whether it's in these in broader activities in the community. We're going to look at what are the factors that make teams work well, but also what are the factors that can cause a team to dysfunction? What are the pitfalls that we can fall into and how might we avoid those? And then finally, we'll look at some strategies to improve leadership on your team that you can apply directly into your operating room every day, but hopefully beyond that too, um, in the leadership that you take on during your careers. So the first thing we'll talk about is teams. And a team, we all, I think, are quite aware that we all work on a team pretty much every day. We walk into an operating room and we have to work with a huge number of people, including our surgeons, our, our, the nurses that we work with, the anesthesia um, care team that we might be on, whatever that might be in your institution, our patients, and then pre and post-op, we interact with many people. Neurocritical care has its own team. So a team is an interconnected group of people who are working towards a shared and common goal. Um, in this case, it's fairly easy to conceptualize that we are looking towards making our patients um, have treatment for some pathology and we hope that they'll have a good outcome. And that is our combined goal. A, con a concept that I recently came across during my MBA that I hadn't thought about is this concept of teaming. So, in many of our positions, especially in anesthesia, we do work on teams, but we often more frequently work as we're, we're more in the verb of teaming. And the difference between team being a team and teaming is that it's teamwork on the fly. So we may not always know who's gonna be in our operating room. We may be forming teams in an emergency very rapidly without the benefit of knowing everyone's names sometimes or even how they work or what our role is. So teaming has its own set of challenges that um, I realized was very applicable to our job in anesthesia and our need to be able to adapt very quickly to creating a team to accomplish the goal, which is typically to help a patient sitting in front of us um, have a good outcome in their health or as good as they're able to. So now I want you to think about a time when you were working in your operating room when you had a great day. So you came home, you felt really good about what happened that day. Um, and you maybe told someone like, what a great day, I'm really happy to work here in this institution. 
um, and think about what the what might have been going on that day that made you think that it was really a nice day where you where you had a good experience. Were you familiar with the team you were working with? Was it people that you've worked with many times that you have a good relationship with? Was there conflict between or no conflict? Was it pleasant? Um, and what other factors might have played a role? For example, was it daytime or nighttime? Was it an emergency? Was there stress or, or was there some critical event or was it a very routine day for you? So there's a lot of reasons why we might have a good day or a bad day, but I think it's important to sometimes reflect on why we might have that good day. And I we're gonna go through what the literature and what experts in this area say about why a team functions well. So why do some teams function better? And this is, this is the crew members of the Discovery um, space crew. Um, when you read about um, astronauts going into space, I'm always struck by the differences in how they go about their objective, which is to take a team up to space where they essentially have no support and they rely on each other. And what we do in our day-to-day, -day, which is, I would say, are equally critical. We're, we take a critical patient, we do very high-risk things to them, and we have a very dynamic and rapid interplay sometimes around emergencies. The difference between us and a space team, though, is that this this astronaut group has probably virtually lived together for a year. They have rehearsed every eventuality of what they might do in space if certain things happen. They go undergo psychological testing and um, counseling, and they know each other very well. Um, they have a clear and shared purpose and responsibility, um, which is clearly around the space mission. Um, they, they go about exercises to develop trust and interdependency um, in a positive way, which I would argue that we often don't do in our teams in medicine. We don't spend a lot of time always with the people that we work very closely with. And we don't even talk about sometimes some of these issues that come up. We just sometimes don't feel happy about it. Um, so these are the things that make a team function well. And I think the space agencies have recognized this. So they, they create a stable group that's familiar with each other. They have mutual knowledge of each other's roles. They understand what's happening with everybody and they trust each other with a shared purpose and a clear leader. So there is some hierarchy in there um, and they have cohesion and cohesion is the gel that binds the people together to create that psychological safety. And it's a, it's, it, I think we can all understand what cohesion is, but it's a bit difficult to actually apply that into practice. So how do we create cohesion on a group and what does that mean exactly? So these are the things that promote team cohesion. So a smaller size group is going to be more cohesive. If you're in a group of 100 people, it's very hard to feel like you're very close and have an interconnected and trusting relationship with all of those people. A member similarity in attitudes and values. So the people understand and are aligned in what is happening and how to go about that. There's benefit to a somewhat difficult entry. So think about when you've been on a team, it was hard to get in. Even things like it was, it was competitive and you're now in a residency program that it was competitive to get into. You already feel bound to those people in a way that you wouldn't if it was easy to get into. There, there may be, um, there's good member interaction. So you don't just come together for your job, but you actually interact in other ways. You have an external threat and we'll talk about that. And actually um, it's it, in an obvious way, the most recent pandemic actually served as an external threat for a lot of teams and actually probably brought a lot of people together, maybe temporarily, but definitely served as an external threat to bring cohesion. And I know in the operating rooms that I've worked at during the pandemic, there was definitely increased cohesion, at least at times around the pandemic, because it felt like we were all in it together. Now that may not last, but it is something that promotes team function, at least in the moment. There's team success. So if your team does well and you feel like we're a good team, we have done well, that brings you together. And that might be clinically, you may have good outcomes in your patients and that makes you feel like you're a good team together and the time spent together. And again, this is something that can be challenging, I think in, in medicine and anesthesia specifically, where we are often thrown together on a team, but we don't often spend a lot of time with those people. 
So let's take it to neuroanesthesia, <clears throat> since that's why we're all here. Um, so there is one study, interesting, that just was just published, actually, that looked at the role of dedicated neuroanesthesia care teams. So this was an institution that had a mixed model. So there were, there were a dedicated neuroanesthesiologists that spent the majority of their time doing neuroanesthesia, so they clearly had more interaction with that team in that operating room. Um, and they'd done some kind of specialized training, like a fellowship. But a lot of the time, about 80% of the time, anesthesiologists were assigned at random to the operating room, so they were not part of this dedicated group. And what they did is in, in a single institution, so there's clear limitations to this, and I wouldn't take the conclusions too far, but what they found is that those um, who were um, in on part of the dedicated neuroanesthesia care team, they found that there was a reduction in post-operative neurologic complications in the patients, reduced length of stay, and reduced admission costs. And there was also an improved extent of resection. So we don't know exactly why that was, although we can speculate that there was maybe there was better communication between the surgeon and the anesthesiologist such that it led to a, a, a more robust ability to resect the tumor better. There was a greater understanding of what was happening and even just familiarity with the procedure and what to expect and the communication style of your team and the roles might have played a huge role here in, in creating these better outcomes for patients. So while this isn't definitive, this certainly gives some support for the idea that having some kind of dedicated team or familiarity with this procedure and in neuroanesthesia specifically might be beneficial for our patients. We also know that when a team functions well, so I know I can certainly speak for myself that I've been on both teams. I've been on, I've been in those operating rooms where it was not good. Like people were not speaking well with each other and there were people weren't communicating. And I've been on great teams where we people have really come together and had a great communication and, and you've come away from those days feeling very good. So when a team functions well, there's actually evidence that there's best or better communication. And you'll see this is a common theme throughout all of the team function and leadership is that if you're not communicating with your team and the team isn't communicating with itself, the outcomes are worse for the patients. So it is not enough to simply be a good surgeon or a good anesthesiologist or a good nurse. You actually have to work well in your team together. Um, and there's a lot of weight reasons why that well, um, how we get there, but I think it can't be minimized that the team function plays a role in our patients' outcomes. And it's not enough if we're just pull up the drapes as high as they go and not speak to the surgeon, which I have, I confess, done on occasion, is it's not good enough, actually. It's not good enough for the patient in front of us. There's also evidence of what the impact of communication failure in litigation, and uh, litigation is just a surrogate for negative outcomes. So this is just one piece of that pie. There's lots of negative outcome that never goes to litigation. Um, but this was an analysis of communication failures in anesthesia practice specifically. They found that it's extremely common. Communication failure is a contributor to um, malpractice claims. And interestingly, they looked at the different types of communication failure. The most common was content. That's, did I give you the right information? And were you available to receive that information? Um, audience failure is, was the right person given the information? Or did if they didn't answer their page, that's audience failure because someone couldn't receive it. Purpose failure, um, did you understand the people couldn't agree on the resolution of the information? So even though they might have had it, they were not able to come to an appropriate resolution. Um, this also could include being rude to people. So it's an inability to come to consensus around something that is happening. And then timing and occasion failure. So could the information have been provided sooner in this scenario to avoid the negative outcome? So interestingly, content failure though highlights that the first problem is that we're not sharing enough information or the right information with people. The other thing is now these were anesthesia malpractice claims, so it's no surprise that anesthesiology was involved most of the time. However, I do think we need to take some responsibility in this in that it's we're involved most of the time in these issues. It's not simply other people creating the problem for us. Um, not surprisingly, like surgery and nursing were also highly represented in this because it's the team, right? These are the people that we are sharing information and working on our team with. 
And it wasn't in a minority, the, the patient, the family of the patient or the patient themselves who were involved, perhaps not disclosing something that was necessary. So this slide makes no sense to you as is, but I bring it, I put it to you just to give you an example of another important concept around team function, which is called synergy. So this was an, this is representing an exercise I've done a couple of times with our trainees and also um, with myself, I was part of, which is a simulated exercise where you're told you've you crash on a plane in Northern um, Canada, which is terrifying to think of, and they give you a list of items that you have to rank in order of how important they are to your survival. Um, and you can see them all. And to be honest, I'm not a survivalist. I have not been to the nor Northern part of Canada near enough to be an expert in any of this. And so what we did is we individually ranked those items. And then we were put on a team where we had to then do a group ranking so four of you together would think of what is the best ranking and then they would score you um, both individually and then as your team and what is really interesting about this exercise having been involved in it multiple times so i've seen this play out a few times with totally different people is that the individual scores are always lower than the team score so you all um, the team almost always does better than the average individual score the team overcomes that and actually does better so it's not simply pooling everyone's information and baseline it the team in my one the one i did everybody did better than the average team member or the average score which means that the team is exceeding the baseline knowledge and um, performance of the individuals on that team and that's essentially what we call synergy so when you have one plus one is greater than two. So you're taking people and you're putting them together and you're not just getting the sum of their collective intelligence and skills and experience, you're actually getting something better. And the reason why that happens is also important to understand because it's, it's why we work on teams a lot of the time is because it's better than working individually. There's a reason we, even though we don't, maybe don't like working with people all the time, we actually should because it's better for outcomes. But in order to achieve synergy, because not every team in these exercises achieved synergy, sometimes they did hit the average, but most of the time they exceeded it is that you have to have a combination of success in the rational processes. So that's the very, the analyzing the situation, considering all the alternatives, taking an analytical approach. But equally important is that interpersonal success. And that is around communication with your colleagues that you're talking to. Everyone is listening and sharing their information. So if somebody is not talking in this situation, that is not gonna give you synergy because they're not contributing their part of the information and this idea of trust and collaboration that you're co-creating an outcome and you're willing to change your mind and work with these other people having a healthy disagreement which we're going to talk about as well and also having a group norm around psychological safety so you don't always create synergy teams do not always have synergy but they can and i think this is where you want to harness the potential of your team so does anyone recognize what this picture refers to? This was a very famous case or in the news in, in 2018, which was then the, when the Thai boys soccer team um, went into the caves, deep, deep into their cave system, and then got stranded in there when the water came in um, at, just after they had gone in. So they were trapped very deep into this complex cave system. Um, and with their coach, but they survived because they were they managed to be in dry land. But it was an incredibly complex procedure to get them out of this cave system. And this, the, I mean, I remember it myself vividly. The um, it was in the news like every day. Uh, the whole world was captivated by this, and so much was riding on getting these children out of the cave. Um, I can't even think of a, a situation where we were all probably collectively as invested in this in this scenario. Um, and they had to come and create a solution to a problem that they had never solved before in a system and a situation they'd never encountered in an incredibly challenging way. Um, and if you haven't seen, there's a great documentary on it that goes through in detail how they did this. I'm not going to do it justice here because it's so complex, but it does involve anesthesia. So it's interesting too. Um, 
And how they got the, ch the children out, ultimately, they had to take them underwater through the cave system. They simply could not drill in. They could not take them through. And these were, I think they were, these were young children, like 10, 12, maybe a little bit older, um, who they had to, essentially what they ended up doing was took a bunch of, of extreme cave divers who were skilled in cave diving, which is not something the average person would be able to do successfully. It was incredibly dangerous. And they actually had to anesthetize the children, put masks on them, turn them upside down underwater and take them out over hours through these black, like totally dark cave system underwater and hope that that mask didn't come off and that the child didn't drown during this. And the incredible thing is that they got all of the children out of the cave successfully. Um, which is absolutely astounding that they did it. Now, they did lose one of their divers, which is very sad, um, on the, but, but they did manage to get the children out. And so this, is, this was done over a period of, of maybe two weeks. This was not a long period. I would consider this extreme teaming because this involved over 10,000 people. It invo involved um, thousands of government agencies. It involved multiple countries, multiple languages, multiple skill sets, and an anesthesiologist who was also a cave diver from Australia. Um, and so what made this successful? Um, I think it's an amazing story. Um, and I think what they, this was actually published in the British Medical Journal. They, were, they felt they were successful because they did meticulous planning ahead of time. They discussed all the eventualities that they could. They clearly defined the roles of what everyone was going to do. They had trust in their teammates. And this may not have been easy because this was multiple countries. These people didn't all know each other and they weren't all conventionally people who would have worked together. They had a shared purpose and an external threat. And I remember I told you that's important. And I think that in this case would have been such a major driver because they had these were children that they wanted to save their lives. Everyone in the world was watching them to do this. They had diverse skills. They brought a lot of different experience and different unique skill sets, including a man who was an anesthesiologist and a cave diver and this external threat of, of bringing them together. So it's a great example of how the amazing things that teams can do when they put their mind to it. And you have all been part of that in your medical career. I know we all have, and it's amazing when it works well, but it doesn't always work well. And I'd say there's a lot of dysfunction as well, maybe just in my institution, but there is a lot of dysfunction. So now we're gonna talk a bit about when it doesn't work so well and how we can overcome that. So now I want you to do the opposite and think about the day where you came home and you were frustrated and you might have complained a bit and you just felt like you hadn't had a good day. You just wanted it to end. And, and you can think about there's lots of reasons for that, but often it's a team issue about what happened during your day. Was your team familiar with each other? Were you maybe thrown into a situation in a different environment where you had never worked before with people you hadn't worked with? Who didn't really understand what was going on maybe there was conflict or rudeness or incivility like where people were not respecting each other and that can happen for a variety of reasons and i think we're all capable of that and this is not about one group being in, like having rudeness i just think the impact of that as you'll see is quite substantial on a, a team's function and then what other factors played a role was it an emergency were you tired were they tired was there pressure in other ways so when you look at, there are standardized structural um, uh, formula for, for analyzing team function when you, when you look at the literature in, in organizational behavior. Um, and I've sort of, I've created a very simplistic version of this. There's the external factors, which are like the organizational structure, the leadership style of like, say your hospital, and then that trickles down into what's the structure and leadership style and culture of your operating room, for example. That is often hard to control as an individual. You, on a day-to-day -day basis, are gonna struggle to make a difference, to really change that. Although I think as leaders, you can have a big impact. We're not gonna talk about that in a huge way, but because I think that is a very high, higher level thing that I hope many of you do take on. Um, we're gonna talk a bit more about how you might do this in your day-to-day. -day. So then there's within the team itself, the formal organization. So that's how does that team come together? Who's on that team? And that's different in all of our hospitals and how we work. What are the hierarchical systems that we have in place? Is there membership instability? So is, and I think this is really interesting, just hearing about practice in different areas compared to where I work. Is there, how much of the team is 
consistent. So is are you always working on your neuroanesthesia team with the same surgeons and are you very familiar with that environment? In, in my job, it's it's actually very, a lot of flux. We work across many locations, many different surgeons, many different proceduralists, and we don't always know even what the procedure is very well or who's working with us and what their skill level is. And it's often very unstable and that creates a challenge for a team. Who are the people on the team and what are their competencies and working styles individually? Um, what are the demographics? Um, for example, we're going to talk about this too, is, is if during COVID, we've had a lot of turnover in our staff because people have left, nurses have left. And when you have a, you have a huge turnover in staff, you end up with a different demographic mix. You end up with a different experience mix and skill level. And that even that, that will evolve over time, but that's something to recognize as a potential factor. The task design, what are you being asked to do? Is it simple? Is it complex? Is it what, how much do we interact? And I think this even is subtle in anesthesia because there's some cases where quite honestly, we can kind of do our job and not even talk to them and it's probably okay. Like there's not as much that we have to do. There's other procedures though that we do that we absolutely cannot avoid talking to the people we work with. We're so intricate, intricate together. Um, and, and that depends a bit on what the procedure is. And then, then we're gonna talk about cognitive biases. So that's more on the individual level, understanding what the challenges are, why we all have these biases and how we can overcome them in the moment and how we can avoid having them impact our patients' outcomes. So these are the three common sources of dysfunction, conflict and hierarchy, cognitive biases and communication and incivility. Those are the ones I'm gonna focus on. So, our, all surgical teams are prone to conflict. I would say neurosurgical teams are equally or more prone to conflict for all these reasons. There is often unstable membership, at least in some institutions, that can be very un, that can be very unstable. Other ones, it might be less so. The roles and competencies amongst those team members might not be well understood. Um, there's often emergency and time pressure. We're, we're always under time pressure, and there's this constant tension around getting the case done and not delaying things. Um, we have high complexity cases. These are not simple things that we're doing to people and we have to recognize that it's, it can be very complex. And we have an interdependency. I think anesthesia does not exist without surgery and surgery does not exist without anesthesia. We are completely interdependent, whether we like to think it or not. Now, this was a study done by some colleagues in Ottawa in, in Canada who looked at what are the perceived barriers to teamwork in the operating room. And, and some of these are, most of these are probably not going to be a shock to most of us. It's if negative emotions are in the room, it's going to be hard for us to function as a team. If we lack knowledge and skills, if there's night, it's nighttime, emergencies, time pressures, the hierarchy, the personality that's in the room. Is that the surgeon that you never like working with? Well, it's probably going to be harder for you to function as a team. And then there's some demographic factors where if you have those factors, you don't perceive your team as functioning as well. And that's important to recognize, especially things like early career people tend to have more, more trouble feeling like they're part of the team. Um, and that might be something to keep in mind if you're on the other side of that, if you're more senior. Hierarchy is an important concept. It's not, I don't want to say it's always bad. I think hierarchy is used widely in the military. It's obviously in medicine. We have a huge amount of hierarchy. There's reasons why we have hierarchy. It's efficient. It lets us figure out right away, like the military, right away we know what our role is and who we should listen to. Um, it, it coordinates people without much having to rethink everything. So I'm not saying hierarchy is all bad, but if you're in a highly hierarchical system, which we are, and as is the military, it creates the potential for contests where people need, feel like they need to move up the ladder or they need to compete for positions. And it can sometimes drive this distraction and conflict and suppress communication between people. So it's important to recognize that we are in a hierarchical system and to try to, I think, sometimes mitigate that a little bit if we want our teams to function well. Cognitive biases, the three that we're going to focus because they are really important to team function. There's lots of there's lots of cognitive biases we have, but these are the key ones when we're on a team is conformity bias, which is when we try to we try to we might alter our decision making because of the opinions of the people we're with. So we like to conform to the group and I'll show you um, some evidence of that. 
and confirmation bias. I think we've all heard of that. We like to search for confirmation for what we believe is true, and we tend to minimize or dismiss information that we don't believe supports our beliefs. And so it's easy to, that even when you're diagnosing an emergency, you might dismiss things that you think because you think you know what the answer is. And then the common information effect, which was not something I was familiar with until a few years ago, was that you, we tend to share and overemphasize information that's shared by multiple people in our team, which doesn't mean that that information is actually more important. But if, if I say something and you say something and, oh, a third person brings it up as well, it's got to be the answer, right? But that actually isn't always true. And so it's important to consider more alternatives sometimes. So in conformity bias, um, group members are more likely to take cues on their behavior from the people around them rather than their own personal judgment. And you might say, oh, I would never do that. I will always think of the right thing. I'll always go by what I think. And I, there is a portion of you out there who will do that. But I, the, the sad thing, you're not sad, but the unfortunate thing is the majority of us will not. Um, it's common among trainees and it's common amongst people who are lower in the hierarchy because they pay a higher price for going against the group say speaking up against a senior person even though they know something wrong is happening um, and it it's people who are prioritizing cohesiveness in the group and avoiding conflict so those are good things but they're not always good for problem solving or team function at the ASH experiments were the early demonstrators of this um, concept and where people were given these three lines and then they said, here's the experimental line. Tell me which is it, is it the same length as A, B or C? So it's a pretty, it's a pretty simple test. And they were in a group, but un unbeknownst to the one participant, the other people in the group were all part of the experiment. And what they did is they asked them this question publicly and the other people all said the wrong answer. It was clearly wrong. <laughs> But the, the, how many times did the person in the experiment actually go along with the group, even though it was blatantly wrong? And the kind of shocking thing is that 75% of the time, the person went along with the wrong answer over the course of 12 experimental sessions. 30% um, of the time in any one session, someone would go and agree with a clearly wrong answer. 25% never conform to their group. So there are a group of one in four of you will are, are going to stand up for whatever you think and not conform, but the majority of people will. And so that means that when you're in a room in an operating room and something's happening, people will tend to go along with the group rather than go against it or look like they're not being a team member. Um, so it's important to remember that in an emergency or something where you need to figure out what's happening, that people are going to tend to do this and they may not speak up against what might be a clearly wrong answer. Why do they do it? Social cohesiveness, they question their own knowledge, and they want approval from others. The common information effect is when the group broadly emphasizes and information shared by multiple people and neglects information held by one or few. The leader may not be challenged, there may be less creativity, and bad decisions are not challenged, which is not, not a good thing for the team. When you have more and more people in the group, a few people do more and more of the talking. So there's also a thought in social science that around six to seven people is the optimal number when you're trying to make a decision, because if you go too high, it ends up being dominated by only a few people and the rest of the people don't talk. And you want everybody to contribute information. In medicine, they've looked at teams and they found that information sharing um, between this was a residents, students, and, um, and staff on an internal medicine team, common information was more likely to be discussed and earlier and emphasized. But if they pooled their unshared information, they were more likely to make the right diagnosis on the patient. And team leaders were more likely to repeat information. So repeat what others had said. So if you're leading your team, make sure that you're extracting information from everybody and trying to keep that information, even information that uh, they may not share with anybody else. Confirmation bias, as I said, when we tend to look to confirm our beliefs and we dismiss when it's not. And this is not always done out of malicious intent. This is just something we do because it's actually cognitively easier to go through our life doing this. And this is as a case example of how this might have disastrous effects in medicine. This was a, a neurosurgeon who was um, doing an intrathecal catheter. He needed dye to inject to identify the placement of the catheter. He asked for the dye. The pharmacy had substituted with an alternative um, dye because they were out of stock. 
Um, the nurse took the vial, handed it to the surgeon. The surgeon blindly injected it. It was neurotoxic and the patient died the next day. Um, and what they found after is that it said not for intrathecal use clearly on the vial, but everybody assumed the pharmacy knew and gave the right vial. The nurses assumed that must be the right vial. The surgeon assumed that if the nurses gave it to him, it was the right vial. And then they assumed that it, it went on and on. Nobody questioned that this wasn't the right thing. And nobody in this, I'm sure, did this maliciously or wanted to do this. It was just, the, it's the confirmation bias we have that we, we just assume things are how we think they are. So communication is really key to all of these things. And this is a really interesting study looking at how we perceive communication may not be how other people can perceive communication. And the biggest impact here was between the anesthesiologists and the nurses, where we perceive good communication and they perceived much worse communication. It just shows that you're not, we're not always sure what's happening between the different people. So it's key, key to keep that in mind. Now, incivility in the operating room, as I've alluded to, is not a good thing. And this is a study done by colleagues in Canada that just found that incivility and bad behavior is incredibly prevalent in operating rooms. And at least in Canada, I would argue we're like overly polite in Canada. And so it's probably everywhere. Um, and even physical assault, which is pretty horrible. What does that do to the team? Well, it's not good. So a team does not perform well when somebody is rude. This was a really key study done uh, i think in israel where they looked at a simulation of a neonatal resuscitation in one of the that one of the groups the mom came in and made a very dismissive and rude comment about the team not knowing what they were doing that's it otherwise they were the same um, same scenario and they found that the diagnostic and procedural performance scores were lower in the rude group and when they looked down at where that happened it was largely in lack of communication between the team members so when somebody sets the stage that there is some kind of rudeness i mean i know i do it you stop talking and you stop sharing and you're afraid to speak up so it's not good any rudeness even though we might say it doesn't really matter it does matter for our patients this is also looking at residents and if the residents were exposed to incivility in a simulation they also had lower performance scores on every single metric a substantial reduction in the passing score so this is an important thing for everybody's function including our trainees so how do we fix it um same study that looked at Barriers to teamwork looked at enablers. So if you have an organized, clean environment, safety culture, um, you have positive emotions where people feel good about being where they are, people know what they're doing, what the definition of the team is, um, that there's clear behavioral re regulation helping behaviors. So all those positive things, it doesn't, it, it makes sense that people were gonna function better. We have to counteract our cognitive biases. The first thing is just knowing that they're there and that we are all vulnerable to them um, and that everyone in the room is vulnerable to them. And so that is, here's, these are the suggestions around how we can make ourselves do better, is avoid making decisions too early. So if you're the leader and you state, I think that this is this problem, then you might d deter everyone else from contributing to the discussion. You need a devil's advocate and you need diverse perspectives and experiences at the table. And you might assign roles based on your contribution, based on your skill set or background. You want to assign the whole operating room and decision making when you have a difficult decision um, and actively solicit opinions from people, especially if they're not speaking. If you're a leader, you can encourage that information sharing. You can try to flatten the hierarchy a bit so people feel more comfortable speaking up for you because it'll help you in your job. Um, avoid stating your opinion early. People will have a hard time going against your opinion, and then that will deter the team from coming up with alternative um, solutions. And always emphasize the common goal. I think through conflict, especially in the operating room, if you, br if you remind everybody that we're actually just here to make the best outcome for the patient, that can sometimes bring people back together and stop making it about a conflict between two people. Model good behavior yourself, which is not always easy, I know. Hold yourself accountable and other people. If things do happen, then we should be accountable and apologize and acknowledge that that wasn't right. Um, don't excuse behavior and validate others and define what it is acceptable conduct. And especially if you're a leader, I think that's very important. If you have to have a fight or conflict, conflict isn't bad. Conflict's good sometimes. Argue like you're right, but listen like you're wrong. 
Don't make it about people, make it about the issues. That is really key. And make it as discuss as a collaboration to a best solution, not about trying to win this, this conflict. Establish fairness. Try to balance the power structure and don't force people to have consensus because then they feel like they're forced into the decision. Now, leadership styles, the one that is considered most effective is hard on the issue, but soft on the person. So it's not about people because that does not make anybody feel good or want to be a better team member. Um, but we can be hard on issues. So I'm going to end here with a summary. So teams can achieve synergy beyond their individuals. Teams have great possibility in our world through knowledge sharing, elaboration and motivation. Communication is key, though, to that team doing well. And teams fail to achieve synergy for many reasons, including cognitive biases, behavioral norm issues, incivility and conflict that's not managed well. Teams are enhanced by psychological safety, communication, and then structural factors. And maybe that's cohesion and team, um, team stability sometimes in our operating rooms to avoid these biases and negative outcomes. But overall, it's great to be on a team. Um, and I hope that helps you in your job going forward. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Alana. That was a uh, very well covered and exp explicitly uh, described the way the things happen in our day-to-day -day practice in the OR and the intensive and the role of uh, leadership in resolving various uh, issues which come over time to time. So we are thankful to you for the great presentation and over to Dr. Nidhi. And it is a very interesting topic and many I think many of us will learn many things from your presentation. Thanks a lot. Huh? Now we will have some function here. Felicitation. We will felicitate you for giving oration. So, yeah. I request all the faculty and resident from PGA and alumni from PGA to come to the stage to felicitate Alana.
Uh, we'll now move on to session three. Uh, it's a students forum, young neuroanesthesiologist session. Uh, so we have three categories for this: PGI, NIMHANS, and AIMS. So uh, proceeding with the first one, the moderator is Dr. Rajiv Chauhan, Associate Pro Professor, PGI, Chandigarh. And for Nimhans, the moderator is Professor Radha Krishnan. Professor, Department of Neuroanesthesia and Neurocritical Care, Nimhans. Uh, and the third, Ames New Delhi. Moderator is Professor Professor Keshav Goyal. Professor Ames New Delhi. I request the moderators to introduce the speakers for the respective sessions. I will request uh, Dr. Kiran Deep from PGI. He is uh, post DM, a senior resident in our institute. And uh, she will be speaking about the scoring, uh, sy uh, scoring systems in neuroanesthesia. Uh, over to Dr. Kiran Deep, please. Thank you, sir, for a kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting risk scoring systems in neuroanesthesia. Do they really predict outcome? So the objectives of the talk are to discuss the current and the most relevant scoring systems because there is huge literature with n number of studies and n number of scores. But I will consolidate the talk to the most relevant and the widely used risk scoring systems. We will try to find identify the strength, limitations and application of these scores and their practical prediction probability for the outcome. Why do we need the scores? To assess the severity of the disease, to prognosticate, to triage the patients, to plan a formu uh, formulate a plan of management and for the hand of communication between the teams. So, an ideal scoring system, it should be easy to use, it should incorporate routinely recordable parameters, applicable to the heterogeneous set of populations, should be well formulated, validated and calibrated and it should have high prediction for the functional outcome status. It should be so robust that whenever used in different situations by different people, it should give the same results. So the scoring system, it can be divided as scores and the probability model. As the ma'am told in uh, previous session, that scores are individual numbers. They can give us the uh, severity of the disease can be assessed using them. But probability model, they are like 1 plus 1 more than 2. So, they can give us a better idea of the prediction. For neuroanesthesiologists, our part starts with the pre-anesthetic assessment. So, there are the pre-anesthetic scores. We go to the ICUs where we have the admission scores and the repetitive scores. Outcomes can be divided as short-term outcomes, long-term outcomes, surgical outcomes and non-surgical outcomes. Starting with the pre-anesthetic scores, I'll start with ASA physical status classification that is uh, most widely used and we all are very well versed with the classification. It was devised in 1941 by three physicians which had scores 1 to 5. It was amended in 1961 to give us the present day score that is 1 to 6. It has the uh, probability for uh, mortality prediction at 24 hours and at 7 days. As the ASA grading goes up, so is the mortality at 24 hours as well as at 7 days. When E, that is the suffix, is added, that is for emergency procedures, it already triples the risk for the elective pro uh, as compared to the elective procedure. Moving on to the next, we have Karnofsky performance status scale that was originally used for the oncology patients but not for neurosurgical patients. But 
this has been extrapolated to the neurosurgery patients nowadays. It ranges from 0 to 100. 0 means dead and 100 is normal patient with no evidence of the disease. ECOG is the European Cooperative Oncology grading that ranges from 0 to 4 points. But again, these have not been very well validated for the neurosurgical population. Another score is the Charlson Comorbidity Index which uses 19 comorbidities and they are graded as per their severity and numbered as 1, 2, 3 and 6. But again it lacks so many conditions that may be important for the neurosurgical population as well as the operative parameters have not been included in this. Another score that can be commonly used is the POSSUM score. That was devised in 1991. It comprises 18 parameters, 12 from the physiological scores and 6 are the operative scores. Again, it was modified as P possum, that is pot's mouth possum score to increase the probability prediction. For the tumor patients, we have scale score that, in, uh, that comprises factors like sex, KPS, ASA grading, location of the lesion and edema uh, uh, surrounding the lesion. Another scores that can be used are NSQIP score, RCRI score, Euro score and Milan complexity score. When we have studied about all these scores, let's compare them. This study was done by Martin et al. And when they compared this using all these scores, they found that ASA grading was better to predict the mortality with a high prediction value, but NSQIP score could predict the complications better than the other scores. This was another study which was a systematic review of literature done by Elena Reponen and when they compared all the, par uh, all the previously mentioned scores, they could found that ASA and KPS could better predict the mor morbidity in intracranial tumors and Charlson comorbidity score could predict the mortality in elective craniotomy with for aneurysmal surgeries. As KPS can be used as the Pre-operative assessment score, it is also used as the outcome score. Uh, it is used to give the uh, patients to, get, to be categorized into the uh, for the categories where the uh, aggressive treatment should be given or not. The uh, cutoff is taken as more than equal to 70. So, when the cutoff was taken and pre-operative and post-operative KPS scores were compared, the authors could find that post-operative KPS score could have better predictive value for the survival of the surgical patients with GPM. So, we cannot deny just on the basis of one score for the treatment. Coming to the traumatic brain injury scores, we have physiological scores, we have CT parameters. Coming to the physiological scores first, the widely used is the GCS score. It was given by Tisdale and Janet, uh, which was a uh, 50. 14 uh, point score when it was modified again in 1976 to give the 15 point score which uh, for which the motor component one more point was added but it is again not short of the fallacies for the high inter observer variability it has total score which is uh, which doesn't depict a true picture unless we take account of the motor component for which it is more skewed towards. It cannot be assigned to the eye injury patients, aphasia and intubated patients for which we need the modification of the score. For, uh, nowadays we are using GCS P score which is GCS minus pupillary reactivity score. This was a study done but, uh, where the authors compared GCS, GCSP and GCS motor score and the authors could find that GCSP score could better predict the mortality in hospital as well as in the later dates. To overcome the fallacies of GCS, we have four scores that comprises eye response, motor response, brainstem reflexes and respiration. But again, it is a very complex score and it has uh, but it has a higher inter-rated agreement. When four score was compared with the GCS, the authors could find that in 32 studies, GCS and four score, they were almost comparable to predict the mortality and morbidity. Passing on to the CT scores, we have CT Marshall score. Uh, it was formulated in 1991 that comprises from uh, uh, one to six scores. And uh, again, uh, it was modified a little bit with a different name as Rotterdam score that gives a descriptive picture of the type of injury. Again, another score was formulated that is Stockholm score that uses midline shift 
as the continuous variable that has better prediction probability helsinki score came into picture in 2014 that has all the previously mentioned scores incorporated into it when these scores were compared ct scores including ct marshall rotterdam and helsinki score the authors found that helsinki score had the bet, uh, better area under the curve and could predict the uh, out, uh, probability with the better uh, uh, prediction it has better prediction values selection of the ct variables prognostic models for the outcome prediction in traumatic brain injury when the four scores were compared ct marshall rotterdam helsinki and stockholm stockholm could better categorize these patients as favorable outcome and unfavorable outcome with their its better predictive ability but when it comes to the dead or alive that is the helsinki score that had the higher value coming to the prediction models we have crash model impact model and the links for these prediction models they are available online to count for the uh, mortality at 14 days and then at the 6 months when crash and impact models they were compared the authors could find that they almost do the similar job coming to the aneurysmal sh patients the validated score is the hunt and hess score this started uh, it was started with the bottrell score which was modified to the modified bottrell score then the hunt and hess score came into picture and then the modified hunt and hess which comprises the grades from 0 to 5 it can better predict the mortality and morbidity in hospital but not for the longer term outcomes as the grade is increasing from 0 to 5 both the mortality and morbidity they increase from 2% to 40% but again it uses the vague terms like drowsy stupor so there is always a chance for the inter uh, observer variability for interpretation wfn score it ranges from score 1 to 5 it comprises gcs and motor deficit into account but it lacks the prognostic power again there is a wide break point in gcs for grade 4 that is from 7 to 12 for the ct picture we have the modified fisher scale that ranges from 0 to 4 and it predicts the incidence of vasospasm from 24% to 40% vasospasm is seen as the grade is increasing from 1 to 4 when the scales for the ct were compared fisher scale modified fisher scale and hijra sum score the authors could find that modified fisher scale were more commonly and significantly associated with dci in, than the fisher scale for the in hospital mortality in subarachnoid hemorrhage we have the hair score that ranges from 0 to 8 and the prediction probability is quite high and mortality increases from 0.9% to 83% as the score is increasing from 0 to 7 we have the vaso grade scale that comprises wfns and modified fisher scale it has a high predictive value for prediction of the dci these are the prediction models that were given by a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage international trialist and it comprises core model neurological parameters and uh, the treatment modality that is given and it has a high predictive value for the outcome at 3 months then there is fresh score that is used for the long term outcomes as already told that hunt and has score has score and wfn has score and other previous scores they were not able to predict the prognosticate the patient at one year of outcome so the uh, fresh score that comprises previous parameters into account like physiological parameter hunt and has grading and two other parameters it could better predict the pro uh, pro prognosticate the patients for one year outcome using the area under curve around 90% for the ich we have ich score that ranges from 0 to 6 and it can predict the mortality at 30 days ranging from 0 to almost 100% when it goes from 0 to 5 now a word about the outcome scores modified rankin scale it was developed by dr john rankin in 1957 at that point it was 1 to 5 point scale later on 0 and 6 were added and it was modified as modified rankin score functional outcome measure it is 
used for the acute uh, stroke trials most of the times it is used for the acute stroke trials then we have the gos and gose scales that are used most commonly for the acute traumatic brain injury outcome predict uh, outcome assessment unstructured gos was given by janet et al in 1975 first structured gos was given in 1981 by janet et al and it was given as gos extended form in 1998 wilson by wilson et al but again fallacies are it doesn't take into account patient satisfaction and emotional components interrater variability is there for the gos and gosc structured interview programs are there on the internet for with which we can assess the patient a uh, few slides about the icu scoring system we have at the admission apache score simplified acute physiological score multiple mortality prediction score and for rapid uh, repetitive scores we have organ and uh, organ dysfunction and infection score sofa score multi organ dysfunction score logistic organ dysfunction score and trio score that is recalibrated at the 3 days also when these scores were compared in neuro icu the authors could find that gcs and saps had the highest predictive value gcs adding more advantage being the simple one so to conclude my uh, talk i'll say risk assessment in neurosurgical patients is complicated due to the heterogeneous set of population and varying characteristics of the lesion one scale doesn't fit all the situations scale depends on the questions we want to get answers for and a robust score should have physiological parameters neurological parameters ct parameters and lab investigations and nowadays biomarkers into account in order to give us a better picture thank you uh, thank you kiranjit very well presented and well in time and uh, there are number of scores in anesthesia and we had uh, just focused uh, the scores primarily related to neuro anesthesia thank you very much all the best over to dr madhusudan please next i invite uh, dr prachi she is a third year dm student in the department of neuro anesthesia and critical care from nimhans over to dr prachi good afternoon i'll be talking on outcome prediction uh, by biomarkers in neuro anesthesia so before we go into the evidence for biomarkers in neuro anesthesia what do we understand by a biomarker the fda defines biomarker as an objective indicator of either a normal biological process a pathogenic process or something that is released in response to any intervention so simply stated biomarkers are those molecules which are released by cells when there is significant structural damage or any change in the functions now though the term biomarker can include clinical and imaging measurements even genotypes it is usually reserved for describing molecules which are found in the bodily fluids so there is no uh, neurosurgical troponin that exists however an ideal biomarker uh, in neurosurgical population should have minimal characteristics of high specificity and sensitivity for the brain tissue it should be easily measured in accessible biofluids like blood or csf it should otherwise have zero or low basal levels in healthy controls and it should be cost effective Now the prognostic capabilities of biomarkers become relevant not only because they identify the initial severity of injury but also the risk of disease progression during the uh, course of stay in the hospital for any patient. This leads to a more goal directed individualized approach. Neuroprotective interventions can be initiated early which may eventually lead to an improvement in the outcome. They can elucidate the pathophysiological pathways which are involved in patients who end up with a good versus a poor outcome and they also help in patient stratification which can be utilized in clinical trials for selecting a more homogeneous study groups the biomarkers in literature have been classified in a number of ways i've tried to put them in a concise way the most commonly used classifications biomarkers can be classified based on their pathophysiological mechanisms based on the source of their release from different cells uh, for example there are biomarkers of inflammation which may be released because of estroglial injury like s100 beta they may be released from the vascular endothelium uh, like the addition molecules there are biomarkers of protein degradation which may be released because of uh, from the microglial cells like matrix metalloproteinase 9 or may be representative of neuronal cell body injury like the uchl1 they may be representative of cytoskeletal damage the damage may, may happen at the level of the glial cells which will lead to the release of gfap it may happen at the level of uh, myelin which may lead to the release of myelin basic protein and it may happen at the level of non myelinated axons which leads to the release of neurofilaments 
Similarly, from the presynaptic terminals, biomarkers of apoptosis may be released, uh, which basically include our uh, alpha spectrin break breakdown products, and they may be released from endothelial uh, alteration like von Willebrand factors. Biomarkers may also be classified based on the compartment from which the sample is collected. So, they, it may be from CSF, from blood, or even from saliva. Now, another important aspect in understanding biomarkers is the kinetics of the biomarkers. This is important to understand at what time after injury should we sample the blood or the CSF for any particular biomarker. So, as we can see in this graph, after the onset of injury, there are biomarkers which are released acutely and have a very short half-life uh, like S100 beta. Then there are those which have an intermediate half-life like glial fibrillary acidic protein. Next is biomarkers which are released more slowly and peak uh, uh, weeks, hours to days after the injury. So, these include biomarkers of apoptosis like breakdown products of spectrin. Then there are biomarkers which are more important in the chronic phase, like biomarkers of neuro in, uh, neuroinflammation, which will have a longer T half. And finally, there are biomarkers which may, release, which may be released in the subacute phase, but because of the long half-life also become important in the chronic phase, like biomarkers of neurodegeneration. So, as anesthetist, is probably the most important outcomes for us will be something which is assayed in the pre-operative period and will predict outcome in the post-operative period, uh, for example, delirium, post-operative cognitive dysfunction or new onset of strokes. Now, uh, recently or in fact, from a long time now, it has been said that exposure to certain anesthetic agents, uh, the fact that the patient is undergoing surgery itself uh, and even transient episodes of cerebral ischemia may predispose patients to hyperphosphorylation of the tau and it may also lead to uh, oligomerization of A-beta. Now, this leads to a reduction in the synaptic plasticity and predisposes to neurodegeneration, which is something very similar or is actually the hallmark of patients with Alzheimer's. So, if you look at the evidence for these biomarkers, it has been shown that lower values of CSF beta amyloid protein to tau ratio is actually perioperatively predictive of neurocognitive disorders in the post-op period. CSF levels of phosphorylated tau after surgeries are also higher in patients with brain infarction. And the two key biomarkers classically associated with neuronal injury, tau and plasma neurofilament light, are also significantly higher in patients who develop post-operative cognitive dysfunction. However, with other biomarkers, uh, sorry, so uh, uh, coming specifically to the neurosurgical population, we have carotid end arterectomy patients in which biomarkers have been studied in the pre-operative, intraoperative and the post-operative period. Now, in the pre-operative period, the biomarkers that are studied are basically the susceptibility biomarkers. That is, uh, because of the disease state per se, they will increase the risk of a particular outcome. And in the intraoperative and the post-operative period, the biomarkers will be effect biomarkers. So, because of direct insult from the surgery or because of indirect systemic fac uh, factors, they may be released and they may be predictive of uh, post-operative uh, outcomes. Now, with respect to this, metrics metalloproteinase 9 has been studied and it has been found that even baseline values of MMP9 are higher in patients who develop cognitive dysfunction following carotid surgeries. So, this identifies that in such patients probably it is the baseline higher inflammatory state or the presence of subclinical infarcts from blood-brain barrier dysfunctions that leads to higher levels in the pre-op and post-op predisposes to cognitive dysfunction. However, S100 beta and neuron-specific enolase, the overall uh, evidence is inconclusive or contradictory. Next is the biomarkers of TBI. These have probably been studied the maximum in detail. Uh, so, prognostic biomarkers in TBI can be divided into two categories, those which are measured early after injury. So, these will depict the risk of early mortality, in hospital mortality and those that are measured in the chronic phase. They will predict the long-term outcomes like development of neurocognitive disorders, uh, post-traumatic encephalopathy, movement disorders, etc. So, if you look at the latest evidence, Bioprotect was uh, a trial which was done in 2019. They measured very early serum levels of certain biomarkers within four hours of injury and they found that S100 beta and GFAB were independently associated with six-month outcome. More recently, in Lancet in 2022, in two independent studies, it has been shown that blood biomarkers actually provide an incremental value to established prognostic models, that is impact and crash. So, these studies were conducted by Center TBI and Track TBI groups. The center TBI group found that higher biomarker levels were associated with worse outcome, incomplete recovery and mortality. And when each of the biomarkers were assessed individually, UCHL1 had the greatest incremental prognostic value. Uh, the track TBI group found that the day of injury values of GFAP and UCHL1 plasma concentrations had excellent prognostic value for predicting death and unfavorable outcome. 
So almost all the biomarkers which we read about in literature have been studied in moderate to severe TBI. However, there is no conclusive threshold or even if the thresholds are defined, they are widely varying between studies. Each biomarker has its limitation and their use in clinical practice should be in the context of each biomarker's limitations. Coming to aneurysmal SAH, currently uh, the admission neurological grading and the amount of blood on CT are the mainstay of prognosis in aneurysmal SAH patients. But if we add biofluid biomarkers, it may, it may provide certain advantages. It may be more cost effective because it will reduce the need for emergent imaging. It may triage patients who require referral to higher centers or ICU admission. And therefore, it will improve patient care by identifying earlier need for intervention. So coming to the evidence for aneurysmal SAH, peak levels of S100 beta in the serum have been identified to be associated with poor long-term neurological outcome as assessed by the modified ranking scale. However, again, the cutoff values differ highly between studies from 0.13 to 0.4 micrograms per liter. Uh, the values of GFAP, serum levels of GFAP are also associated with mortality and poor outcome. And when they are added to Hunters and Fisher, they are associated with improved precision of outcome prediction. Next is UCHL1. So UCHL1 is... Uh, uh, a biomarker which has a short half-life. However, if it is present in circulation for more than 10 days post-ictus, it is associated with poor outcome assessed using the modified Rankin scale. Now, uh, aneurysmal patients who survive the initial rupture, uh, the uh, one factor which leads to poor outcome in them is the development of delayed cerebral ischemia or DCI. Now, we know that aneurysmal SAH is associated with an intense inflammatory response and a number of inflammatory biomarkers have been studied because of this factor in aneurysmal SAH. However, their usage and interpretation is in clinical practice is limited because there is a very wide range of the measured values in literature. Plus, any clinical insult can lead to the re release of inflammatory biomarkers. Uh, even then, certain biomarkers have good evidence like serum and CSF uh, C-reactant protein, which is associated independently with outcome. Matrix metalloproteinase 9 in aneurysmal SAH patients is associated with a number of pathophysiological factors like uh, it leads to the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, it leads to cerebral edema development, it is also associated with apoptosis. And uh, the blood and the CSF levels of MMP9 are shown to affect clinical outcome at 3 months. Uh, 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 an important thing that I'd like to point out is uh, something called as the Systemic Immune Inflammation Index. So, in, I found just one study quoting the utility of systemic immune inflammation index in literature. So, this is basically a combination of platelet count with neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So, uh, a platelet count highlights that there is a pro-thrombotic state when it is high and neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio rep uh, represents a dysregulated immune status. So, it has been shown that it is an independent predictor of the development of DCI in patients with aneurysmal SH. Coming to acute ischemic stroke, um, in acute ischemic stroke, biomarkers may be uh, used to predict different states of the ischemic cascade like inflammation, glial activation, neuronal injury. However, what we have to keep in mind is every cell has uh, different tolerance to ischemia. So, this may affect the level of biomarkers. Now, plasmatic levels of S100 beta have been proven to predict malignant infarction in patients who have proximal MCA occlusion. Even MMP9 has been associated with neurological outcome and prediction of hemorrhagic transformation after thrombolysis. Uh, neuropeptide uh, precursors like proencephalin and substance P also correlate with the admission NIHS score, the CT infarct size and 3-month outcome. Uh, another important thing in aneurysmal SAH is the coagulation cascade which may be altered and may be responsible for the pathophysiology. So, a recent systemic review has uh, mentioned that there is no clear recommendation at present that can be provided on which hemostasis biomarker is a predictor of clinical outcome, but the best evidence is in favor of plasminogen activator inhibitor. Finally, coming to intracranial tumors, probably more important for neurosurgeons, but uh, matrix metalloproteinase 9 and YKL40 are uh, two molecules which are highly differentially expressed by malignant gliomas. YKL40 is an extracellular matrix glycoprotein which is produced by activated macrophages even though its role is not known. Uh, but the levels of both these enzymes are increasingly associated uh, with a higher tumor grade, with prognosis and with survival. So, despite all this evidence, why have biomarkers not been translated into clinical studies? This is because they are laced with certain limitations. First and foremost, there are a number of extracranial sources of contamination. For example, for S100 beta, the specificity is usually questioned because it is released also from adipocytes and chondrocytes. So, in polytrauma patients, it becomes difficult to interpret what is causing this increase in S100 beta. In neuron-specific enolase, there may be uh, hemolysis of RBCs and platelets. Uh, clinical usefulness is also questioned because most of the studies have modest sample size which leads to imprecise estimates of prognostic values. Uh, in surgical population, the biomarker may be released because of the insult from the surgery itself and may not reflect the disease state. 
the standardization of assays for different biomarkers still not done and non modifiable factors like age also affect biomarkers to conclude biomarkers may pave the way for outcome prediction of neurosurgical population when they are added to clinical prognostic models like different disease specific scoring systems neuroimaging and clinical examination however currently there is no consensus regarding whether single biomarker should be used a combination of biomarkers should be used and at what time the biomarker should be studied moreover the economic performance of these biomarkers also needs to be evaluated however their incorporation into the clinical practice may lead to a more goal directed individualized approach to provide early and useful prognostic information to the patient's families and therefore research on biomarkers to predict neurological outcomes should remain a strong priority thank you thank you dr prachi we will have the discussion at the end of the session a very good afternoon all so after the risk stratification scores and uh, biomarkers now there is a lot of air about the icp monitoring whether it changes the outcome or not to clear the air i would call upon uh, dr neha sharma she is the final year dm st student at the neuroanesthesiology and critical care department at aims over to you neha A very good afternoon, everyone. So, as already uh, told by Keshav sir, the topic we are going to discuss is ICP monitoring and its impact on outcome in head injury. The debate around it. So, to start with intracranial pressure monitoring, uh, the ICP is the resultant of the pressure applied by the components within an inflexible and rigid skull, and the the, the relationship of the intracranial pressure with the intracranial volume is given by this uh, brain compliance curve where the during the initial part of the autoregulation curve uh, during this phase whenever there is an increase in the intracranial volume uh, the intracranial pressure does not change drastically and this is compensated by the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid and the blood compartment from the intracranial to the extracranial compartment and when these compensatory mechanisms are exhausted uh, the second phase begins where there is an abrupt and linear increase in intracranial pressure with further increase in intracranial volume leading to a reduction in cerebral perfusion pressure and when the icp reaches a critical level the icp plateaus and further increase leads to herniation of the brain components so why is icp monitoring necessary the answer is already uh, given in the uh, by the previous curve that we discussed that it is an important determinant of the cerebral perfusion pressure and determines the risk of cerebral ischemia to the brain cells it is an integral part of management of traumatic brain injury by use of the tiered management of the intracranial hypertension the raised icp is found to be associated with increased mortality in various studies and the main goal while we monitor icp and plan our management of intracranial hypertension is to allow early detection of secondary brain damage and initiate immediate therapeutic interventions to minimize this damage now what are the modalities available to monitor icp so the first and foremost is the clinical evaluation and the radiological examination followed by the non invasive and the invasive methods the non invasive methods include the onsd tcd the nirs the tympanic membrane displacement the fontanometry uh, but the limitation of these methods is that it does not provide any continuous monitoring it is less precise as compared to the invasive monitoring modalities and these mon uh, these monitoring modalities are very subjective and there is great inter observer variability so they are uh, being used but they are used as a screening tool for intracranial hypertension rather than a continuous monitoring modality the invasive methods uh, include the the intraparenchymal catheters the intraventricular catheters the subdural bolt out of which the intraventricular catheters is still the gold standard for continuous icp monitoring now what do we get from this icp monitoring so it tells us about the severity of injury by giving us a value which determines the severity of the traumatic brain injury it helps us in determination of the cerebral autoregulation by measurement of the pressure reactivity index which uh, which is the lowermost point at which the autoregulation is the most intact and this helps in determining the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure by uh, and that helps in determining the individualized therapeutic approach for an individual patient 
Uh, the importance of this auto regulation was determined in this study where they visualized the pressure and time burden of intracranial hypertension in adult and pediatric traumatic brain injury patients and they found out that the uh, limit of ICP about 20 was tolerated for more than 37 minutes in adults and longer than 8 minutes in children. However, when the autoregulation was studied, it was found that the, when the autoregulation was impaired, this threshold was drastically reduced and, uh, in both the pediatric as well as the adult TBI patients. So, optimizing these uh, ICP management strategies according to the status of the cerebral autoregulation is quite important. The pressure reactivity index importance can be seen with this curve where in the lowermost part we can see that the pressure reactivity begins to increase. This is the of a patient of severe traumatic brain injury in which the PRX was being determined and on day 3 of TBI uh, of the monitoring we found that the PRX was increasing and a subsequent increase was in ICP was also noted but when it was timed to ICP it was found that the increase in ICP was seen around 4 to 6 hours after the increase in pressure reactivity index was noted. So, this implies that the pressure reactivity index can get, a, get give us an early indication of an impending increase in the intracranial pressure thus helping us to mitigate the situation in a timely manner. Now, what are the controversies around the measurement of intracranial uh, pressure? So, shall we treat intracranial hypertension without measuring intracranial pressure? It is as simple as it is not possible to treat uh, hypertension without measurement of blood pressure. ICP monitoring has become a part of SOPs in developed countries, but we still need to evaluate the risk benefit, risk versus cost benefit in a country like ours. Does it really change the outcome and whether we should use it? So, when the cost benefit analysis is studies, the studies which have been done are in favor of the cost benefit. It was found that in both the younger and older severe TBI patients, there was a benefit from aggressive care where ICP monitored treatment approaches were used. In another study, it was found that cost if it was found to be a cost effective management strategy even in elderly patients. Now, does this does it actually improve the outcome? So, there are a number of studies with uh, with many studies who are in favor of improving the uh, outcome in terms of mortality. The studies are there which favor the uh, favorable outcome, but still there are many studies which have found either no impact on the outcome or a worsening of the outcome with the use of the ICP monitors. So, just a quick run through through the evidence what is available. So, uh, there are a few, this is the study where they found that the good recovery and the uh, favorable outcome was seen with a decreased frequency of moderate disability in patients who were monitored using an ICP monitor and there was a significant difference between the two groups. The ICP monitoring was found to improve the six month good recovery rate and favorable outcome rate in this study where they evaluated the patients with cerebral contusion volume of more than 20 ml and who were monitored with the ICP guided and the uh, routine clinical and the radiological guided management. Then in another study in about 37,000 patients which was conducted, we found that ICP monitored patients had a lower risk of in-hospital mortality and they favored the ICP monitors in that way. Uh, in another study where different hospitals were compared who had different uh, uh, indications and different incidence of application of ICP monitors, it was found that the uh, hospital setups in which the incidence of use of ICP monitors was higher was associated with an improved outcome as compared to the setups where ICP was not a part of the routine management protocol. Then there are another number of studies where, which, where it was found that ICP monitoring was associated with reduced mortality even in the pediatric patient population. Also, there is evidence which, sub, which, sub, which refutes the use of routine ICP monitors. The most evident one is the best trial which actually started this controversy around the ICP monitoring. So, it was a study which was published in NEGM in two, uh, 2012 where they uh, concluded that there was no difference in 6-month mortality and GOS outcome at 6 months when two groups were compared who were treated using the ICP monitors and the uh, management which was guided by image and clinical assessment alone. However, this study had a number of fallacies and this has been uh, criticized from time to time regarding its results. The most important one was that the uh, mortality which they had given in the outcome, was not, it was not adequately powered for mortality. There are a number of other final outcome parameters that was assessed along with mortality. So, it cannot be directly concluded that there was no, uh, that there was no impact on mortality with the use of ICP monitor. Secondly, it was conducted in a healthcare setup which was quite different from the uh, world where it was a part of the ICP management protocol. 
Also, it uh, in this study, in all patients, intraparent kinetic monitors were used, and intraventricular catheters were not used in any patient, which provide an opportunity for therapeutic management of intracranial hypertension, which in itself is an important determinant of the functional outcome. And also, in uh, any of the patients who were studied in this study, there was no harm which was found to be associated with the use of ICP monitor. So, it cannot be conclusively said from this study that ICP monitoring led to uh, no difference in six month mortality and the GOS outcome at six months. Then there was another study in children with severe TBI where they found that the functional outcome was not different in, from the patients who were monitored using an ICP monitor. Also, in elderly patients, uh, they did they found that it was associated with uh, a decrease in the mortality as compared to patients who were not assessed using an ICP monitor. So, this meta-analysis was then done. It was published in the PLOS one in 2016, where they evaluated all these studies which were conducted till 2015, evaluating the impact of ICP monitoring on mortality. And they uh, divided the studies into two groups, one before 2007 and the other after 2007. So, 2007 was actually the year when the Brain Trauma Foundation included the ICP monitoring and they provided a robust, a clear cut indications for the inclusion of the ICP monitoring. So, after 2007, when the studies were conducted, it was seen that there was a significant reduction in mortality when the, in the ICP monitored groups as compared to before 2007 studies where ICP monitoring was, uh, where there was no significant difference seen in the mortality of patients. Then also when the two-week mortality and the six-month mortality was assessed, there was a significant uh, improvement in the two-week and six-month mortality with the use of ICP monitors. So, the authors here concluded that it could be because of more adherence to the TBI guidelines, more uh, accurate selection of patients for the insertion of the uh, ICP catheters in the studies which were conducted after 2007, which led to more adhesiveness to more standardized protocol of the ICP management and hence it led to improved outcomes in the these studies. We also have another meta-analysis in which it was found that ICP monitoring was not associated with a uh, reduction in hospital mortality, but it was associated with a significant favorable prognosis. So, all this dilemma uh, led to the BTF fourth edition recommendations where it is still a level 2B recommendation to use the ICP monitoring in severe TBI patients to reduce the in-hospital and two-week post-injury mortality in the indicated patients. The BTF also recommends the threshold for monitoring of ICP, which is 22 millimeters of mercury in adults and 20 millimeters of mercury in pediatric patients. But there is a controversy around this also. Is a single threshold justified in all patients of this age groups? So, the center TBI group came with this study where they found that the intensity threshold of 18 plus minus 4 was associated with worse outcomes in their study group and also when the pressure time dose was associated and its correlation was studied with the mortality, they found out that during periods of impaired autoregulation, the ICP events were associated with worse outcomes for nearly all durations and all ICP levels and there was a stronger relationship between outcome and the pressure time dose rather than a single value of the ICP number in determining the outcome of the patients. In another study by the Center TBI group, they had given the patient, they had studied the patient specific ICP thresholds and it was found that the mean early dose of ICP above individual epidemiological threshold was associated with stronger mortality than those that was recommended by the BTF guidelines. So, dynamic patient tailored and ICP or CPP targeted regime is, this, uh, is the need of the R and it should be the preferred approach rather than using a generalized threshold for ICP measurement. So, the points in favor of ICP monitoring is that it gives an early and rapid detection of deterioration of the patients. It gives a continuous monitoring of the patients so that trends can be studied between patients and in a particular patient to study the course of the uh, injury. Uh, also, the use of ICP monitor prevents the repeated transportation which is required for imaging or the interruption of the sedation needed for clinical assessment which has its own implications on the cerebral hemodynamics which in turn will impact the patient outcome. Also, the use of intraventricular catheters provides an opportunity to provide CSF drainage which is a therapeutic intervention and can lead to acute reduction in the management of the intracranial hypertension. The use of ICP monitors can guide about individualized treatment strategies when pressure reactivity index and the optimal CPP is studied and it provides a pro an objective assessment of intracranial hypertension, especially in setups where the uh, residents and the treating physician keeps on rotating. 
However, there are certain fallacies also. It has been found to be associated with complications like hemorrhage and infections, which are quite low in number. But when when it happens in a patient, it can definitely impact the outcome of the patient. The use of ICP monitor sometimes leads to more aggressive management of intracranial pressure, leading to the increased uh, Application of decompressive craniectomies in patients with refractory intracranial hypertension, which has been found in the DECRA trial also that it leads to improved, uh, improvement in the mortality, but can lead to a reduction in the favorable outcomes. Then the evidence that we have till date is all retrospective and mostly from the cohort observational studies, so which have their own limitations and it cannot be considered a robust evidence to favor the ICP monitoring. And monitoring of other parameters apart from the ICP number, that is the ICP waveform and the intactness of the cerebral autoregulation is very important in, in planning the therapeutic strategy for the management of ICP. So to conclude, ideally there should be a trial in similar group of patients using the clinical radiological and ICP guided management versus the clinical radiological without ICP guided management. But these strategies will, but this kind of study will not be ethically possible in today's world. And ICP monitoring should then be viewed as an additional tool in collaboration with the clinical and the radiological evaluation and it should not at all replace the clinical evaluation. When talking about the risk versus cost benefit, there is evidence that uh, which supports the cost effectiveness of the ICP monitoring. And the overall benefit of monitoring will eventually depend on the effective utilization of information that is derived from the monitoring. So, in our opinion, the ICP monitoring has the potential to influence clinical outcome in conjunction with other monitoring modalities, specifically when targeted and individualized treatment approach is used. And there is no use of an alarm if the information which is derived from it is not used for designing a therapeutic plan. So, similarly, just putting an ICP monitor and uh, treating the patients on the basis of a number is not justified unless it is effectively utilized and all other parameters are simultaneously studied. Thank you very much. All the speakers can come to the dais for discussion. Maybe one or two questions for each speaker. I think everybody is hypoglycemic. <laughs> Any question? Luckily, okay, then I will ask. Luckily, when I was a resident, there were not this much amount of scoring system on the biomarkers. I don't know how the today's residents is going to remember all the scorings. Not only number of scores, there is some scores where zero is no symptoms, where in others zero is dead. So, which one is ascending, which one is descending, that is even more difficult uh, to do. For research purposes, it might be useful. But for practical day-to-day -day purpose, at least one score for the outcome or the prediction is uh, better. Regarding the biomarkers, the good thing is, <coughs> I mean, theoretically, if I can identify a patient who is clinically stable, but it is likely to deteriorate, at least we can transport or go to the referral center. But the other side of the biomarker is assume you have a 3 ml volume neuronal injury in a right parietal lobe for one patient and another patient has the same damage at the brain stem. The amount of biomarkers might be similar, but then the neurological consequences would be disastrous. And coming to this ICP presentations, whoever makes this ICP presentation, whichever speaker, they always mention hypertension cannot be treated without blood pressure monitoring. Mm -hmm. Can ICP be treated? But that's what we have been doing. So, ICP can reduce mortality, but the outcome depends on the number of functional neurons which the ICP cannot determine. That's the only drawback. We have questions from Tumul. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, thank you all moderators to keeping in time. Uh, you nailed it. Uh, Thank you all three, Kirandeep, uh, Pranchi and Neha. It's a commendable job that uh, so much information you put in like a 20 or 25 slides and it's still in 15 minutes, it's commendable. Um, regarding the traumatic brain injury trial, you can do in the in Indian scenario. Um, what you need to do, there is no need for randomized control trial. What you need to do, you identify the centers which employ ICP 
and which don't employ. For example, some of the small multi-specialty hospitals, they don't employ. So you do a prospective cohort study and then you randomize whatever the data you got. So in Indian scenario, you can do millions and millions uh, database uh, study and put forward in New England Journal, Lancet and, neuro uh, and Neurology, like high impact journals. And that can conclude whether ICP or any other multi-model monitoring is beneficial or not. So there are two ways. One is we call as a retrograde ways in which you delineate one uh, one time you delineate ICP monitor, one time you delineate cerebral oxygenation monitor, one time you delineate invasive blood pressure uh, range also. So that's a retrograde. And then one is an integrate model in which you develop invasive monitor plus cerebral oxygenation plus ICP monitor plus this monitor. So you can do prospective cohort study. It it will be challenging, but it is still simpler, not um, as difficult as to do a randomized control trial in the Indian setup. So I think you, you guys have the young brains, so do it. Thank you, Dr. Tumul. Actually, the traumatic brain injury, the beauty is like the, because of the heterogeneity which is there. There is somewhere it is hematoma which needs to be removed, but there is somewhere it is diffuse axonal injury. So the basically we have to individualize the care. So that is where the ICP monitoring can help and should come into the picture. So such patients need to be identified and then giving them one care and one, not giving them the ICP monitoring. So that can be ethically challenging in any scenario because of the, so that can be the problem. The comparative effectiveness research is going on like in the center TBI trial nowadays, they are pooling the data and then they are coming out with the lots of, so I think that can be tried in our scenario also. So I think the snack and uh, other societies, they will come forward and do this in the next. Any more questions from the audience? I think if there are no further questions, we can close the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. To conclude the three days academic fiesta of ISNAC 2023, I would invite upon the dais Secretary ISNAC Professor Girija Rath to kindly commence the valedictory function. Uh, thank you, Sivani. Uh, thanks, everyone, still uh, sitting in the auditorium. And uh, what to say, how to thank uh, Dr. Padmanja and her team. When we started it uh, seriously six months back, personally I was a bit skeptical how to go about it. But uh, after these three days, uh, I think uh, I don't want to thank much to Madam because uh, uh, it will be too formal. Uh, but then again, for your team, Madam, thanks a lot uh, on behalf of the society and uh, thanks for uh, whatever you have done uh, now i invite uh, all the governing council members of isnac to come to this stage uh, uh, president uh, dr rajasri devpujari madam uh, ex president past president immediate past president dr nidhi panda please come to the dais madam and uh, vice president i think he's left president uh, elect who is going to take over as the president dr birendra jain treasurer uh, dr gyanendra pal singh and all other governing council members those who are present in the auditorium dr hemant anybody else i can't see anyone uh, and the newer uh, governing council members dr zulfikar Ajay Rishi, Nitasha Mishra, okay, who were there and I request Dr. Das to join us in the podium, sir. Sir, please come over and Madam Padmanja, uh, Professor Kulkarni, 
and Dr. Srilata, the scientific chair. Yeah, now I will request uh, President Asnak to address the audience and uh, take the function forward. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the iSNAC in putting a lot of faith and trust in me to lead this wonderful and renowned iSNAC forward. And uh, this has been a big, uh, a big thing for me in my life, and I hope I have lived up to all what the Society of iSNAC needs. I would not have been able to do it unless without the support of my very efficient uh, GC and Secretariat and uh, Dr. I would like to thank Dr. Girja, I would like to thank Dr. Gyan and all the wonderful GC members who are uh, stars in themselves in this body of uh, ISNAC. Uh, ISNAC being a conglomeration of not only academicians but also practitioners of neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care it gives me a great uh, honor and i am very very grateful for all this uh, year which is uh, which has made me a president of such a prestigious society i would now also like to thank uh, dr padmaja Dr. Dilip Kulkarni and uh, uh, Dr. Srilata, Dr. Sridhar and uh, team iSnack 2023. They have done a wonderful job. They have outdid themselves and in all aspects of a conference, especially the academic aspect, they have scored above 10, 10 plus whatever you say and uh, we uh, can we give them a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have raised the bar and uh, view our conference will be remembered and probably looked back at for years to come. Thank you very much. With these words, I request... Uh, okay. I would now like to announce the name of the award winners of ISNAC 2023. The Dr. V.K. Grover Best Paper Award First Prize goes to Dr. Swati Patel from PGI Chandigarh. I would request Professor, uh, Professor Dash sir to kindly hand over the award. I uh, I think I have not, uh, uh, I mean, I should like to give a lot of gratitude to our patrons, uh, especially Dr. Dash, and uh, it was lovely to see Dr. Amna, Dr. Bibhu, and all seniors who have taken this society to where it is. And uh, thank you very much. And with this, we would like Dr. Dash to come over and give the awards to the deserving candidates.
the Dr. V. K. Grover Best Paper Award Second Prize goes to Dr. Vidya Sriram from Nimhans. Hearty congratulations to you. The third prize for best paper goes to Dr. Jayan Sishan from Ames, New Delhi. The best e-poster in the case report category. First prize goes to Dr. Kunal Kumar Sharma from Indira Gandhi Medical College. Dr. Kunal will tell us that. The second prize for e-poster case report category goes to Dr. Ankita Jaiswal from Paris Hospital Gurugram. The third prize for the best e-poster case report goes to Dr. Rana Athar from Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. The first prize for the e-poster Best Original Research goes to Dr. Devya Anil Amrita Raj from CMC Velour. The second prize for Best Original Research e-poster goes to Dr. Vindhya Prasad from Yashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad. The third prize for best original research e-poster goes to Dr. Sharat Sundaram from Sri Chitra Institute of Medical Sciences. Hearty congratulations to Dr. Vindhya and Dr. Sharat. Someone can just accept the award on behalf of Dr. Vindhya. Now announcing the award winners of the Grey Matters Quiz Competition. The first prize goes to Dr. Jeeva Kumar from PGI Chandigarh. A big round of applause for him. He was simply fabulous. and immensely popular as well. The second prize for the Grey Matters Quiz Competition goes to Dr. Rajesh Mittal from GB Pant Hospital, New Delhi. Okay. 
we have dr ankita jaiswal here who won the second prize for the best e poster in the case report category hearty congratulations to her now moving on to the award winners of the isnac one pager awards this was introduced for the first time in the history of isnac the first prize goes to dr tejashwi gm from nimhans hospital a big round of applause to him the second prize for the one pager is shared by dr gayatri sakrikar from nimhans and dr sharon poldos from cmc velour well won hearty congratulations to both of you The third prize for the one pager award goes to Dr. Amrita Niral from Nimhans. The second prize is shared by Dr. Gayatri and Dr. Sharon. And Dr. Amrita wins the third prize for the one pager. Hearty congratulations to all the award winners. With this, we conclude the award ceremony. I would now like to invite Dr. Srilata Madam, the scientific chair of ISNAC twenty twenty three, to kindly address the audience. Madam, please. A very warm afternoon uh, to all the respected dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is NAC 2023. Uh, the theme we have kept to the expectations of the theme, the academic feast, and for that we like to thank to all the faculty and all the delegates for their good interactive discussions and their talks, and. Uh, as uh, when when we started this uh, uh, actually in building up the scientific schedule this is um, seriously for the last 6 months and uh, everyone knows that this is like a dream of uh, dr padmaja to conduct the snack conference at hyderabad and thanks to the thanks to god and also to dr padmaja for giving us to be a part of this committee and for uh, uh, creating for um, when we started like every everyone knows that the scientific schedule is a uh, baby for all uh, conferences so to nurture it and to build it up on the um, talks and the lectures the topics it took a lot of effort and like some things we have added in the scientific schedules in the new um, um, like these are quick bites this is what uh, we have uh, heard from the neurosurgeons that they have incorporated this quick bite system into their sessions so that they can include lot of speakers and also the young uh, dynamic uh, speakers from the uh, from their uh, um, uh, team so we have also thought of the same thing and started this quick bites hopefully everyone has appreciated this Quick bites. The talks were very comprehensive, like five to uh, six minutes. I know that the we can talk about a single topic about um, even for us the same topic we try to um, uh, restrict to five to six minutes. That's what we try to do it. And uh, thanks to all the speakers in quick bites for their efforts, and they have done within that time. And also the orations. Have the topics of the orations were quite good and uh, everyone has appreciated those topics we are quite thankful to all the orators and 
um the other thing is that um, we have started with the new uh, one pager one this is again the idea of dr padmaja so that also went off well and almost more than 20 uh, residents have participated for that and we have seen that response and coming to the uh, papers there were uh, around 95 papers for this conference and this is i think a very good response we have almost 40 plus for the original articles and 50 plus for the case reports uh, for the vk grovers award like from those 40 plus we selected the very good ones of 20 and we have sent it to the scientific committee three judges we have selected from the scientific committee and we have sent it and from they have graded uh, uh, from their uh, cr the criteria was given to them from that they have um, selected around 410 and that was um, on that um, from those papers were screened for the vk grovers best paper and the other thing is that uh, for the quiz quiz also we had very good response 51 students participated and there were new rounds and uh, very good effort by the quiz masters thanks to all the faculties and the delegates who participated and um, For, for the judging, for the quiz competitions, for the um, one pager awards, for all the lectures, for the three-day conference, and for the same thing, I would like to thank the AIZ team for providing us this venue for the, for those three days. And uh, Dr. Siddharth is part of that AIZ team. Thanks to Dr. Siddharth, Subodh, and the administrative part for all the logistic helps. and also like to thank our neurosurgeons per se the three days they have stored our electives just to facilitate our conference so hats off to them and also as per the theme we try to incorporate include all the uh, neurosurgeon neuroradiologist neurologist cardiologist also in the workshops so this is just a sing first step ahead what we are trying to say that yeah we are going beyond our ot theaters beyond our walls so that is a great effort and uh, also thanks to all the workshop coordinators uh, dr harsel dr ann campus dr narmada pardi for the crisis management dr viswanath for the neuro inm monitoring and dr um, sekar reddy and all their teams for this logistic supports and and the feedback was very good from, from all the conference all the workshops so hats off to all of them and not but the least i would like to thank all our residents ot staff and uh, my uh, all our technicians so they have like supported uh, in whatever way it's possible for us e even in creating those workshop scenarios like realistic scenarios have created and helped us Uh, for the crisis management so i think the same thing must be done in other workshop scenarios too so thanks to all the uh, ot staff and technicians and my residents so the residents were the backbone of us so they did a great job in conducting this conference successfully thank you thank you thank you madam I would now like to invite Professor Padmaja, Madam, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think as we come to the end of this session, it probably it's like a sad feeling that we are parting after a function. and uh, i don't know whom to thank uh, everyone around that i have to thank and probably it will take the same uh, whole evening for me to th start thanking someone first i would like to thank almighty for this uninterrupted and uh, obstacle free uh, conference as girija said when we started we didn't know where we were and then as we went on joining dots i think it turned out to be a beautiful picture and we are very happy about it and the whole department and i think for the first time we had all the neuro anesthetists of the city coming together uh, when we started probably we didn't know each other and as we progressed on i think we become good friends and i think we love each other now more than anything else so 
I mean, the pro journey has been really beautiful, and I think all of us enjoyed uh, being a part of this journey. And I think I'll just introduce my team because I don't think we have we would have seen the faces of most of them because they were all behind the screens. Firstly, from the beginning to the end, probably one person who has never been out of job was Dr. Avinash, uh, who's been taking care of the registrations as well as uh, he's the treasurer of the. Come on to the stage. And uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Harshal and Dr. Geeta. Probably these were never seen anywhere around because they were busy in the back room, in the preview room. If you had seen seamless uh, projections, I would like to thank these two because they have never moved from the preview room. I mean, they were just following and every second, like the, probably you wouldn't have seen even a second lag between the presentation and the slide. So that is how they have maintained. And I think uh, I should really thank Geeta's efforts, 95% CVs on the screen and I, I wouldn't send my CV to any conference and she could probably pester everyone and uh, achieve that uh, CV so, uh, and all the mails that you get were from her, there was never a lag in responding to anything and Dr. Harshal has not moved from the preview room so that everything is carefully loaded and sorted out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Siddharth, probably he's now become a part of our department and <laughs> thank you for everything. He's been coordinating between NIMS and AIG and please come on to the stage. And uh, now I think we consider him as a part of the department. And one person who has been jobless throughout but probably never had a sleep in the last one week was Akshay because he was coordinating the hospitality. So I think these three days were like really hectic. He gets calls middle of the night for transport. He is still there to answer. And I, we just keep teasing him that next time he gets a call, he will say, Kitne baja jana hai, kaan jana hai? <laughs> so last chapter, se wohi bol raha. and everyone, um, we've enjoyed the uh, right from labeling, theme making to every part of what we have done today. And uh, as Srilata said, all the everyone around us has been really good. And we thank all the faculty, the delegates for being so wonderful. Uh, we've had a wonderful time organizing this conference and I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as we did. Sapna ka hai? Sapna? Ah. <laughs> Hundred abstracts downloading communicating and compiling them into the book was not an easy job and i really congratulate sapna for it dr sivani probably she's our star i mean i can just tell her anything and there's no no i think one thing that i have to thank the department for is that is that there is no no one who says no so anything you say anytime, yes, is the answer and that's what is the spirit. Thank you all. Um, Samira. <laughs> so the one phase that has been in the front, we are all proud of is Samira. Chalo, Samira has organized a small piece of cake for us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Srilata. You summed it up well. And thank you, Padmaja. You have done a great job. Uh, after that, I would just like to thank all the seniors and uh, Dr. Dash, everyone. Uh, from iSnack, my GC, as I said, uh, each is a star. Each is a star from the, our nation. And uh, my secretariat for being there. It's with a little, I would say, mixed feelings. I feel a little lighter, but I feel a little sad that I have to give up this position. And I would like to invite our new, I mean, just now, at this moment, he's president-elect. But the next moment, he will be president of ISNAC for 2023. I really... 
thank all the senior snack and junior snack colleagues national international faculty and also all the delegates who have come to the conference and as a chairperson a chairman of the society at this conference i was just just sitting on the chair not doing much <laughs> everything is done by padmaja and uh, sri lata and uh, nims team and also aig teams i thank them even though i left nims long back they have made me chairperson of this conference and everything went all right i think you were small hitches or any inconveniences please excuse us thank you i think uh, there are some a little important missing for me dr kiran the hall management was done by dr kiran seamlessly and uh, i would like to i think no conference would be complete or even uh, successful without the sponsors and i would like to thank all the sponsors of this conference for their good support and i think uh, we've got most of the fund before the conference because we had nothing left in our hands to pay and i think we have been very supportive to pay us before the conference and uh, i thank all the sponsors our main sponsors have come from dragger shiller ge neon and all the stalls that you see uh, thanks a lot to all of you and a big thanks to the aig team the management especially the fnb and the uh, audio visual team have been really excellent uh, i think that is something that all of you have appreciated and the, i think out of the 10 marks that you have given us 8 marks would go to aig for the venue so thank you all yes uh, uh, before that before that madam just one yeah just wait thank you thank you rajesh madam for all your contribution for the snack and uh, may i now request the new president of uh, snack to address the order. dr birendra jain may I request you to wait for a minute so that uh, our teacher teacher to all of us uh, professor das wants to speak something before you thank you uh, the our uh, i mean the president secretary of course gyanendra and particularly thanks to madam padmaja i think this is a uh, i mean the, what is that exact word आपका ये शुरुआत हुआ है अभी आप में सक्सेसफुल हो गए हो शादी अभी बाकी है लड़की के ये रिहर्सल था नहीं अभी शादी हो गया ना लड़की का आपका लड़की का आपने इतना अच्छा मैनेज किए हो आई मीन क्यू डोज टू यू आई मीन दी डे दी डे आई रिस्ट इन दी एयरपोर्ट एंड आई मीन फ्रॉम दैट टाइम till the end it was uh, everything was seamless and smooth 
except she did my gadbadi for my slides nay it was uh, thank you very much even yesterday's uh, evening party was par excellence and uh, the food particularly the lunches three days it was also good and the as uh, sulata told the fights and other things one pager and the uh, orations and the topic given to me also those are really excellent thank you very much uh, respected senior members of the society governing council members and colleagues uh, good afternoon to you all i take this opportunity to thank everyone on bestowing me on bestowing this huge responsibility on me we have come a long way since inception of a snack in 1999 and will be celebrating the silver jubilee over the next year over all these years society has progressed leaps and bounds by the hard work of the members senior members fulfilling the vision of its founder members i wish to carry forward the legacy of my predecessors thank you madam thank you rashmi madam for hey, presiding over these difficult years and will try my uh, try my best to take society to greater heights with support of all the governing council members and all the esteemed members of this society i would like to concentrate on increasing the membership and expanding the academic activities including the e education we would we also focusing our efforts to take the message of neuro anesthesia and neuro critical care from larger cities to smaller towns i would like to seek the blessings and supports of all the esteemed members to carry forward the good good work for the fulfillment of the dreams and visions of our society long live i snack jai hind i want to congratulate padma ja again and actually the whole program was so flawless that no one of us have come across any problems so three cheers for i snack 2023 hip hip hurray hip hip hurray hip hip hurray uh on behalf of the i snack we like to felicitate professor das for its immense contributions to the society
thing I would like to thank Vishwanath also. They were like four collaborators for us who have become a part of our department. We now consider you all as our own. Vishwanath, Siddharth and Harshil. So, thank you. We have Dr. Vindhya here, who has won the second prize for the best e-poster. Congratulations to Dr. Vindhya. background full screen